Good morning. Welcome to the 11 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the June 9, 2020 meeting of the City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in the streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members besides myself are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. But it is your time to speak. We'll hear the next that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Boulder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings is absent. I'd like to ask the clerk if we have uh, public members that would like to speak at this time. We do, we have one, so I'll unmute them now. Hi, my name is Zeke Bean. I'm the OE3 Supervisory Unit President. Uh, we made it clear since before HR approached us that we recognize the position that the city is in and that we're willing to do our share of a 10% furlough to help the city realize the savings that they are requesting. Uh, we were not getting we where we are not getting movement from HR in terms of or in terms of some basic protective language. We're asking for and have so far have been denied language that states that supervisor not be made to make up for savings not realized from other units who refuse to do the furlough. If there's savings that are needed above and beyond the requested $16 million in savings, we are more than happy to discuss that. But if within that 16 million other units do not do their fair share, we don't want you taking it out on us. We have been denied language that protects us from that. Uh, we were requesting to have a seat at the table on hiring decisions because there's a hiring freeze and we're taking a 10% furlough to do our part and there's lots of positions that are still being filled. We wanna see at the table to be able to make recommendations uh, that would help the city realize savings without having to fill those positions. And the decision we've made clear would still be left up to the city and to Martine. We've been denied that other than we have been told we can weigh in on supervisor positions only. Um, we want accountability in the form of Me Too language that says once all our agreements are signed, regardless of whether or not they're all the same, if SCRU gets less, if mid-managers get less, we're okay with that. But if you then come back and open up someone else's contract, we want our contract open too, if things get better. We have been denied that. Um, we're requesting that we allow a process to allow our members, uh, if we have any that are in severe economic hardship, that they be allowed to apply for an exclusion and that the city will look into ways to have us, we, the supervisors, cover that employee's exclusion by way of vacation donations or other things, and that has been denied as well. And uh, it sounds like I'm running out of time. Uh, we have a couple other requests that are uh, in the form of uh, paid time off, not hard money, and those have been denied. And in lieu of those requests, we will be asking HR to consider a work share program, which will be no cost to the city. It's paid out of unemployment funds, so I encourage you to look into that and to encourage HR to seriously consider that and look into that option. We'll ask them at our meeting tomorrow. Um, we were giving a layoff plan by the city, even though we told them that we would be coming back to them with an answer, and we thought we'd been bargaining in good faith, so yesterday they presented us a detailed generalized layoff plan. Um, we are giving more details on that, okay. so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bean. Any other um, hands? I don't see any. Okay. 
At this time, the council will uh, adjourn to closed session. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers, we did have a hand go up. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Hello, my name is uh, Ken Baer. I'm an employee and resident of uh, the city of Santa Cruz uh, and a CIU chapter president. I'm here uh, calling about uh, item B on the, the closed uh, session agenda. Uh, we, would, we would ask you to direct HR to uh, bargain with us without threats of layoff notices going out this week or uh, to delay early retirement that you passed the last uh, meeting uh, if we don't, if we are unable to reach an agreement this week. Uh, along with that, we ask for your help in protecting the city employees that make less than $20 an hour. I realize that that would make us slightly under 10%. However, it's important that we protect the, the lowest paid employees. Um, and also, the final thing would be to identify an end to the furlough that both sides can say clearly and decisively that, that things have returned to normal and that we can leave the furlough early. Uh, current. Currently, uh, that's not been negotiated out. And in fact, in, it is actually the one thing that most people remember from the last furlough is that it continued on much longer than was required to bring the city out of um, its dire straits. We have bargained in good faith, and we expect that we will reach a, a furlough agreement with the city. We just need these few things to go forward. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Bear. And there are no more. No. There are no more speakers. I will, so the council will now adjourn to the closed session. And we will be back um, for our open session beginning at 2 p.m. today. Thank you. to our 220 session of the June 2020 meeting of the city council. I have a few announcements and then move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members, including myself, are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, 
you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest, and I would like to ask the clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Uh, Council member Brown is going to be a little late. Boulder? Present. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore, restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Uh, before we begin today, uh, I just wanted to say a couple words uh, regarding some of the events that have been occurring over the past two weeks. Um, our nation and community have been devastated by tragic acts of violence that have been felt across the world. On May 25, 2020, George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight by Officer Derek Chauvin. This act of violence sparked outrage across our nation, a demand for justice, acknowledgement that black people are not treated the same under the law, and a demand for police reform. On May 29th, the police chief and I called for a town hall meeting to discuss policing in our community, which took place on, on Wednesday, June 3rd. We followed that meeting up with members of the black community on June 4th, and we'll be holding meetings with the community to address police violence moving forward. Our community has come together and has demonstrated through numerous peaceful protests that we stand together, that we stand against racism, and that we stand against the use of excessive force by police. I would like to thank the community for standing in solidarity for the lives of black people and people express, experiencing oppression in our world. As a black man and a citizen of the United States of America, I would like to thank Chief Mills for his leadership, condemning the actions of the Minneapolis police officers, and for taking proactive steps to meet with the community and to ban the use of chokeholds and other uh, forms of restraint and continue to lead the way in making changes to policing. I would also like to thank our police officers for standing in solidarity with our community and for providing our community with safety as they marched and gathered in our streets. While other communities had officers meet protesters with riot gear, tear gas, and violence, our police officers blocked streets and exercised restraint even when protesters vandalized the police station and other businesses in our community. Thank you for supporting the community and for allowing their voices to be heard. In addition to the murder of George Floyd, our community experienced an additional tragic act of violence this past weekend. On Saturday, June 6th, in response to a call regarding a suspicious van that may have contained guns and bomb-making materials, Santa Cruz County Sheriff Deputy Damon Gutswiller was shot and later pronounced dead at the hands of Stephen Carrillo. As we continue to learn more about the motives of Stephen Carrillo, it is clear that he was committed to committing acts of violence at a large scale, and it's because of our law enforcement officers and the community members of Ben Loman who were able to restrain Carrillo that we were able to avoid a, ca a catastrophic loss of life. I would like to thank all the officers involved for ensuring the safety of our community. George Floyd and Sergeant Damon Gutswiller were fathers, men who cared about their community, they were both victims of hate and unwarranted violence. As a community and country, we must set an example of how we can do better. We need to come together to solve our differences, hold each other accountable, find ways to effectively communicate, listen and acknowledge our struggles, and find a way forward through love and peace. Our community will continue to work together to eliminate all forms of racism and discrimination, improve the culture of policing, and ensure the safety and security of all of our citizens. I want to uh, also condemn all the violence that uh, was faced to our downtown businesses and thank our police officers for doing the best they can, they can to protect our community um, from these violent acts. 
And at this moment, I would also like to ask that we observe a moment of silence for both George Floyd and Sergeant Damon Gutzwiller. Our hearts go out to their families and their communities, and may their lives never be forgotten. The, um, we'll start with presentations. We have a presentation from getvirtual.org, and so I will turn it over at this point in time. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. And um, during this time, the pandemic and this just very challenging environment, um, there has been an, a real opportunity of uh, our community to come together and virtual is an example of just that. It is a collaboration and work of the university and UCSC students partnering with businesses in need in our community during this pandemic. And um, without going into the details, they've prepared a great presentation. And I'm going to turn it over either to Gideon or Smeet to take it away. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are doing good today. Uh, I'm Smith Mehta, one of the student co-founders of Get Virtual. Our mission is to create small businesses online and improve their financial health. Small businesses employ 77 million Americans and have accounted for 65% of all new jobs over the past 17 years. They are not just the economic backbone of the community, but its heart and soul. Through Get Virtual's program, we are creating a revolution where experienced entrepreneurial students like us help small businesses in integrate impactful new technology into their operations. This not only drives the revenue today, but prepares small businesses to thrive in an increasingly digital economy. Our team is led by Toby Corey and Nada Milkovich. Toby is a successful entrepreneur and a Stanford University lecturer. Nada teaches entrepreneurship, ethics, and media at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Stanford University in the International Honors Program. They both are proud Santa Cruz residents. Hi, I'm Anakha Vijay, and we're the student co-founders and project managers of Get Virtual. And we're here particularly because we care. I speak for everyone on my team when I say that we're having an incredible experience working directly with entrepreneurs, owners, and key employees at these companies. We're learning how they think about their business operating models while helping us gain networking skills and develop and execute a presence. I've found this internship at Get Virtual to be an opportunity to help my community while gaining key skills. One of these main skills has been teamwork. We have a diverse set of individuals to bring in different solutions to each and every problem. This helps us in understanding new perspectives and looking at things from out of the box. It also helps each one of us build our morale as everyone on the team is supportive of one another. Engaging in the community with us has two main purposes. It gives us, the volunteers, a sense of purpose, and it has a long-lasting impact on the community as a whole. As the nation and the world start re-emerging from this pandemic, this and many other countless initiatives will play a catalyzing role to stabilize the economy and the viability of businesses. We also have valuable individual and organizational partners who have been a fantastic resource. Some of these partners include Bonnie Liscombe, Robert Singleton, and Brad Barbo. We're grateful for their support during this development phase and going forward. Hi, my name is Aaron Spanner. Uh, we are in the midst of an economic revolution. Uh, new technology is disrupting business models that have been entrenched in the economy for decades. And pre-COVID-19, the adoption of these new technologies was increasing kind of constantly and linearly, uh, as you can see on the graph. But today, the steady march of technological progress uh, now feels more like a roller coaster. I'm presenting to you using software from a company 
I didn't know existed until two months ago. Uh, like many others in Santa Cruz, I'm getting groceries delivered via Instacart. This is all to say that the way people want to do business is changing faster than ever, and small businesses must adapt to avoid being left behind. So how do we help small businesses avoid ending up like Blockbuster, Barnes & Noble, or other C-Corps beginning with B? Uh, our answer is that we integrate new technology that can not only make a huge impact, but is easier to use than ever before. Uh, but if it's so easy, why haven't small business owners who, as we've seen firsthand, are incredibly competent and adaptable, not taken advantage already? Hello, my name is Yulia Monasterska. Ag and Virtual, we work with businesses in industries from retail and hospitality to health and wellness. So far, we have delivered about $30,000 worth of services to our clients and begun positioning them to thrive for years to come. Hi, I'm Nikila Cherukudota. The needs of Get Virtual are rooted in the times of social distancing guidelines and branch out into long-term efforts. To address Aaron's previous question, one of the needs is that local business owners don't feel capable using virtual tools. We want to empower these business owners and familiarize them with virtual tools so that they are comfortable taking the driver's seat towards their digital world. This leads to our second need, which is local businesses need to operate remotely during social distancing orders. This is as simple as making sure local businesses are up and running, as well as the households that financially depend on these businesses. And last but not least, local businesses lack the training and support needed as we transition out of these guidelines and enter the long term. Part of what we do is we engage heavily with our clients and provide them with educational resources, such as live tutorials, to help them retain control over their websites as we transition out of COVID-19 guidelines. A pattern that we've seen thus far is that our clients have been meaning to change, but simply have not known where to start or have had the time. And while they are underprepared now, we have seen their dedication and value for their customers and believe strongly in their ability to compete for years to come. Hi, uh, my name is Gideon Fox. In the short term, our goal is to help clients stabilize financially in response to the coronavirus shock. Long term, we provide the virtual tools necessary to help our clients not only survive, but thrive within an increasingly digitized economic environment. Once we set up a website for a client, we teach them how to become masters of their digital destiny. They learn how to upload content, manage online appointments, and generally maximize the benefit their website prov provides uh, student entrepreneurs also gain valuable experience helping their adopted community persevere through these challenging times. By partnering students with small businesses, Get Virtual strengthens their bond within the community. Hi, everyone. I'm Ananya Mishra. Get Virtual offers a variety of solutions for each of the customers that we work with. We conduct website audits to evaluate aesthetics, user experiences, and SEO SEM. We integrate features to optimize websites such as calendars and schedulers for online booking, ordering systems for restaurants that seamlessly integrate with POS systems, and mobile-friendly versions of all of the websites that we design. We develop strategies for both social media and marketing. We also contribute to businesses by providing content and materials. Our educational tutorials support business owners as they continue to expand virtually in the future. Of Trading Co. is a women's boutique store located in downtown Santa Cruz and Capitola. This was how their website looked like when we began our project. In Rama Zoe and Anandi's words, the team at Get Virtual showed sincere interest and commitment to helping our business survive. They worked to understand our business and who we are so that they could propose and execute work that was relevant to us and consistent with our brand. Together, we had to figure out a way to virtualize the shopping experience without taking away Anandi and Ramazelli's values of keeping the customer experience high quality and personable. Thus, we came up with the idea of virtual shopping appointments. Now, customers are able to sign up for a Zoom, FaceTime, phone call, or Google Hangout appointment, fill out a questionnaire, and attend a personalized shopping experience. Ramazelli and Anandi personally review the questionnaires and handpick each piece of clothing for the customers, keeping in touch with their high customer quality values. 
These are a couple screenshots of how the website looks like now, the most important one being the virtual appointment schedule in the bottom right corner. And as of June 1st, 80 local small businesses have applied for the Get Virtual program. I'm Stryker Buffington. Um, so to keep the Get Virtual team afloat over the summer during this employment crisis, we hope to use a significant portion of our fundraising proceeds to sponsor the livelihood of Get Virtual co-founders and project managers like myself. We have also budgeted $8,000 for Get Virtual's marketing software, which includes uh, search engine optimization and analytics tools, as well as $3,000 in scholarships for our international students to take the UCSC Get Virtual summer class. And any excess that we raise will actually go directly into the community in the form of small grants to help newly digital businesses pay the premium fees for their website creation platforms like Wix and Shopify. Looking forwards, we, future fundraising will be allocated towards the expansion of Get Virtual. We aim to enlist new mentors, hold nationwide student competitions, and of course to support many more businesses. We calculated that in order to maximize Get Virtual's impact on small business, we aim to raise a total of $100,000 in the coming months. To fund our budget for this summer, Get Virtual is still short by $40,000. With this, project managers can focus full-time on launching the digital campaigns we have been preparing with local businesses, as well as to begin processing our 41 waitlisted clients. Your donation will help empower small business owners to take charge of their digital presence. We are just getting started, but after we spread the movement to colleges across the country, people will look back and admire the resilience and forward thinking of the business community from which it originated, which is, of course, right here in Santa Cruz. So thank you for your time, and please, please let us know if you have any questions. That was a wonderful presentation, and I'm so excited about this program. I, when I first heard about it, I started telling a bunch of my friends, like, dude, you can go and get help from this group to get an online presence. And uh, and it's just been something that I've been really excited about learning more about. So thank you all for, um, you know, all your hard work on this. And I do have one question for you. Um, if Is there a link or um, any website we can direct people to if they want to make donations to the program? Yeah, we are at getvirtual.org. And we have um, we have a donation link there, and also if you have any uh, small business friends, and, or I'm sure you know many small business owners, uh, if you'd like to direct them there, there's also a sign up link. Great, I'll make sure to send people your way. Uh, we got a few other council members who have questions, so council member Matthews and then Byers. Oh, you're muted. Great presentation. Um, and uh, a couple of questions for donations. Are you a 501c3 um, nonprofit or someone's nodding their head there? Striker, yes. Okay, just curious. Um, and uh, I, you mentioned you have 41 uh, businesses on the wait list. Are you, uh, what's the process? I have, I have a friend, long established local business, and this is exactly what this person <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to be able to refer them. So what's the process? Refer them to getvirtual.org? Uh, yeah. So essentially they sign up on getvirtual.org, and then um, they give us, you know, who they are, their business, and then we kind of have like an intake interview to get a sense of mm -hmm. um, their business, get a sense of, you know, the owner themselves and uh, kind of their expectations for the project. <laughs> And uh, then we kind of make a decision on, um, you know, whether uh, if we have the resources, get virtual, that is, to help their business. And uh, we also uh, make sure that what the business is looking for is kind of in line with uh, get virtual kind of mission, that they're like a Santa Cruz business, that they're, um, you know, uh, that they're just located in the community and uh, that they're not, you know, just trying to, but they're not a uh, new business also. We, we try to work with established uh, businesses um, that have been a part of the community for a while, um, and we're looking to get them back on their feet. 
I'd like to add that we're currently onboarding volunteers as we speak, so we'll be ramping up our process. The, the beauty of the program, um, many thanks to Nana Milkovic, who's an instructor at UCSC, teaching entrepreneurship. <laughs> Through her hard work, actually created a course where students get credit um, and they can give back to their community. She's also created a summer course. So helping funding will keep these students um, on board with us to help train this new class of students, both this summer and this fall. And as the students have said, there's a backlog of 41. We want to chew through those, and we're getting new requests every single day. So we're moving the needle here. All right, Council Member Byers. Well, thumbs up to all of you. And it, this is one of the programs, one of many, that really solidify a town-gown relationship. You know, we're always working on that. Uh, the town understand the university and the university kids you know, understand the needs of the downtown in our city. So thank you so much. Councilmember Brown. Uh, I just wanted to add my appreciation and, uh, you know, I am impressed uh, definitely with all the work you've been doing. This is so awesome to see, and I'm looking forward to um, watching you grow uh, the program. Uh, we, I'm on the Visit Santa Cruz board, and uh, Councilmember Matthews and I heard uh, from Anandi uh, just recently about the virtual uh, shopping program that you were helping work on. So it was great to see it here today as well. And she was very excited and, you know, others were as well. So um, looks like you'll get a lot of interest in um, activity. Thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It was really great. Um, I'm, I really like that each of you had a part in it and um, uh, just an amazing product that you've offered to our small businesses. And I think one thing that Santa Cruz is really proud about is the amount of small businesses that we have in our town. And we work really hard to make sure that those can stay alive through good and bad times. So um, you're helping all of those businesses in a huge way, and I have the feeling that uh, your number 41 is going to start growing quite significantly. So thanks for all your work. We really appreciate it. Councilmember Watkins. I agree. Thank you so much for the presentation and the great work. I just see Bonnie's face on my Zoom screen just glowing with pride, and I just it's so it's so powerful for our community in, in these moments and this time. I just had a quick question. How young of uh, students are you willing to work with? In high school students, are they eligible to particularly work with you? And okay, I'll follow up with you uh, offline about that. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, looks like those are all the questions and comments from council members. Keep up the good work. This is such an amazing program, and thank you all for making this happen in our community. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks so much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just checked out their website. It's great. <laughs> thank Toby for that. Good work. Um, so moving on to some of our next items, the um, we're going to hold off on the next item, which is a mayoral proclamation declaring June as Mental Health Month. Um, we're going to follow up with that with a uh, more extended resolution that will be coming forward at the next council meeting. And so with that, we'll move on to our next presentation, which is from the Community Action Board that's focused on housing assistance during COVID-19. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Helen Ewan Story, the Assistant Director with the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, and I'm here along with my colleagues. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor, City um, Council. My name is Paz Padilla. I'm the Homelessness and Prevention and Intervention Director for Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. Yes, and I know that uh, Tiffany Lake from your Housing Community Development Department is also on the meeting in case there's any questions that come up later on in the presentation. But we really, truly want to thank you for inviting us to give you a short presentation, an update on our housing assistance and other programming during COVID-19 in particular. So I am going to get us going with the presentation here. Let's see if I can share screen here. 
going to work. Let's see. I don't know, Bonnie. Oh, here we go. Hold on just a minute. All right. Can you all see the presentation, hopefully? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Let's see here. All right. So we're going to start. Um, we're just giving an, an outline of the presentation today. So for today's presentation, we're going to highlight CAP's purpose and program, give a brief overview of rental assistance programming and COVID-19 needs and trends, um, CAB and the city's COVID-19 partnership and resources, a brief overview of other CAB efforts, and then have some time for questions and answers at the end. So quickly, I know that many of you are um, familiar with our organization. The Community Action Board's mission is to partner with the community to eliminate poverty and cre create social change through advocacy and essential services. We do so holding a vision of a thriving, equitable, and diverse community free from poverty and injustice. And we hold the values of equity, dignity, and diversity, service, community action, and inclusion in doing our work. We serve between seven and 10,000 individuals per year through four main service areas, including our homelessness prevention and intervention services that pass as the director of, where we have a rental assistance program, emergency payment programs, and our youth homeless response team, which is one of our newer programs. We also have immigration legal assistance and immigrant advocacy and support. Uh, through our Santa Cruz County Immigration Project and our uh, newest uh, addition to the Immigration Services, our Thriving Immigrants Collaborative. We have youth and adult employment and reentry services through our, our CANSE and Day Worker Center program, as well as community building and youth development at our Davenport Resource Service Center up on the North Coast that also serves some folks on the edge of Santa Cruz as well. So we are Community Action for Santa Cruz County. We were created in 1965 as part of the War on Poverty, and we're the designated Community Action Agency for this county. Community Action is across the county, or across the nation, excuse me. There are Community Action Agencies in every county in this country. So it's a national, and then there's a statewide network of Community Action Agencies. And some of the things that make us different as an agency is that we have a tripartite board, and this is by design federally, um, that we are mandated to have a third low income representative, a third public sector representative, and one of our public sector representatives is Sandy Brown, councilwoman from the city of Santa Cruz, um, as well as a third private sector representative. Uh, for example, we have um, a farm worker seat and we have the CEO from the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, for example. So we have a very representative board um, by design. And then in addition, what makes uh, Community Action Board unique is that we're mandated, again, to every two years to have a conversation or a dialogue or hearing um, discussing poverty in this community and reaching out to our community, um, speaking with those that are experiencing poverty to hear what their needs and what information, what's new, what are trends, and what are their assets? This is a new thing that we've added really is both asking the community what their needs are around poverty, and then what are strengths and what are resiliencies that help them through this. And we do that every two years. So in our last needs and assets identification through our community action plan process in 2019, you can see that assets that were identified include community and family support and pride, availability of social services, internal, spiritual, and relational wealth, faith-based uh, resources, as well as access to legal rights assistance. And those were the main um, areas of assets and resiliency for our community. And then what has, you know, unfortunately been a trend um, for uh, several of our community action plans in the last couple of years, access to jobs, higher wages, consistent employment, barriers to accessing resources, health needs. Um, I think when we revamped our community action process about four years ago, 
and went even deeper into the community and talked with different groups, one of the things that rose for the very first time in our community action plan process as a need and a challenge was discrimination, prejudice, and stereotypes as impactors of poverty. And so that's been an area that we have uh, focused on in, in much of our work. And of course, one of the main trends uh, for many years running has been housing insecurity and high rent burden. And that is part of the programming that we'll be discussing in the next couple of slides for the presentation. So thank you, Helen. I'm gonna go ahead and guide you over uh, our overview of rental assistance programming. TAP has had rental assistance programming along with case management and financial literacy support to avoid eviction and homelessness for over 30 years. Services areas and resources have changed over time and all depending on our funding sources. Historically, TAB has between two to four funding sources that provide rental assistance for eligible city of Santa Cruz residents. Currently, at this time, our funding that we have are Red Cross, and these are for uh, residents who live in beach flats or lower ocean areas. We have Santa Cruz City Core. We have state heat funding, EFSP FEMA funding, which is currently pending at this time. We have two offices. Uh, one office is in Santa Cruz near Ocean Street and downtown Watsonville. Some of the eligibility for rental assistance um, specific populations depend on funding and sources and need. Generally, we serve families with vital children, households with disabled members, and households with senior members. Income guidelines qualifications vary depending on funding sources. Some are based on percentage of federal poverty level such as 100% or 200% of poverty. Some are based on percentage of average medium income, AMI, such as between 30 to 80% of AMI. After reviewing income guidelines, then we match households in need with funding available in jurisdictions. We determine household jurisdictions of residents rental agreement or lease, and eviction notice to proof of rent arrears. We determine assistance based on eligibility need and available funds. So we determine amount of rent needed, any other available community or household resources. We contact landlords for participation on agreement, and then funds based on the needs and available funding in the jurisdiction. So currently, um, City of Santa Cruz households served an outcome for this fiscal year 1920 up to date. We have served 56 city households, which we provided rent, and over 200 worldwide, uh, countywide, excuse me. This includes families, seniors, and disabled households. Approximately 150 individuals, two thirds are children, one third adults that have been served. 68% of those assisted stay housed over 12 months. So what have we seen after March, after the COVID-19 crisis? We have seen an increase of 50% of calls for rental assistance. What are the top reasons, or what are the top reasons this includes? We have seen calls from Job loss, reduction in work hours, lack of children, especially for those who are service workers who are working in restaurants, hotels, private housekeeping, in-home support services, and individuals who are in the school district. Of those calls, we see between a one to three months behind rent, and it really depends when they lost their job or lost their hours. Uh, 39 of Santa Cruz City households served since COVID-19 crisis began back in March. We have private funds donation for COVID-19 responses, increased capacity for low burial rent assistance, 
for those with a rental or lease agreement or that are not served throughout traditional funding that we currently have. So right now, what is our partnership with CAB in the city of Santa Cruz under COVID-19? Um, CAB uh, is working with cities, housing, and community development departments. We have submitted a CB, CDBG, CD, CB, and home TBRA applica an application. We expect seen approximately 200,000 in tenant-based rental assistance funds. We're still awaiting further HUD guidance in program parameters by the end of June. Now, what do we expect to serve um, if we get granted? We expect to assist between 60 to 80 city and Santa Cruz households, households with one or two months of rental assistance to avoid eviction and homelessness due to COVID-19 impact over fiscal year 2021. Thanks, um, Okay, so that is an overview, a very a brief overview of our rental assistance and housing assistance. And we just wanna also share with you a little bit about um, other of CAP efforts and initiatives right now, in particular during this COVID-19 time. So we've started to provide weekly food and PPE distribution at our day worker center, uh, which is located on 7th Avenue and serves many city of Santa Cruz residents. And we are doing job matching by phone only at this time. We've also pivoted from weekly to daily food distributions and supports for youth, seniors, families, and farm workers at the Davenport Resource Center. Our youth homeless outreach team has redoubled its efforts uh, regarding outreach and partnered with public health uh, partners and others to provide support at pop-ups throughout the community, uh, community to go right to the youth um, and are also providing support and case management at the transitional age youth or K shelter that's been at the symptom center and is getting ready to transition to transitional housing in the unincorporated area soon. Our immigration services include DACA and green card renewals, citizenship and other consultations via phone only at this time, and then advocacy through our thriving immigrants collaborative, including some community conversations and dialogues that are all done virtually right now. We continue to provide both un- and subsidized job placement assistance for youth and adults impacted by poverty and criminal justice involvement, including those uh, on CalWORKs, um, at risk of, or re-entering the community from criminal justice involvement, and we're very engaged. And again, most of that is done virtually or by phone. And one of our very newest uh, programs is the Disaster Relief Assistance for Immigrants, or DRE program, for those uh, undocumented immigrants impacted by COVID-19. And the next slide will talk a little bit more about that program. But for all of these efforts, including our rental assistance and housing programs, there's more information, um, including contact information on our website, which is www.cabin.org or our Facebook page, and both of those are listed below. So our next slide is talks a little bit about the Disaster Relief Assistance for Immigrants, or DRE program, and we've had a lot of interest in this program, and so we wanted to just highlight that quickly for you all. The DRE program pr project is a one-time state-funded disaster relief assistance for undocumented adult immigrants impacted by COVID-19. An undocumented adult who qualifies can receive $500 in direct assistance with a maximum of $1,000 in assistance per household. And of course, some of these households will be using this assistance for rental assistance and other household needs. Um, so in terms of eligibility, how do I know if uh, someone's eligible to receive DRE? To apply, you must be able to provide information that you're an undocumented adult, person over the age of 18, not eligible for federal COVID-19 related assistance like the CARES Act stimulus payments or pandemic unemployment benefits, and have experienced a hardship as a result of COVID-19. So what documents do folks need to apply for DRE? You must provide information and documents to verify your identity, home or mailing address, and show that you've been impacted by COVID-19. 
So in terms of applying for the assistance, it's, we're only uh, allowed by the state to have application via phone. And so uh, the Community Action Board, uh, we actually have been contracted to serve four counties, Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Benito, and San Luis Obispo counties. So there's one phone number for residents who think they may qualify for all of those counties, and that's 1-877-282-7174. And those phone lines are open Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we'd really like to uh, make sure that folks are aware of that. This is a temporary program that's only uh, available through the end of the month or until assistance funds run out. We're at about half of the, uh, half of the available funding has been committed at this point. So we do encourage folks to make a call if they believe they're eligible. And so then that brings us now to thanking you for your partnership and your leadership. Um, we've appreciated our very long-standing partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. And um, we're excited to be able to provide some additional support for rental assistance as well as other services, but in particular rental assistance right now when people are, um, are hurting so deeply with the COVID-19 crisis. And so we just asked if there's any questions. Okay, thank you very much for all that wonderful information and for this presentation and for taking the time to inform the council and the community about all the work that you're doing and the funding assistance that's available. Um, I'll open up. Looks like we have a couple council members with questions, and so I'll turn it over to Council Member Watkins. Um, I'll just echo the statements of the mayor, really thanking you for your presentation, but more importantly, really thanking you for your work that you're doing as safety net services providers for our community at this time. I just have a quick question in terms of the um, undocumented uh, folks seeking assistance. Are, is your information linked up to the 211 um, uh, directory, or how are we able to help support getting the word out? Fantastic. Yes, it is. Yes, it definitely is. It's on our website. It's on all of our social media. Um, we've worked with various partners. Um, it can certainly be linked to the city website. Um, again, uh, you know, the program is uh, scheduled to last through June 30th or until funds are committed. So we would just have to stay in touch, um, you know, close touch if, if you link it to the website. But that's an option. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Brown. Hi, thank you so much. It was really great to hear from you um, and get this kind of presentation. I, you know, I'm just uh, always amazed by what CAB does. I was, I just have to say, uh, with the, my first full-time job, my first real job in Santa Cruz was uh, the Community Action Board many years ago, and I have followed uh, the work and the expansion of services and just am always uh, amazed. There's, I have so many stories running through my mind right now of all the um, wonderful things that um, we've been, that you've been able to accomplish. I'm going to say we because I'm on the board now and I um, feel very, you know, connected to the organization. Um, just thank, and especially during these times, thank you so much for everything you do. Uh, I have two, well, actually, yeah, two questions. One is a question about the um, undocumented assistance line. I, you know, a lot of people are contacting me saying they can't get through. I know that, and we've talked about this, um, but if you just could say a couple of things about that so people who are listening, who are frustrated, um, understand what's going on and how, you know, how they can try to just continue to, you know, just be persistent. Um, that's one. And then the other is, do you, in terms of the increased demand and the additional resources you're getting for uh, rental assistance to prevent evictions, uh, how do you, are you feeling about the level of funding vis-a-vis -vis the need. I know there's always more need, but just what does that kind of look like, I guess, um, yeah. at the moment? Yeah. Thank you for that, Sandy, and thanks for your leadership. We love having you on the board, so thank you. Um, you know, yes, it has been, it's been frustrating. I know we had so much interest in the Drake program. Um, unfortunately, the state of California set the parameters for this program, and so uh, phone line and uh, no messages, uh, no email or online applications um, were allowed. And so, um, you know, we uh, had a, a narrow um, sort of format for applications. 
So I really want to appreciate um, that it has been difficult to get through. I think that um, we're definitely serving folks. Those folks are being patient and, you know, calling in. And so I really just counsel folks to continue to call. Um, maybe call at different times if you've reached, um, you know, it's been very busy. Uh, please do keep calling, and uh, I know it's not necessarily the ideal situation, but it's certainly the parameters that the state gave to us. And so thank you for the patience that the community is showing with that. And like I said, I'm really happy to report that, you know, we have uh, um, committed just about half of the assistance that we've received, and so uh, we feel good about our progress in serving the communities that, that were contracted to serve. In terms of the rental assistance um, and the needs, I think, you know, as we said in the presentation, we've seen an over 50% increase in calls in need for rental assistance. Um, the eviction moratoriums have been critical and important. We thank you, um, council members, for your leadership around that and leadership and extension. Of course, we know that the eviction moratorium is not a rental forgiveness, and so we are really definitely hearing from folks who are trying to stay uh, current um, and not face an eviction cliff once moratoriums are, are over. Um, so, you know, I, we're, I would definitely say there's more need than there is uh, rental assistance right now. We're particularly concerned about the next couple weeks right now. Um, we are uh, just about out of most of our funding sources for the city of Santa Cruz, and so that is a concern. We're in discussion with um, the county and other funders uh, to see about a possibility for any additional funding. Um, we are certainly working very closely in partnership with um, uh, Tiffany and others at the, the housing department at the city. Um, we're excited to uh, have the CDBG, CV and, and um, home funding coming soon. Um, we believe that will be in July, and so uh, we're hopeful that we'll have some additional funds uh, to meet what we know will continue to be an increased need as uh, folks are um, go through, you know, this transition process with COVID. I have one uh, question in particular. It sounds like um, Community Action Board's rental assistance funding generally is for um, families. And I'm just wondering if, like, say, an individual who's single uh, or people who don't have children, where or is there any type of funding that's available for them, or where have you all been directing kind of those folks who may be falling short on their rent? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a gap area, uh, Mayor, uh, and, and I think that um, one thing I will say, though, is in some of the, the private fundraising that we've been doing, um, working with funders uh, such as the Community Foundation and others, that has been one of the lower barrier um, uh, sources that we have sought. Um, it's true, uh, most of our funding is for families as well as uh, those with uh, disabilities and seniors. Um, and so the low barrier uh, uh, private funding for folks who either don't have a lease or rental agreement or fall within the 18 to, to 59 category is where we are able to assist those folks. And I think we'll continue to seek out additional funding that will, will help bridge, um, bridge for that population. Um, I think for the city of Santa Cruz, there's other, you know, faith-based, um, uh, funding sources like Catholic Charities and others uh, that we would do referrals to. Great. Well, thank you for your presentation, for all the wonderful information that you've been able to share with us today and all the work that you're doing for so many people within our community. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you. council members. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Okay, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting. Whenever we move into an agenda item, they will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items the council is taking action on and not on regular updates or reports. 
Items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are the items number five through 20 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there's any statements of disqualification today. Councilman Matthews. Yes, uh, I need to disqualify myself from number 13. That's the sewer replacement on Walnut Avenue. As happy as I am to see it, it goes in front of my house. So, <laughs> and I, I'm just going to check. At that point, should I just mute, stop video, and back off for that I item? I think that'd be appropriate. Can I weigh in here? Because if, if it's just a replacement that won't uh, result in a change in the level of service or anything of that nature, then um, even though it's within the proximity of your residence, um, I do not believe that, it, that there's a conflict of interest. Okay. Or a, a disqualifying conflict of interest in that situation. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I'd like to ask the clerk to announce any <laughs> deletions. No, there are none. Okay. Uh, next item is an announcement of oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. And oral communications will occur on or around 6 p.m. this evening. I'd like to ask the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Um, this afternoon, the Council convened in closed session at 11 a.m. to consider the following matters. Um, item A was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. The claimant is of the name Annie H. Bradfield. That is also item 9 on your consent agenda this afternoon. Uh, item B was a conference uh, with labor negotiators involving uh, the POA, firefighter, IAFF local 1716, fire management, police management, uh, OE3 mid manager and supervisor employees, SEIU local 521, and unrepresented employees. Uh, the city received a report from its negotiators, uh, and there was no reportable action on that. Item C was real property negotiations and two parcels were discussed in closed sessions this morning and this afternoon. First is property uh, that contains the River Street Homeless Shelter at 115 C Coral Street. Uh, city received a report from its uh, negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb. Uh, same with item uh, C2, which is real property at 125 Coral Street. Uh, owners James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie, trustees, and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie, co-trustees. The uh, city also received a report from its negotiator, uh, Bonnie Liscombe, no reportable action. Uh, item D was a uh, conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation. Uh, and in that item, the council, by a unanimous vote, authorized the city to join a coalition of public agencies seeking to challenge cg es practice of calculating utility users tax payments net of greenhouse gas credits that are applied to pg e customers' utility bills semi-annually, uh, which results in an underpayment of utility users tax to the city and other public agencies that have utility users tax. Um, more detail in the particulars of that action will be available upon request by members of the public uh, once the action is final, which I anticipate will occur uh, later this month. Lastly was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. That is the um, case entitled City of San Santa Cruz versus uh, Santee, Richard et and others. Uh, counsel received a report and gave direction to uh, the city attorney's office with respect to that matter, uh, but there was no report of action. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that report. I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on city business, COVID-19 COVID response, and other events. Uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, yes, I'm just going to do a brief update, uh, as well as have uh, Rebecca from Economic Development do an update on the uh, uh, shelter-in-place orders, uh, the health order, and some of the changes there. As uh, the Council knows, much of the focus uh, right now is on uh, reopenings and uh, the changes to the, the order that allows for more uh, activities and uh, businesses to open. You'll recall that in my last conversation, we were in the midst of uh, trying to get to the uh, 
uh, the expanded latter stages of, of, uh, of stage two, uh, and the county was uh, going to be uh, getting an attestation. Since then, they actually did it. They actually did it sooner than I had actually presented and had been uh, informed. Uh, and that is uh, already in place and approved by the state. So that essentially provided for uh, uh, certain sectors to reopen, uh, particularly destination retail and dining restaurants, or the, those are the bigger categories. And since then, we've been vigorously working to develop protocols and guidance uh, for our outdoor uh, expansion program, which uh, Rebecca will uh, go over in a few minutes. Uh, however, even since then, there have been additional modifications and changes to the, the shelter-in-place order and uh, expect to have additional reopenings. And of note, uh, these will begin June 12th. I'll just point out the ones that are most significant of note, and that includes uh, campgrounds, RV parks, and outdoor recreation, card rooms, family entertainment centers like bowling alleys, arcades, uh, gyms and fitness centers, hotels, including travel and tourism, uh, museums, galleries, and aquariums. Uh, so those are, rest and, then, and then of course, restaurant bars, wineries, and brew pubs. So those are all expected to reopen as of June 12th. The one thing that still continues to be the same is the beach uh, hours, uh, which will continue to be uh, closed during the uh, 11 to 5. Uh, time frame. Uh, but those are the latest development. They happen very quickly. Um, and uh, I'll now turn it over to Rebecca to kind of give you an update on what we're doing to try to facilitate and expedite the, particularly the, the dining uh, experience here. Great. Thank you so much, Martin, and uh, good afternoon, Council and Mayor. I'm very excited to be able to uh, share with you our new uh, temporary outdoor expansion area program that we launched officially on Friday. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here for you so I can uh, navigate to our website. Um, so uh, as you all are familiar, um, all of our business resources uh, regarding our COVID-19 response is found on twosantacruz.com slash coronavirus. Um, so we have uh, been updating this page to provide uh, new information as it's become available. And with the latest actions that uh, we took last week to allow for expanded outdoor dining areas and uh, retail, uh, we've created a new page on our website uh, that provides information about this program. Um, and so uh, with, the, with the new program, we're allowing for expanded retail and restaurant activity on sidewalks where there's eight feet of clearance, um, on private parking lots and setback, uh, setback areas, uh, as well as on uh, on-street parking areas, so um, what you might see as parklets doing a little bit lower scale uh, expansion into those on-street parking spaces, uh, as well as some alleyways in the downtown, and we're also doing street closures uh, in the downtown, starting with uh, the section of Pacific Avenue between Lincoln and Cathcart Street. Uh, so as part of this program, we've developed a series of guidelines that businesses can uh, view on our website here um, that just talks about the different requirements that we are meeting uh, based on the type of expansion area that you're proposing. Uh, we have information for businesses related to the insurance requirements um, that we'll need to have as part of that application. And all of the application materials are available here um, for businesses to view. We are the Economic Development Department is leading the uh, permitting of these expansion areas, and we're doing this through a temporary use permit. Um, and so businesses are able to apply online very easily. We have a pretty quick application form, um, and they'll have to provide a, a synopsis of what they're doing. And then we've asked that they upload their insurance, uh, proof of insurance, as well as their um, site plan. And if they're serving alcohol, the approval from ABC, which has extended a temporary catering authorization. Um, and then we'll be reviewing. We've already received uh, four applications so far, so it's very exciting to see the community embracing this. Um, and we'll be processing them as quickly as possible to help businesses uh, expand to this. And then we've also been doing a lot of communication to the new business categories that are able to reopen um, under the governor's most recent uh, order. So happy to answer any questions about this program or the process. Okay, thanks for that presentation. Um, and so I guess we should just be directing folks to choose Santa Cruz 
dot com for information if they need to do those outdoor if they need an outdoor permit. That's right. And we've actually created a friendly URL for this. Uh, that's choosesantacruz.com slash outdoor expansion. So they can just go straight there and I'll take them to the program information. And also please direct anyone to me as well. I'm happy to answer questions and, and be a point of contact for them. I have one more question as well. I know that um, there's been some discussion uh, with the downtown association reaching out to businesses about shutting up about street closures and people keep asking us to shut down Pacific Ave. Is there any kind of updates on maybe those kinds of conversations? Yeah, um, so in the executive order, we did um, authorize the closure for uh, the 1100 block of Pacific Avenue. So that is the stretch of Pacific between Lincoln Street and Cathcart Street. Um, so that's the initial closure that we had, just looking at the businesses that are there that will be able to take advantage of that space and also recognizing the emergency access needs uh, through Pacific Avenue. Um, and I know we are exploring a few other locations uh, where businesses have expressed interest and uh, working internally to get those plans in place. And I'll let Bonnie uh, add to that as well if she has anything. Yeah, we uh, have been working with um, Public Works and other departments, and I'll just take a second to say the entire um, city team, cross departments, have been pretty phenomenal in really quickly um, approving guidelines and coming together so that we can safely reopen and expand into the public right of way. It really has been an all hands on deck. So I just wanted to acknowledge the work of the other departments, and they'll continue to work because we're trying to turn these applications around really quickly and everyone's committed. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so yes, 1100 blocks towards the, that, that Rebecca just mentioned towards the end of this week. And then a, a good portion of Cathcart between Pacific and Cedar uh, at some point next week. So we're working through those initially as a pilot. And um, so a main, main Pacific street downtown and a side street. And then we'll assess um, based on uh, feedback and interest from other businesses downtown um, whether or not we, we expand that further. Is that closure, are those closures like timed? Is there a specific date when um, those streets will be closed? Or is, are they, is, it, is it at the discretion of those businesses? Um, it's, we're trying to coordinate it for, the entire, for that entire block, and so we're coordinating with the downtown association and, and those businesses. So we're, we're uh, ready to go here at the city, um, and Public Works can set up the barricades and everything that we need in about a half a day. Um, but we don't want to close it too soon before we have all the businesses ready. So we're just trying to coordinate with them, um, but we anticipate that the closure of the 1100 block will be Thursday or Friday of this week. And we'll, po and we'll post everything and we'll have signage up. Great. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Just a quick question, and I know, Bonnie, you're, you're just getting started on this, um, and I want to just thank um, your whole staff and planning staff and Martine's office for all the work to get this done so quickly. Um, I've gotten a lot of great response that um, the city's just been so proactive on this, so thank you. Um, this is probably an impossible thing to answer, but um, on average, I mean, is this going to be a process that takes like an hour, or just curious about sort of what the kind of the, the time frame is that a, a business owner might expect to be kind of be engaged in this in this permit. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and then Rebecca, you can kind of add on. But um, we worked on the guidelines so that um, they would be really clear, so that businesses coming in, if they meet the guidelines and use the recommended uh, barricades, whether it's on a sidewalk or a street with different specifications that those applications can be turned around and approved and a permit granted within 24 hours. If they are going outside the guidelines, they want to do something a little different or it's on a tricky corner where there's some traffic concerns, um, those may take a little longer. Where if it's outside the regular guidelines, we're hoping we can turn those around in two to three days. Um, but we may be able to turn them around sooner just depending on the flow and number of um, applications that come in. We have one right now that's outside the guidelines, but I still think we're going to be able to turn it around in a day. And I just had one other question. I'm sorry, um, Rebecca, you might have covered this. Um, is there a fee? Is, are, are we just charging a nominal fee or, or just no fee at all? Great. Okay. Thank yeah. you. 
no fee. Yeah, just the cost of businesses to apply for the ABC permit. The ABC uh, expansion authorization is $100, um, and that's a really quick process. Businesses are turned around quickly, but yeah, no fee from the city. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Golder. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for all your hard work on this. I think uh, having a more pedestrian-friendly Pacific Garden Mall is something that I've always wanted to see, and so I'm excited to see this, even if it's temporary, um, how, it, how it works out. And my question is, um, I'm more... Uh-oh. Renee, it seems like your connection might have failed. Why don't we move on to Councilmember Byers and hopefully um, Councilmember Golder can reconnect and maybe ask a question. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm excited about this. I remember talking about it on budget day or something, early May, so it's exciting, it's happening. Uh, have, uh, what about SoCal Avenue? And um, have other places approached us and want to do something? I'm thinking yeah. of a business community, then there's probably a couple on Mission Street too, but I, I, I go right to thinking of SoCal, which has really become that whole midtown, you know, commercial, sweet little places. Yeah, absolutely. So um, these are allowed citywide uh, within the guidelines. Um, I've been in active communication with the midtown Good. businesses um, as well, and I know that we've gotten a lot of interest as well from the west side. Um, so where it fits within the guidelines and how their space is set up, we're definitely happy to accommodate that um, and, and excited to see what they're able to bring forward. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. Thanks. How come we're all, nobody's on. I had a quick question um, while we wait for uh, Councilmember Golder to uh, reconnect. Um, does this also do, sorry, let me rephrase that question. Um, would this also be possible, so say for example there's a business that has a parking lot and they can effectively close the parking lot and allow for either outdoor dining? And I know that some of the bars are going to be opening up on Friday too. Would they also qualify for this if they had that kind of space available? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have a number of businesses that are utilizing their uh, private parking lot for that expanded use. Um, we're looking at using a, a portion of the loft, not to take away the full parking area, um, but being able to use some areas of it um, and being able to yeah, have that outdoor um, dining expanded. And then with the space, um, you know, reopening of bars and wineries and tasting rooms, I know that we've also received interest from those businesses and we'll be working with them too. Yeah, we'll just need to update our guidelines to include them because when we released them, um, bars weren't eligible to open. So we'll update those guidelines for them as well. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you so much, this is exciting. And I look forward to seeing our businesses out and open. I just have a quick question. Say, for example, there's a business that is in a location that isn't really conducive to outdoor, um, the outdoor experience. Is there going to be an opportunity for them to go have like a pop-up potentially somewhere where it is a more conducive location so that they're not excluded from this um, opportunity? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Rebecca um, can jump in. We do have right now, I, I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but three alleys in the downtown um, that as long as the business is located within 200 feet of the alley that they could um, open up and, and sort of do a pop-up in the alley. So Fraser Lewis Lane, um, Plaza Lane, and Pearl Alley. And then elsewhere in the city, we'll, we'll look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Our, our goal is to be able to accommodate if we can safely do so. Okay, Councilmember Golder, turn over to you. Got cut off. I'm so sorry, guys. My connection is not fantastic. Um, so I don't know how much of my question you heard or if I was frozen. None of it. None of it. Okay. So basically, I said I'm super excited about this, and uh, I've always wanted a more pedestrian friendly Pacific Art Mall, and so I'm excited to see this, even if it's temporary. But I was wondering if the businesses, I'm envisioning mostly restaurants. I don't think retail will be bringing their stuff in and out every day. Maybe they will. But I was thinking for the tables, are it going to be like permanent or semi-permanent um, tables and stuff similar to Hula's, or are the workers going to be schlepping all their stuff in and out at the beginning and the end of the day? 
Um, so we are proposing um, that businesses tell us how they want to secure their spaces. It will sort of depend on how they're setting up the space. Uh, if it's on the sidewalk, um, we'll likely ask that they bring the tables back inside. Um, it's sort of going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. There's also security concerns for the businesses. But, um, you know, we're not intending it to be as permanent as the Hula's parklets and those types of things. We're really wanting this to be a really easy thing that businesses can implement and especially with their existing seating indoors that they're not able to utilize, if they're able to bring that out to expand it, um, we'll be working with them to figure out what the best strategy is to secure their furniture and, and make it workable for them. Great. Well, it looks like those are all the questions, so thanks for your presentation for that update. Thanks. All right, so I'll turn it back over to the city manager. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, yeah, thank you to all the staff for all the hard work to put this together. And uh, again, there'll be a lot more work to uh, assist the uh, additional businesses that are reopening, so we'll, we'll get focused on, on moving forward with that. Uh, the, I know the other area of interest uh, that the council might have is uh, with respect to uh, the demonstrations and, and, uh, and police uh, work there. So. Uh, I would ask uh, Andy, I think he's uh, available, to maybe just do a brief update on how things are going with respect to um, the demonstrations and other public safety items. Well, thank you, Martine, and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, it's been a long couple weeks for us, but uh, I think we're coming out on the back side of this, uh, and, uh, and I wanted to update you on a few things. We had dozens of protests. Uh, all over the city for um, and varying in size and intensity and complexity. Uh, and only one really had some uh, difficulty with it uh, from the standpoint of uh, where there was a little bit of vandalism here at the police department. But by the next morning, it was cleaned up and uh, everything was ready to go. Uh, there were a couple of others that were pretty intense. And I really want to recognize and acknowledge the mayor and, uh, uh, and council member Watkins as well as um, uh, several community members. Uh, we were meeting here at the police department uh, talking about what policies and laws can be changed in order to improve policing and, and our, how we treat and interact with the uh, black community in, in specific, but people of color in, in general. And it was a very powerful and important meeting as protesters arrived. And then some of the uh, people who were meeting went outside to address the protesters. And, uh, fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, I think as a result of that, it really, you can see it help tone down the, the tenor of the crowd. And, uh, and so it was a, I thought, a very beautiful and powerful thing. And uh, which, which uh, begs to the point that uh, protests can happen, change can happen uh, in a environment where the police are not marshaled up in riot gear and and, uh, and weapons to greet people who are protesting. We, were, uh, we purposely kept a very low profile, kept officers out of the way so that people could protest without fear and intimidation. And, uh, and that as much communication as possible. So um, again, I'd like to thank those who, who helped out. And just uh, as a last note, we had a protest here at our building on uh, Saturday. Right at the same time, we had officers rushing up to Ben Lomond with our rescue vehicle to uh, get evacuate the officer who was down because uh, they couldn't get to him. And uh, so the office, our officers, our SWAT officers uh, went up there, got him into the rescue vehicle as well as some other people that were pinned down uh, by gunfire and explosives and were able to get them out of there while people were protesting here at the department. And when I told the protesters uh, what took place, uh, the reaction of the protesters was amazing. Uh, they wanted us to hear them. They wanted us to make sure that, uh, that we understand that, uh, that the way police nationwide have been interacting with the community uh, is not acceptable. But they also rose up to support us and understood clearly uh, the pain that violence causes to including the police. And so they prayed uh, for our officers as well as uh, Sergeant uh, Gutzweiler. So um, I just really want to thank and, and, and recognize uh, the protesters in our community 
because I think that Santa Cruz showed the nation how to do it correctly. And, uh, and some of those people are people like Joy Flynn and Bella and Taj and uh, the list could go on. But I just wanted to recognize a few of the many protesters who have just done an amazing job. And I can guarantee you that we're going to work together to make sure that there's change that's real, that's substantive, and, uh, and, and something you can touch and feel and see uh, for policing. Uh, that's all I have, uh, our team. Yeah, and I just want to just thank the, the chief and the, uh, all our police officers, too, that have been really uh, had to do a lot of work uh, in, in, in recent days and weeks uh, with everything. So they've done an amazing job. Thank you. You made it, uh, Mayor. Are there any council members that thanks, Andy, for that update? Um, are there any council members who have any questions at this time? Okay, hearing none. Thanks, Chief. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is the council meeting calendar. I'll now call on the clerk to city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. We don't have any updates. Okay, so I'll move into our consent agenda. Uh, first up is the consent agenda. These are items numbers five through 15. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 5 through 15. The instructions are now on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star 9 to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying that you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull any items? If so, please raise your hand. Councilmember Matthews. Yes, I'd like to pull item seven. I'm supportive of it. I want to just suggest a small additional language that is further supportive. Okay. Councilmember Byers. Oh, you're muted. Catherine, you're muted. Uh, eight, having to do with the pilings on the wharf. I'd like to pull that. Okay. okay. Um, are there any other items which to be pulled from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'd like to open it up to the public for comment on any items on consent with the exception of items numbers seven and eight. If you'd like to comment on any of the consent items with the exceptions of numbers seven and eight, now is the time to please call in. Uh, when you're in the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and we will recognize you and give you two minutes to speak. Okay, seeing no members of the public interested in commenting on these items, we'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. I'm looking for a motion on the consent agenda items with the exception of number seven and eight. Councilmember Matthews. Yes, I'll go ahead and move consent except for those two items, seven and eight. Okay. I'll go ahead and second that. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins to move all the items on consent with the exception of number seven and eight. I'll call on the clerk to do a roll call vote. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Donna, you're muted. Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. The pass is unanimously. Now we'll bring it back to Councilmember Watkins for item number seven on consent. Me, Councilmember Matthews. Oh, sorry, Matthews, sorry. Uh. Yeah, um, item seven is a resolution supporting the League of California Cities uh, campaign to support local recovery, vibrant cities, strong economies, and it's a great program. Um, I would just like to suggest the addition. Uh, it calls for us to submit a letter to the governor, legislative delegation, congressional um, representatives, and I gave the 
put some additional language to Bonnie, which she can put up. It's very straightforward. I'd like to add, and local community partners um, expressing support for the campaign objective and further authorizing official communication on specific city priorities that are consistent with this campaign. And my reason for suggesting that is, as we know, a lot of the state and federal funding is in, in such a state of flux and what it's um, potentially available for, and we have our own needs related to that. So I'd like to just give a, a clear uh, green light for the city staff, particularly since we're going to be off in July. Uh, when they see things of our interest that are consistent with that League of California Cities campaign, we just go ahead and activate. And also, uh, the, the League, um, website for this campaign has good fact sheets, uh, one directed at labor, one directed, directed at business, and good factual material. And so I do think some of our community partners across the spectrum will uh, be very supportive of this as well. So that's, that's the suggestion. Great. I think it's a great suggestion. So thank you for including that language. Are there any council members who would like to comment on this item at this time? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to the public. If there are members of the public who would like to comment on item seven on our agenda, a resolution to support Leave California Cities, support local recovery campaign, uh, please call in now. And when you are, when you've uh, gotten into the room, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and be acknowledged. And you will have two minutes to comment. Seeing no members of the public that would like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Member Matthews. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and move the item as amended. I'll second it. I'll second it, or however, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead, Martin. I forgot okay. to raise my hand. We have a motion by <laughs> Council Member Matthews. Seconded by Council Member Watkins to move item number seven. I'll turn it over to the clerk for the roll call vote. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. And we'll move on to the next item, which is item number eight um, that was pulled by Councilmember Byers, application for an economic adjustment assistance grant for the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf from the U.S. Department of Commerce and Economic Development Administration. Councilmember Byers. Thank you. Uh, and I see Bonnie's here. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I spoke to you the other day, and you gave me quite a bit of time going over this. And then I walked out there yesterday, and it just raised a couple more questions. Uh, so here I am. Probably ask you to kind of summarize again. When I went out there, I was surprised how enormous a piece of property that is. And I think whenever you tear down a building, it always looks twice as big as your memory will have you think about that building. But uh, anyway, uh, what, what has come up, and I think I asked you about, if we don't get this grant, are the pilings still to be re-fixed or I guess brand new? You're going to replace them, I think, right? Yeah, so we have um, had funding set aside for this project. It's just after we met with our EDA representative and um, she has funded us, recommended us for funding, and we were awarded funding from Economic Development Administration in the past for the war. Um, that she felt this was a really good fit for a grant. And so any amount of funding we can replace with grant funding, we're, we're always up for, for pursuing that because that would free up our less restrictive funding for other city priorities. So we saw this as an opportunity to replace some of the um, city funding that, um, that is set aside for this project. Thank you. And I assume, um 
are we advertising that that property is available for somebody to build a restaurant or I assume whatever they would do? Yeah, so that property, um, we have been in, um, and some of the council members that have been on the council during this, this time, yeah. but we've come to council several times um, with um, an existing wharf tenant who is very interested in that property. Mm -hmm. And um, council had approved some preliminary um, plans for the property and there's some outstanding negotiation items. So at this time, um, considering the financial situation, um, we're, our plan was to fix the substrate, the infrastructure that we need to support new development, and then come back to council with a, to sort of summarize where we are today and get direction whether or not to pursue these existing negotiations for the site or to put out an, a request for proposal for new development on the site. But right now, given the financial investment and the cost of the infrastructure, it's just not financially feasible for uh, someone to come in at this point um, and take on that, in addition to a complete new building, but to take on the substrate um, cost as well. As, uh, as I understand, I think I read here too, there'll be um, part of the project will be improve, improve the sidewalk or whatever you call it, the, the walkway in front of it. So that would help. Attract somebody to as well. Okay, thanks a lot. That I think uh, those were my questions. Okay, um, I'd like to take this opportunity. Also, um, the resolution in the packet um, right is actually needs to be updated. So we intended to have two resolutions for two applications, um, but in um, our haste and I take responsibility for it, the wrong resolution is in the packet. So <laughs> I was just about to read it. <laughs> yeah, so you will notice um, we, we had two and only one made it in the packet. So um, the one, the staff report uh, talks about the war and the, right. the resolution in your packet is actually to support the revolving loan program that we would like to bring forward to you at the next meeting on June 23rd. Um, so I apologize for that mistake. Um, I can screen share um, the actual right um, resolution resolution. Let me make sure I have the right one up because I have both pulled up on my desktop. That's fine with me if it's okay with the mayor to substitute the right resolution. Yeah. Can, is this the right one? Does it say wharf on the top? I can't yes. see it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. this is the right resolution that should have been in your packet and I apologize for that error. And our plan, as, as indicated in the staff report, is to come back to you on the 23rd to also get your direction to apply for an additional application um, for a countywide revolving loan program. And we've been in discussion um, with the other jurisdictions about this. And we just um, anecdotally um, just received news from our EDA representative that they have accepted our community economic development strategy that was prepared countywide through the Workforce Investment Board. So we're really we're really happy that they support the plan and the revolving loan program fits right with that said um, approved report. So we think there'll be a really good response to a countywide revolving loan program as well. But this is the resolution for the work that should be in your packet. So the recommendation on page one, which is resolution authorizing, is the correct wording there. So I will move that resolution. Uh, recommendation. Eight point one. Yes. Oh, you want public hearing first? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. but when we come back, I'll. Uh, sure. That's fine. Councilmember Matthews. That that cleared it up for me. Yeah. Great. There are no further comments from council members. Uh, we'll turn it over to the public. If there's any member of the public who would like to comment on item number eight, which is an application for an economic adjustment assistance grant for the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf from the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Economic Development Administration, please call in now. And once you've entered the call, please press star nine on your phone and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Okay, 
seeing that there are no members of the public who would like to speak to this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Councilmember Byers. Okay, I'll uh, move the um, eight page one, eight dot one. The recommendation, resolution authorizing the city manager to apply and accept a grant from the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration for funding the Santa Cruz Municipal War from the Economic Adjustment Assistance Grant Program. My council members, Councilman Matthews, is here to We have a second from Councilman Matthews. There's no further questions or comments. I'll turn it over to the clerk uh, for the vote. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Holder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to our next item of business, which is the consent public hearings. Uh, these are items number 16 through 18. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, are there any council members who would wish to pull items 16 through 18? Okay. Seeing none, if there are any members of the public who would wish to speak to these items, which is our consent public hearing, now is the time to do so. You'll need to call in with the number on your screen and then press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, and once you've been recognized, you'll be given two minutes to speak on this item. Public hearing items, item number 16, second reading and fi final adoption of ordinance number 2020-10, the item number 17, downtown association parking and business improvement area assessments, and item number 18, cooperative retail management business real property improvement district assessments for fiscal year 2021. Okay, I'm motion by Councilmember Myers, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, um, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I'd like to second that. Yep. Seconded by Councilmember Matthews. There is no further discussion. We will turn it over to the clerk, the clerk, the clerk to take the vote. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Holder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. The passage unanimously. Okay, next up on our agenda is item number 19, which is a public hearing for a cannabis retail license to allow license transfers. For members of the public who are streaming into this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff to the council members who brought the item forward, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for action and deliberation. So with, with this, I will turn it over to our presenters, Catherine Donovan, Senior Planner, and Matthew Van Wa, uh, Principal Planner. Uh, good afternoon, Council and members of the public. I'm uh, having a little trouble with my Zoom today. It's not allowing me to share my screen. So I'm going to ask Bonnie Bush to bring up the presentation. Um, we're here tonight, this afternoon, uh, with a, an ordinance amendment um, to allow the transfer of cannabis licenses. Next slide. Um, 
In September of 2017, the City Council directed uh, staff to write an ordinance to allow adult use cannabis and to limit the number of retailers to no more than five, but to also allow the addition of more retailers by resolution rather than ordinance. Um, they also requested that we support local minority and women-owned businesses along with uh, some other community benefits. And as a result of this direction, staff created uh, the cannabis retailer license. Um, and the licenses are awarded through a competitive process, and it's ba they're based on a number of factors, including the support of local minority and women-owned businesses. There was also a limit on license transfers, not allowing the transfers because um, since the licenses were awarded on a competitive basis, we didn't want someone to win an award because they had a lot of our community benefits and then promptly sell that license to somebody else who might not meet those same factors. Next slide. But as soon as the ordinance went into place, um, the retailers made it very clear that they wanted to be able to sell their businesses and transfer their licenses. Um, they, because the sale of cannabis is still illegal federally, it's very hard to raise capital in the normal um, fashion. And so the only way that businesses are able to raise capital other than um, getting it from friends and relatives is by uh, investment. And to do that, we, the city, if there's an investment of over 20%, we consider that a change in license. Um, retailers also want to be able to regroup, recoup their uh, investment if they're ready to retire or just want to get into some other type of business. And um, we hear a lot that they want to be treated like any other business. Um, and one other concern is what would happen if an owner died and the license couldn't be transferred to the owner's heirs. These are all valid points, and um, we, we have considered those in the writing of this ordinance. But from the city's perspective, there are some conflicts. Because the licenses were awarded based on the community benefits that were being provided by the specific business, um, allowing transfers creates a, a conflict there because we won't necessarily get those same benefits. Um, and because the, the process was set up that if one business closed, there would be a new competitive process, and we might actually get more community benefits than the original business was providing. In addition, because there are only five licenses, that creates sort of what we call the medallion, the taxicab medallion um, effect, where the business, the price of the business is, is set not necessarily on the value of the business itself, but on the value of being able to open a business in Santa Cruz by getting one of those five licenses. Next slide. So as we were looking at ways that we could allow license transfers, um, we considered how we could resolve these conflicts. And the easiest way um, is to remove the limit on the number of licenses because if there is no limit, then the license itself does not create this artificial value. Um, and we can also require that new, and new owners provide either the same or similar value community benefits as were brought by the original owners. But as soon as we started talking about removing the limit on the number of licenses, 
um, we got a lot of pushback. Um, we felt that it was a reasonable course because one of the reasons that we had had the limit in the first place was that um, this was a, a new frontier and the city council at the time wanted to have some control over potential impacts and some time to see how this whole business shook out and whether this was going to be a problematic thing that we didn't actually want to allow or whether we could just open it up. Um, but we have not had any problems with our existing businesses. There's been no increase in crime in the areas where they are open. They're, they don't have um, significant calls for service, which is generally uh, a matrix that we use to define whether a business is a, a problem business or not. Um, there are also limitations on where the businesses can go, and so they're limited. The zoning limits actually limit somewhat the number of businesses because they're only allowed in specific commercial locations, and there are buffers around other cannabis businesses and around sensitive uses such as schools and playgrounds. Um, and we found with the first round of licenses that there's also a limited number of properties available, and that's true for any business that wants to open. You know, most commercial properties try to have a, a business at least in place, and so there usually aren't that many open uh, properties that are available for lease at any one time. Um, and we found with the cannabis businesses, even if a lease, a business, might, a building might be available, um, owners were either reluctant to lease to cannabis businesses because they are still federally illegal, or uh, if they were willing to lease, they might also want to jack up the price. And we got lots of reports of that happening. Um, in addition to the zoning and the limit on the number of properties, there are also market limits. There, there's a certain amount of cannabis sales that the market can support, and beyond that, businesses just won't be able to survive. So there's a sort of a Darwinian effect there where, um, you know, if we got too many businesses, some of them would have naturally go out of business. Um, and we worked with the um, Council Cannabis Subcommittee on these issues, and they had asked us to look into other ways that we might be able to stop this, what we're calling the medallion effect, the, the um, increase in, co in the price of the business due to the limit on the licenses. And we were not able to come up with any other um, method of, of stopping that other than increasing the number of licenses. Next slide. Um, so we met with the industry and listened to their concerns. And um, since they've opened, the businesses have, um, it, it has not been an easy road. There's a lot of restrictions by the state. There are uh, a lot of taxes to be paid. The state also has some pretty intense fees on cannabis businesses. And um, there's a lot of competition with online purveyors who we are not able to stop from selling, from delivering into the city. Um, so the industry has had to deal with all of these issues and the idea of, of having more businesses come in at this time was uh, very unwelcome to them. Um, and they also expressed a concern that there would be an over-concentration um, in Santa Cruz if we allowed more businesses to open. And an over-concentration is when you have um, a number of businesses per capita that is larger than um, in the general area, usually measured by the county, um, although there are other, other matrix, matrix, matrices for um, 
considering over-concentration. Sometimes it's considered by census tract, but um, that is actually not a very accurate uh, way to, to view over-concentration. But as a result of those industry concerns, um, the subcommittee decided to recommend against lifting the limit at this time. I'd, uh, and I should mention that although they recommended not to lift the limit, that recommendation was not unanimous. So there was some disagreement among the subcommittee members themselves. So looking at the actual changes for the license transfer, um, we used the City of Capitola's ordinance as a model. Um, this was one that was recommended by some members of the industry and the council itself when we had addressed this back in September. Um, and as we worked on the actual transfer piece, um, we, ha we had some issues of concern and we ended up developing two different options. Option one is very similar to Capitola. It requires a new license um, if over 50% of the ownership changes. Um, and if, if the change is under 50%, then um, the owners are required to inform the city of the changes in ownership and would need to meet the original factors. Um, we're a little concerned with this one because um, meeting the the original factors, when we came up with those original factors, um, we had not had experience in this field before. And going through the process, we gained a lot of knowledge and we realized that those factors need to be tightened up. There's some factors that really don't apply anymore. There's other factors that, for instance, the local residency or woman or minority owned businesses there's no number attached to that. So um, if a business that was originally 100% woman owned sold 50% of the business um, to people who were not women, they may have that factor, the fact that they were women owned may have helped them get that original award and now they were not no longer meeting the factor in terms of the competition, but they would still qualify under the old factors. Um, next slide. So staff and the council subcommittee are recommending option two, which is that a new license would be required for any ownership change, and then the new and improved factors would apply to all changes. And um, this provides more transparency, and it also um, means that we don't have to continue tracking the original factors for the original licenses and whatever changes they've gone through, and the new factors for new licenses. Now, the applying for a new license is not extremely onerous. Um, the most onerous thing is that, there, that there's a background check and that would be required anyway, um, whether it was an ownership change or simply a new person owning a portion of the business. Um, so we did not feel this is a particularly onerous request and, and it provides the city with more transparency and also allows us to apply the new and improved factors. Next slide. So when we revised these factors, we, um, we made two new requirements. One was a, a factor which was to pay the living wage, and the second was um, something new that was suggested by the council subcommittee, and that was to have language in there that um, the business would not interfere with the employees forming a union or joining a union. Um, we also had some revisions to the factors. 
we um, put a, a number on the local residency minority or women-owned business factors so that it has to be at least 50% in order to qualify for those factors. We had um, stronger definitions for employee benefits and some of the other factors. Um, and we also require that for the license transfers, which are not going through a competitive process, that they must meet six out of the nine factors. Next slide. Um, and we also had a, a couple of new factors. One was a limit on um, how many businesses that the new business could own, um, limiting to no more than six businesses. And that was a, a considering small and local businesses, we wanted to um, have something that um, allowed businesses to grow a bit, but still, um, you know, there's, there's some very large businesses out there, and we would prefer to have smaller businesses in the city. And so that was having this as a factor allows that to weigh into the decision. And another factor was to um, have an employee-owned business, a business that was at least 50% employee-owned. That would be another factor. So um, that would weigh in toward uh, qualifying as a business. And some of the original factors were removed. Um, prior legal business experience we felt was important in the original application period when we didn't have any experience in this, but is not so important now. Um, we also required clean energy originally, but now that um, all of our energy comes from the, our um, Monterey Bay Clean Energy Consortium, um, it's not a required factor because everybody qualifies. Um, we also had a factor that was that you carry a majority of organic products, but there is no organic certification for <laughs> cannabis products yet. Um, there, there is language in the state regulations that someday there will be, but it's been two plus years and it still doesn't exist. And so that didn't make sense at this time as a factor. Next. So there was some community outreach on this. We had um, two initial meetings that were um, virtual meetings. One was we, we reached out to the cannabis industry, um, both in the city and in the county. And the second meeting was for the general public. Um, but the truth of the matter is both of those meetings were attended by the same industry groups. We, we had virtually no new people at the general public meeting. Um, and after, uh, after those two meetings, um, we set up an additional meeting with the, in the industry group and the subcommittee um, so that the industry group could speak directly to the subcommittee about their concerns. Next slide. So at this time, we have two recommendations. The first recommendation, both the subcommittee and staff recommend that the city uh, adopt option two, and staff also recommends that the council approve expanding the number of licenses. And this, because it can be done by resolution, if the council, if the full council votes on that, we could actually bring back a resolution with the second reading of this ordinance, and that could occur at the same time. Have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you for that presentation. Um, are there any council members who have questions of the staff this time? All right. Seeing none. I do have a question. Um, I, I sent an email earlier to um, our planning director, Lee Butler. I was wondering if um, you could speak to 
tax revenue that was generated uh, in 2019 and 2020 from cannabis. I'm not sure if you received that email. Yes, Lee, you want to address that? Yes, absolutely. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And we did get a response from um, the Finance Department. And um, it varies um, based on um, month, but um, based on the cannabis business tax that was actually generated, um, and, and the question from the mayor was uh, comparisons between uh, March, April, and May of um, 2019 versus 2020. Um, in March, um, 2020 was actually about um, $25,000 higher in terms of the cannabis tax that was generated in 2020 versus 2019. It flip-flopped in April where in April of 2019, it was about 16,000 and some change higher in 2019 than in 2020. So um, just to, uh, to let you know that that was uh, variable between those two months. And then the May figures are not yet available for 2020. So we don't have a comparison between those two yet. So April down last year. Uh, that's right. March was up 25,000, but April was down 16,000. Um, Vice Mayor Meyer. Sorry, I didn't raise my um, hand quick enough when you asked for questions. Um, I have a question about, um, I know that revenues are sort of one way we're measuring the community benefits. Um, but I, I'm just curious also, do we have any other ways to evaluate sort of the community benefits coming from um, from our this industry and our community? Um, since we have these factors, are those, are, are we using those factors to kind of look at that question? I don't know if this is for Lee, maybe. I'm just not quite sure how we're measuring that, or I don't know if the subcommittee um, members um, talk to discuss that at all sure well I think that's one of the reasons why um, we in the subcommittee landed on the revised factors um, it was um, it is one of the ways that we help to provide additional community benefits certainly we get revenue um, from the um, retail sales and there's a portion of that, as the council is aware, that goes towards um, child care, um, or excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. children's funds that are children's been, funds. Uh, mm -hmm. dedicated um, to those sources and um, identified on an annual basis by the council. But what we uh, what we concluded was essentially the improved factors allow for um, the integrity of the original competition to. Um, remain in place. Um, as Catherine was explaining, the um, uh, the original factors may have had uh, you know an equivalent set of businesses, except that um, one was 60% minority or women owned, and two others or three others were say you know 40, 45, and 50%. So if everything else was equal, we would have awarded it to the. Um, the business with the 60%. And if they then go and modify their ownership structure such that there is a uh, lower um, percentage of minority and women-owned businesses, if their original application came in in that fashion, they wouldn't have been awarded the license in the first place. So the updated factors do allow us to um, better reflect the values that the council originally specified and that we discussed as part of the um, subcommittee as um, still being important factors to support, um, you know, with a variety of things um, included there, um, uh, paying living wages, um, uh, women and minority-owned businesses, um, employee-owned businesses, and so forth. So those are, with, those are certainly community benefits that um, these businesses can bring as they meet those factors. And did the um, 
did the um, community, the cannabis um, industry folks who participated in the community or in the in the meetings, did they bring any other factors for consideration to for the subcommittee? And did you guys analyze those? Or I'm just curious more than anything else. I see Matt Thank popping on. I'll let him re respond to that. You're, You're on muted, mute, Matt. Thanks. Uh, we did we did bring them up at the meeting, but the majority of the discussion with the industry uh, revolved around the increase in licenses and the license My transfer team. piece. So it, it it was it was mentioned, but we didn't get any feedback at the time from the from the industry. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in response, Donna, to your, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, to your question, uh, um, the, we did not have industry input into the factors that we kind of final, when we were finalizing this process, but um, I have now heard uh, from the industry in response to what we have here. One additional factor, which um, I'll just mention, um, which I think makes sense, we can talk about it when we get to deliberations, um, related to having a relationship with, uh, uh, you know, transparent relationship with a financial institution. Uh, so we can talk about that later. But so that was the input that I have seen uh, related to the factors. Otherwise, I've heard, you know, no, I've not heard anything negative about the, the rest of them. Um, so I have a question related to the percentage ownership transfer to trigger a uh, new license or you know the the factors being reviewed um, the new factor kind of review process evaluation process and it made sense as we were talking about in the subcommittee to uh, you know try to address that issue that um, Lee Butler just mentioned about you know how, well how will we know if you know, close to a majority of, uh, you know, change, shifts that dynamic and, and then we don't have the, those factors kind of covered. And, but then I have also now, since then, have thought about and have heard from folks who are concerned about the, the need for uh, going through that process that's laid out in option two uh, for any transfer. For example, in the so I'm one. This is my question would be: How would that work? Like, for example, if um, you know uh, an employer wanted to have uh, an employee stock ownership program or some other kind of mechanism where uh, there are kind of small uh, shares of ownership that are either uh, given to or purchased by um, employees, for example. Like, how how would that? I mean, that seems like it would be a, a pretty um, onerous process both for the city and um, for the business any time a new person came into that structure that it would be considered a new uh, business. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I, I'd like to try to figure that out before we finalize this. Yes, we actually uh, discussed this and um, if their business structure was that they would have say 20% of shares that would be um, employee options, then that would just be considered that 20% would be just a chunk and people could come and go and it wouldn't make any difference. We wouldn't be looking at the individuals who were employees owning those certain percentages, but that would be part of their um, business structure that they brought to us with a, either their original license or with a license transfer at some point so that we, we would know that there was this 20% that was divided up amongst employees. If I could just, if I thank you, if I could just follow up really quickly, um, maybe that, maybe I didn't read this clearly, but that wasn't clear to me in option two that the 20% was still um, was was intact there. And I know we did have that discussion, um, but I, I guess maybe I need to, you know, I did read it, and I just wasn't entirely clear, no, so maybe. I missed something. 
Thanks. Yeah, no, there is no, there's nothing in the in the option that speaks to the 20 percent. But if the um, if the business came to us and they said, okay, we are going to have 20 percent or 15 or 15. Catherine, you still there? Catherine, I think you're muted. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Sorry. I think what Catherine was trying to say that if, um, if a business came to us and they told us they were 10% employee owned, 15, 50, whatever it may be, then that would be considered their, their business structure and that would be one owner per se. Um, so they would only have to come back to us if there was a change in that percentage of mm -hmm. employee ownership. Or public ownership, right. you know, it, it could be yeah. someone that is traded on, you know, a public, publicly traded company that is, you know, 60% publicly traded and, you know, 40%. If they establish up front that the 60% or 40% or 20%, whatever it is, um, is traded or sold to the employees, then um, that structure would be remaining intact. The ownership wouldn't be considered a change there. I just follow up. I think that that would then, I mean, because it doesn't seem clear in the way that the language is written, um, it would seem that that would be a better argument for option number one. Because I think what we were trying to prevent with the first option, which is why, I mean, we worked on the first option and then kind of last minute, you know, there were some issues that came up, which is why we moved to option number two. And while I'm, I totally agree with, you know, the the desire behind creating option number two around kind of having some checks and balances and being able to know who's buying into the business. Um, I'd also like to point out that we currently don't have any enforcement and follow-up. That's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we, my, and I guess this is a question, like how often have we been checking to ensure that the standards of these businesses got their license for are still met? We haven't been regularly checking. That's one of the benefits of the uh, improved um, factors. In fact, the ordinance before you requires that the um, annual, that on an annual basis, the companies provide an affidavit uh, specifying their compliance with the uh, factors that they identify um, as um, qualifying them for the license in the first place. So that is something that is a significant improvement in the ordinance that's before the council. Um, I'll just kind of finish the thought that I had before, but I, I do have some concern, some serious concern with um, the fact that there isn't any language in the option two around kind of, you know, that would really support employee-owned businesses. And whereas with option number one, there's a lot, flex, there's more flexibility in not having to come to the city to apply for a new license unless you exceed that 50% threshold. So I feel like that would actually allow businesses to create these employee-owned options below that 50% where if people are coming and going and they're selling um, different shares, that they could do that freely without having to go to the city every single time for a new license. In addition to that, in option number one, there's also a provision that says that if there's a change in ownership, that they will let the um, City know, and I think within that, if they're going to say, you know, there's been a change of ownership, or if we have a change of ownership form, we can have those different criteria to determine whether or not um, maybe the people who are buying in actually bring benefits to the city versus detract from those benefits. Because I think the assumption that we've been having, the assumption around the conversation is that um, for whatever reason we're going to lose benefit, but I think there's an opportunity where we can actually gain more. And if the city is informed of that and we're keeping track, I think that you know it could be um, you know, easier for the for easier on the city and on the industry for not having to constantly um, be doing paperwork to renew licenses and paying the fees associated with them. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Watson. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, colleagues and staff, for your work on this. I know it's been 
a long process. Um, I guess my my original my original hand raised is about the children's fund and the uh, community benefits. But as the conversation has taken a turn, I will just say one of the things that made me more comfortable with option two is that we're really on an ongoing basis vetting for uh, the fact the factors to be considered. And given that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, number eight of the factors in our agenda report shows that the majority of the business is employee owned, it seems to me that that would help meet that concern. Um, and then I think also further, based on the input that staff provided uh, our subcommittee in regards to the uh, concerns raised in option one, uh, option two felt like a better fit to really adhere to our community benefit. And I think that to me is what uh, stands out the most is how are we seeing community benefit from our policy as it relates to the cannabis policy. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would, uh, I guess, ask uh, is one, I just would say I support option, I, I'm supportive of option two as we, as we continue our del deliberations based on the input we received as a subcommittee. Um, and I know that Catherine mentioned in the presentation that there wasn't a consensus by the subcommittee on the um, increase of retail cannabis licenses. I think that, um, and, I, and I've mentioned this before, that we've had, we chose five sort of just randomly, arbitrarily, and that there is an opportunity for us to um, increase it so we don't have these artificial values in place. And I don't know if staff um, could potentially, if we were to move forward, come back with zoning regulations so that if we were to increase, it wouldn't be out of scale with Santa Cruz, and or, and or if they've already done that analysis. So it's certainly up to the discretion of the council to identify the um, number of um, additional retail licenses that the council sees fit. Um, you know, it was, I would say, uh, somewhat of an arbitrary uh, discussion, you know, at the original council. It was like, should it be seven? Should it be four? Should it be five? And they kind of just landed on the middle. But I think it wasn't arbitrary in that the council at the time was um, wanting to make sure that it was a relatively low number to um, ensure that if there were impacts from these, we didn't know what the impacts would be. And if there were going to be impacts, the council, I think rightfully, wanted to limit those impacts um, to a, a small number of establishments and not have those impacts widespread across the community. Since that time, we haven't experienced those impacts, and so it's, it's the council's discretion to say they could be increased by one or they could be increased by, you know, an unlimited number. Um, the council could also say, um, you know, look at um, different zoning allowances, um, whether that's um, uh, additional zoning districts where it's allowed or increased buffers so that there are fewer that are allowed. You know, it's, it's really up to the discretion of the council, and um, we are happy to do whatever analysis the council um, would like us to surrounding that, um, or if the council wants to keep the current, you know, buffers and allow, allowable zoning districts in place and just increase the number, that is something that's easy to do as well. So um, we're happy to talk through that with the council. That doesn't have to be tonight. If it is tonight, it would, or today, it would be helpful to get, uh, if that conversation happens today, it would be helpful to get some direction so that we um, have a, a more informed discussion when we come back to actually make some changes at a future meeting. And then I just had one, one last um, sort of point I wanted to raise that we did um, recognize the fact that we haven't necessarily engaged with um, compliance and enforcement and as a subcommittee wanted to move in the direction of making sure that we're really, um, you know, able, able to capture those that are illegally um, uh, distributing uh, cannabis in our community and, and, and that enforcement conversation was going to be forthcoming as a recommendation as well. Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I was not on the committee, so I do have a bunch of questions, um, maybe in reverse order. Uh, regarding the number, um, I am comfortable saying the existing number. It's true it's a pretty low number, but it's a, a high number per capita for Sanford. So um, I don't see an immediate need to increase that. Um, and then I just have some questions. So in no particular order, 
I can't think of any other industry that we condition to this degree. So this, I guess, is a question for Lee. Uh, and I think just because of the fact that it's a new industry, when we did this three years ago, <laughs> it was all new, <laughs> as you say, and a bit arbitrary. Um, the, I don't know, the closest thing I can think of is maybe liquor stores, but just um, all of the required, all the requirements um, are rather extraordinary compared to what, how we normally get permits. It's, um, it's usually just for a use, maybe just for Tony too. Um, it's for a particular use and if it's consistent with the district. We don't require who owns it and who, who lives locally and, you know, all those other things. So that's one question. Uh, just the um, intensity of conditioning. Um, I would like to know more about the process of transfer, uh, whether it's one or two, but um, what's the cost of a transfer, the timeline of a transfer, and what would be the reasons for denial of a transfer? Second question. Um, where are the community benefits described? Because number nine of the nine possible conditions to meet as other community benefits as described in detail and approved by the planning department. So that's the other question. And then in terms of annual compliance, it seems like a distinct question. Um, it could be a sink of one or two. It could be as simple as a self-assessment like we do for the rental inspection form. I continue to need this, I continue to need this, whatever. So, so these are just questions that occur to me. You're muted, uh, Lee. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks, I'll, I'll aim to tackle each of them. Uh, first off, the number of requirements, that's correct. Um, I, I am not aware, cer certainly we regulate things like um, uh, alcohol sales and so forth, but in terms of the number of requirements, this is um, substantially more limiting. And that is directly tied to the fact that we only allow a few of those businesses. And that was the intent of the council at the very beginning. It was. If we're only going to allow a few of these, then we should um, open. Then, then we should only have those business, businesses that are providing the highest amount of community benefits as uh, those um, uh, businesses that get to operate. Um, if I, I would say, if the um, the uh, the process was opened up and there were no limits on licenses, those factors could still be in place. And then I think um, there's a, a very valid question about, you know, um, we are more heavily regulating this industry and should we be, you know, there's still the point of those being great factors and maybe we would want to do that. You know, from a policy perspective, that still brings in a lot of really good uh, benefits like living wage, for example and um, uh, other benefits that are specified as part of the factors. So there's no reason why it couldn't be, but I think the, the genesis of that was the fact that there are a very limited number of these and we should only be providing them to those that are providing the biggest, the most community benefits. Um, which, you know, again, is why I think uh, the, the updated factors are important if there's no competition in trading off the, um, uh, the licenses to new ownership, then those new factors, the application of those new factors is that much more important. Um, second, you also asked about the cost of the transfer. Um, we did have an indication in the report that we could um, come back to council with a reduced fee for a license transfer if that's the council's desire. We had, uh, I can tell you what the, the fee was for the original uh, competition. And that was around um, $1,500 or $1,600 ballpark for that. Um, may have been a little bit less, uh, 12 or in the range of 12 to $1,600 is my recollection from uh, December of uh, 2017 when we did that. And um, certainly without the competition, 
you know, we may spend a little bit less time on that, and we can, if, if the council um, does go with this option, we can return and um, establish a new fee for just the license transfer. Um, you asked about um, the timeline for that. That could be done relatively quickly once we get the documentation that's required uh, to, to make that, to make those determinations. We would be coming up with a list of um, required documents that could establish the um, consistency with each of the factors so that it's easy, so that the application form says, here's what you can provide to show how you're meeting X, Y, and Z. And once those documents are provided, it should be a pretty quick and easy review. Um, and then the reasons for denial. Reasons for denial um, could be a number of things. One, if they're not meeting the required number of factors, or two, if they don't meet a uh, background, uh, if they don't pass the, um, the background check. Um, any other reasons for denial that you can think of, Matt or Catherine? No, I'm seeing a shaking head from oh. Matt. No, okay. So I think that that would be uh, it. Sorry, Catherine, did you? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble unmuting. Uh, we do have in the ordinance that if you have been um, convicted of fraud or a number of other similar type crimes that you um, are not eligible. Thank you for reminding me of that one. Yeah, there is a, um, a provision about unfair business practices and it goes into certain types. So um, that may not be caught by a, background, a police uh, background check uh, or may be caught as part of a police background check. Um, and then um, your next question was, where are the community benefits described? Oh, the, uh, so there isn't an actual uh, description of that num of factor number nine, um, which was additional benefits. Um, you know, it could be a wide variety of things. Um, we didn't want to, um, to say it has to be these, but you know, one that just pops to mind, as you were um, mentioning, what could those be? Um, that could be something like, um, Every month, we give our employees eight hours of paid time to volunteer with a uh, organization, a, a nonprofit organization of their choice. Something like that would certainly be a community benefit that we could say, hey, that's great. That's going to do something great for this community. And um, so we didn't want to say um, it, it has to be these, but if someone comes with something that is um, going to help out the community at large, then we would take that into consideration. Um, and then your final comment was um, compliance and self-inspection, um, similar to what we do with the, um, the rental inspection service. And yes, that is um, something that we built in to the, uh, the ordinance, the draft ordinance under um, 6.91.090. Um, subsection four, we require that all cannabis uh, retail businesses provide an annual affidavit confirming the business is meeting each of those requirements. So um, yes, um, we, we want to make sure that that is continually um, on their minds and that they are affirming that they um, are still adhering to those criteria, those factors. Those are all the questions from Councilmember Matthews. I'll move on to Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Golder. I have a question, and then Councilmember Watkins and Councilmember Byers. So we'll start with Councilmember Brown. Uh, thank you. So um, I another question that I have, and I'm pretty sure I think I know the answer. I'm just trying to figure this kind of zero versus fifty plus percent plus one. Uh, percent kind of difference and, and how we sort through that. Um, what So remind me, the state trigger for uh, the, re the requirement for a new license, it, what is, is that 20 percent? What's the? It's 20 percent. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Councilmember Golder. I 
Um, I have a question regarding the, this, this just kind of came up in this conversation, but regarding the background check, because I know in California, you know, there's been the ban the box um, for, you know, employment. And just knowing that historically, like, people of color have been targeted by police and incarcerated for selling cannabis. And some of those people may want to get in the industry now, but this would, by, you know, having a background check and somebody who is you know, disproportionately impacted by our criminal justice system, my, my sense is that that would prevent somebody like that from being able to be considered as an owner. Um, and so I'm just curious, and also I'm just curious about what the threshold is. So if someone had a DUI, would that disqualify them? Or, you know, if they had, um, if they got in a fight and got an assault and battery charge, would that disqualify them? So, like, what are kind of the levels? of disqualification as it relates to like background checks for ownership. And that might be a, a statewide, you know, policy, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, I'm sure there is a statewide policy, but in terms of the city, what we're looking for is either um, fraud type crimes or uh, violent crimes or not cannabis related crimes, but really hard drug crimes. And, you know, one, one charge 15 years ago is not going to disqualify you. So it, it's not a, a, you know, a hard and fast if you have ever been convicted, you're out. Um, we're looking at exactly what you were convicted for and whether it really has any relation to having a cannabis business. If, if we know that you have a history of cheating on your taxes and one of the things we get from cannabis businesses is tax revenue. We're not likely to want to give you a license. Um, but if you were convicted of smoking marijuana in your front yard 25 years ago, that would not have any impact at all. Yep. So it's I remember walking there. One of the things that maybe we I have sort of two questions, I think one of the things that when we created this policy, uh, we really did talk about wanting to move in the direction of not only trying to incentivize uh, more uh, diversity and ownership of the, those businesses, but also to work towards a, an equity type program. And I know that that's been sort of a conversation that hopefully is going to be uh, figured out a bit in terms of trying to um, reconcile those past uh, discrimination tactics that have left folks um, uh, at a disadvantage. Uh, so I do, I mean, at some point, I, I know that Kathryn had mentioned that she's looking at different examples around that. Um, but I did wanna uh, see, uh, Lee, if you could speak to the information that we received in terms of the cannabis purchase agreements um, that are uh, in place for two of our existing um, cannabis businesses and uh, kind of the, the challenges and nuances that arose as, as a result of that information. Sure, so that was a part of the discussion. Um, one of the um, cannabis businesses um, has an agreement to sell with a publicly traded company, and so that information is publicly available. And um, that uh, spurred some conversations with staff in the subcommittee about um, some of the, the factors that we had already been discussing things like locally owned businesses, women and minority owned businesses, um, and um, employee owned businesses. Um, and I think in some respects, it reaffirmed the, um, the values that, that we had expressed in, in wanting to um, aim to achieve those, but also recognizing that you know, we, um, we can't necessarily preclude um, you know, larger um, publicly traded or um, you know, multi-state uh, uh, organizations. There's another conversation with another retailer about a, a multi-state um, uh, organization that's looking to purchase them. And so just given that context, we, we talked about um, the importance of the factors in trying to keep those profits local um, and um, recycle back into our community and to support uh, small locally owned businesses. 
so that was that was part of the conversation that we had um, with staff and um, some of the conversation that we had with the subcommittee as well. I just have a, a follow-up question to that. So, um, I, so that I think that information really informed us moving in the direction of option two to really ensure that we can um, maintain those community benefits and values that we seek to uh, uphold. But then also the um, the amount that that agreement was for, which is I think uh, like two. Oh, two two hundred and twenty-five million, or something like that. Um, how 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 does that inform the artificial inflation value of having the five, uh, you know, licenses that are kind of coveted, in your opinion? Sure. So um, the the agreement was uh, two point two five million, something uh, going from memory in that range. Um, so it, the um, each business. Each business has a, a value. Um, businesses can be valued in different manner. Um, oftentimes, it is based on your annual uh, gross revenue, um, and there are different factors for um, uh, for different types of businesses. So, you know, a retail clothing store might have a different factor for um, their annual sales certain, uh, than a, uh, a liquor store, for example. And so, um, you know, there there could be some analysis related to that. I I don't know what the the factor is um, for a uh, a cannabis retailer, but I think the argument stands to reason that if there are only five licenses, that there is a a value um, to um, the license itself and not only to the business, um, because there is a limited number of them. Anytime there's a limited quantity of something, just the simple laws of uh, supply and demand come into play, and there's a value, and that value is increased if there's a demand and there's a, a limited supply. And then to your, your initial point in response to my earlier comments uh, about the sale, um, you're correct that that, um, that sale I think did influence where we landed in terms of the um, option two and looking at the um, the uh, new factors because those new factors have those things that um, really maintain the integrity of the original competition, like the 50% women are minority owned, 50 uh, or uh, majority of the business is. Um, owned by someone who's been a local resident for three years. Um, whereas um, on, if, if they were just meeting the original factors, those original factors, um, you know, you could arguably have a, a business that is 1% women and minority owned and you still meet that factor. You still meet that factor because the original factors don't have a threshold. They don't have a threshold because there was a competition and the competition allowed us to say, well, you're at 70% and you're only at 40%. And so we could, we could sort those out through that competition. But without a competition, it, well, it became um, apparent that it was more important to really include those thresholds at a level at which we feel it would have been likely competitive in the first place. Um, and so that's that's where we landed, where we did, and that the the conversations about the the potential sales certainly informed that. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up with my colleagues. I just wanted to point out that when I was I was just looking at, um, based on some comments that were made, looking between the two options, I just wanted to point out that the review factors between the two items, the, between the two options, are identical. Because the only real difference is. The, um, the percentage of transfer of ownership and when the city had, when they have to apply for a new license. So the main difference between these two is that with option one, um, the license can be sold or the, a person can buy into a business um, and it won't trigger a license transfer so long as it doesn't exceed 50%. And if they do have a change in ownership, they have to notify the city. And in option two, it's any change in ownership they have to apply for a new license. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that that's the main difference between these two items that are before us. 
Um, and so, so yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that. And then I know that, you know, we're trying to provide these, these um, you know, factors so that businesses don't just get their licenses and sell them. I feel like, though, it needs to be said, too, that um, I think what we really want is to ensure the community benefits um, and our preferences locally owned. But, I mean, there's a lot of companies in Santa Cruz that started here and have sold. So Looker sold to Google, and we didn't stop them from doing that. New Leaf sold to some other, um, you know, grocery store company. We didn't stop them from doing that. And I'm not, you know, encouraging the sale of our businesses to larger corporations at all whatsoever, but I, but I am want, wanting to bring up that this is the only industry that we're, like, highly regulating on how, um, the, you know, they can be bought or sold or expand. And that point to expanding, I think, is also worth um, consideration because uh, we do have that um, the business can't have interest in more than six other cannabis establishments. And one concern that was brought up by some members of the industry is that if our local business, if a local business does so well to where they're able to expand, um, we're kind of preventing them from doing that. So uh, I think today the main thing is really trying to get this moving because the industry has really been uh, needing to increase their capital and um, having ownership or uh, buy into the business is the only way they can do that at this time. But I think there's some other things we may want to consider moving forward as well. Are there any further questions or comments? Yeah, Lee, go ahead. Oh, Catherine has a question too. But Lee, go ahead. I would just say that um, you know, if businesses are expanding, you know, they they could actually expand, and um, it, that they're not prevented from doing so, but they might need to meet another one of those criteria. So um, they would have to then, you know, pay a higher living wage, for example. So so it could trigger them into um, additional. Um, community benefits. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, Councilmember Byers. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of my questions were, were taken care of. I, I think back to all of you who were there when this got passed. It must have been uh, an enormous long meeting because it's complicated, and I understand the committee did the yeoman person's work on it, but thank you. So this has been enlightening. From most, I really don't have a question. I just want to pass on though, because I noticed well, under the recommend or under the staff report direction on the number. I just will put out. I think Cynthia did too. That to me five is just the size of our town. And then what I looked at the number of hours they're open in this. I would call it a fairly mid-sized or small town. So I'm just comfortable with the five and, and not interested in expanding. Matthews. Yeah, um, so I was confused by your statement that the only, um, that the conditions apply to both options one and two, as I understood it, option two was the only one that required uh, a couple of absolute requirements and then six out of nine additional requirements that that would not be required by option one. Did I understand that incorrectly? Yeah, looking at section 6.91090, license requirement and review factors, um, those in option one, it's the following are required A and B and, and um, and it has the business must meet a minimum of six of the following factors. And then in the second one, yeah, it's the same. It's, it's the, the issue is that in option two, it looks like um, in the red line version B, the number two that would have also been in, um, in option one is actually in line with item B. And so somebody, they, they just didn't hit return. Um, but all the factors are identical where they have um, under number two of section 6.91.090, it goes through from A to I and then numbers three and four. So all those conditions are the same. So if I can correct you. Uh, 
You want to go ahead, Matt? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say the, these these new license requirements and factors are for a new license process. So the, the existing license holders can keep that license, but the, the only issue that we're questioning right now is, is what will trip a new license to be required, uh, and that's the percentage of ownership that we're discussing. Uh, so in so option one, in percentage of ownership. yeah, so in option one, they could essentially have a 50% um, change in ownership without triggering a new license, without a review of the new factors. Whereas in option two, any change in ownership, aside from the thing that we talked about earlier with, you know, an ownership structure of like stock sales, um, that any change in ownership would trigger uh, a review for consistency with the new factors. So that's really the differential here is, you know, do you want to have um, that, those new factors applied um, in all instances or nearly all instances, you know, aside from the, the stocks uh, changing hands, or um, would you like to have a business be able to um, uh, exchange some portion? You know, in the ordinance it's listed as 50%, but it doesn't have to be 50%. The council could say 20%, um, and anytime it's over 20%, um, then a new license is triggered. So it isn't, it isn't, uh, it has to be one or the other. There could be uh, a uh, middle ground should the council choose to. So if I could just continue. So option one, as currently proposed, is any license transfer over 50% kicks into these. Option two is any transfer kicks into these. That's correct. And that's in uh, 6.9, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and you're saying it could be some other percentage could be option three. Yes, that's the council's discretion. And then um, as I'm understanding the discussion, um, the requirements for a new license would include paying living, living wage, allowing unionization. Also, as proposed, I think it's going to come from Sandy, transparent relationship with a financial institution or something along that line and also going through a background check. Those would be automatically required. And then there are additional requirements, um, four of which have to do with ownership and the others of which have to do with um, community benefit and so forth. It seems like to me an extraordinary amount of requirement uniquely on this business. So I'll just wait for the rest of the discussion. <laughs> any further comments at this time? Seeing none, we'll open it up to the public. So if there's any member of the public who would like to dis to comment on um, item number 19 on our agenda, amendments to chapter 6.91, cannabis retail licenses, license transfers, now is the time to call in. Uh, so you should see some numbers on your screen. When you have gotten into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given uh, two minutes to speak. I had uh, Khalil from Kind Peoples reach out for extra time. And so we'll start with Khalil and he'll have up to four minutes. All right, Khalil, you're on the line. Hello there. Thank you, Council. I appreciate everything that you are putting into this today. My name is Khalil Mutawakil. I'm the co-CEO and founder of Kind People's Dispensary, and I want to deliver a message today from my heart about being a cannabis business owner. I've lived in Santa Cruz my entire life. All of our current retail licensees are good local people with families, and we consider ourselves to be significant partners with the city, but yet we don't receive the same treatment as other businesses. Kind People pays hundreds of thousands a year in taxes to the city's general fund. We create living wage jobs with 401k and health insurance plans. We have training programs. We do get back to our community. We brought back to life a dilapidated corner on Ocean Street. We are green business certified. And all the while, we are reducing consumption and dependence of alcohol, opioids, and pharmaceutical drugs in this beautiful place that we all love to call home. 
and yet still the city does little to support our fledgling local industry. Just as we jump through hoop after hoop to be compliant operators, I too believe that the city has an obligation to enforce the code, go after the illegal operators, and allow for an even playing field. At a recent subcommittee meeting, the county's cannabis licensing official, Sam Laforte, stated that he knew of at least six illegal operators currently in the city of Santa Cruz, more than the number of legal ones, significantly decreasing the tax base. The city needs an enforcement protocol similar to the county's, where they turn bad actors over to the tax administrator, they subpoena tax documents, calculate back taxes owed, and place liens on businesses that don't pay through the Secretary of State. So before we consider more legal operators, please take care of the illegal ones. I am at a loss now that after seven years of being in business, on the coattails of a global pandemic, the staff's recommendation is to add more retailers when our community already has the highest per capita density of dispensaries anywhere in the state. And what is the basis for this? And may we please have the chance to stabilize first. The staff utilizes the, the analogy that cannabis businesses are artificially inflated like New York taxi cab medallions. We needn't look far to the county to understand this couldn't be further from the truth. Allowed to modify their ownership structures up to 100% since their inception, not a single one of the 20 county licenses have transferred since 2016. The truth is that cannabis businesses are valued just like any other on their fundamentals. And unfortunately, over taxation and regulation have made their value far less than their non-cannabis counterparts all factors being equal. We cannot raise capital from banks. Many of us have taken second mortgages and have risked it all. We are simply asking to align with the state and have the same ownership rules as the dispensaries in the city of Capitola and the county of Santa Cruz. Please do not force us to compete at a disadvantage. We were in survival made before the COVID crisis plummeted our revenues and increased our costs for PPE, cleaning supplies, and labor. Our small town is saturated with cannabis retailers. We do not have an access issue for consumers and adding more dispensaries will not bring in more tax revenue. It will only hurt the local operators who for years have paved the way to legalization. We are simply entrepreneurs attempting to survive first and grow second. Please allow us the opportunity to do both. So in addition to what I have sent you all via email, my recommendations are to maintain the current cap on number of retailers, approve staff option number one, Add one review factor for a bona fide transparent banking relationship and remove the requirement for an annual affidavit. We cannot forever expect a business to comply with new review factors that are not evergreen in nature. Please take a stand today. This issue has stretched on for years without resolution. And thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Next speaker, you are on the line. Uh, yes. Hey, that Khalid talking some stuff. So he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Anyway, this is Garrett. I, I want to um, I want to make a comment again. I made before the last time this came up regarding the so-called competitive process of assigning new licenses based on other factors, some of which are being minority and women owned. Of course, this is the opposite of fairly competitive. Has the potential as being a de facto racial and gender quota, and then is uh, therefore discriminatory either as racist or sexist, and is then pretty much straight up defective leftist, leftist ideology. A history of discrimination in cannabis license issuance would have to exist to justify such denying other perhaps more qualified people a license solely based on such factors. This is not reality and hey, the only normal thought of racial or gender discrimination possible is solely in your hands and doesn't need to be prevented exactly through a reverse discrimination, does it? One supposes then you don't trust yourselves. I recall my astonishment the last time when Councilmember Watkins justified this idea with the statement it would, quote, right past wrongs, unquote, but didn't really say what those were or why perhaps someone applying for a new license was guilty of a wrong, eliminating them by not being a minority or a woman. Seems to me, with all normal business qualifications met, candidates could be in a fair lottery if necessary instead of affirmative action if otherwise all considerations were equal. Uh, racial and gender quotas make mediocrity possible, even likely, since merit is not a factor in those. There's no time to discuss the other factors, but many of those are also leftist dogma, irrelevant government overreach of private enterprise. That's it. Bye. Thank you. Hi, 
this is uh, Pat Malo. I grew up in Santa Cruz, and I've been working on these cannabis issues at the county and the city for the last five to seven years. So I'm really appreciative for all of you to, for hanging in there with us. Um, unfortunately, I think that this issue, there was what I took as clear council direction to just iron out the unintended consequences of this ownership stuff. Um, I think we've conflated it into a lot of the question of how do we attract the right type of businesses here and make sure that we have the community needs met, which I'm all for. I think that we've just been going about it in kind of the opposite direction that we should be. We should be looking at how do we attract the right kind of businesses, get the right kind of businesses here in our community instead of trying to stop the wrong kind often after the fact. So I think that um, it's, <clears throat> it's proper to iron out these ownership issues today. Um, I think it's also proper to look at the right way to go about expanding new licenses. Um, I think we need to do that in conjunction when we look at the other issues, public consumption or on-site consumption and events. Um, I think we should do that from an equity lens um, and really figure out how to take down barriers of entry for historically disadvantaged communities. Um, I might add that uh, no one needs to explain right now, especially during these current events, um, the history of you know, racism involved with the drug law wars and drug laws. Um, I think that we are in some ways ahead in Santa Cruz on those issues, particularly involving cannabis, but like everywhere, we've got a long way to go. So I appreciate everybody's time on this. Um, let's get this done so that we can get on to uh, some of the bigger issues. And, you know, in this day and age of budget cuts and empty businesses, we need to look at every possibility. So thank you, and I'm um, looking forward to continuing work with you all. Bye. Hi there. Um, I, I, I've lived in this town for 37 years. Uh, I use cannabis and I'm in favor of it, but I am not in favor of having the town overrun with dispensaries. I think that is ludicrous and I am shocked that the council is even considering it. I, you know, we, we apparently already have more dispensaries per capita than anywhere in the world. And I can't believe that anyone on the council would be advocating for more. And, and I, I just have to ask one question to the council members, and that's why. Why would you want more dispensaries when we already have so many? There is not an access problem. So it makes absolutely no sense to add more. I don't know a single person that thinks we don't have enough dispensaries, nor do I know of a single person that wants another one in this town. If the council votes to add more dispensaries, those council members will fear the over ass of citizens of Santa Cruz come the next election, mark my words. And on another note, you know, I own a small business. I know how hard it is to survive as a small business. I can't imagine having to deal with all the additional taxes you're placing on these retailers and you expect them to survive. And then you want to prevent them from being able to sell their businesses. I, I think the council should keep its nose out of business and let these companies try to survive because it's not easy. And I, I, I use cannabis and I want to make sure that I have access to cannabis in the future. And if you open the floodgates here, that is not only going to ruin this town, but it's going to ruin this industry. I would urge the council to reject this ludicrous proposal. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, my name is Bryce Berry. I said I was an applicant for a retail license in the city of Santa Cruz, and um, we were unsuccessful and are not a retailer. I do own another retail establishment in the county. I just wanted to echo a couple of the thoughts of the previous speakers and that Santa Cruz County has more dispensaries per capita than anywhere in California, um, anywhere really in the world. There's not a problem for access. Um, in the industry calls that happened between city staff and, and the industry, not a single person on that call outside of staff advocated for opening up more dispensaries in the city. Um, 
There's not been a public outcry. There's not members of the public that are asking for this. There's currently not an issue. Um, the timing is incredibly interesting. Uh, given the current economic status, um, as you are all aware, we don't have access to capital. We didn't get any federal funding relief as cannabis businesses. We don't have the ability to get loans. We're very much on our own. So uh, adding any more uh, inconsistency and instability to an already very uh, tricky and very vulnerable industry right now locally is just a bad idea. Um, I, I think that I fully support uh, the motion before you in regards to ownership changes. Uh, we should be treated like other businesses um, and provided the ability and the flexibility to raise capital and to continue to grow our businesses in the ways that we are, which are very limited. Um, however, adding more dispensaries in the county and in the city does not have a benefit to anyone except for maybe those applicants that want to come in and apply. Uh, most likely ones that are well capitalized uh, from the public markets and aren't local that don't really have a lot of the local incentives or the local interest in the community that uh, staff and some of the council members mentioned was so important. You have a bunch of great local players now. Uh, we have a stable industry. Uh, let's keep it that way. Thank you for your time. Yep. Hi there, uh, my name is Robert Singleton and I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. Um, I'd like to speak on this item mainly echoing a lot of the, the comments that have been shared by prior speakers from the public. Um, you know, when we first started this, this journey of regulating cannabis in Santa Cruz, I was one of the initial planning commissioners who helped vote on the first ordinance, um, then seeing it go through multiple iterations. Um, Really what we've tried to do is strike a balance between creating uh, a competitive marketplace that would be favorable towards local businesses and obviously get some community benefits out of that while uh, making sure that we were bringing a new industry um, you know, up, up to speed kind of out of nowhere. Um, and I think we've done that for the most part, but there are a couple things that are, are really challenging. Um, the ownership transfer piece is something that industry leaders locally have been trying to get for for years now. Um, it's really hard for them to be able to raise capital. They don't have access to normal financial institutions, and their product is already one of the most taxed products um, that we have in the entire state. I mean, it's, it's taxed in every phase of development from seed to sale. And so it creates a really difficult environment for a smaller company, a smaller company with little to no access to capital to be able to exist in a really tight market window. And so I think we want to pay deference to our local businesses who have been great actors thus far um, by making sure that they have a level playing field. And one of the ways you can do that is by making sure that they have a reasonable way to transfer ownership of their businesses in chunks. So I think in that light, uh, option one is a significantly better option as laid before you today. On the other front, uh, on the idea of opening up more, more uh, retail licenses, we already have a tremendous saturation in, in Santa Cruz. Um, we don't have an access problem, and the only people who would really benefit by coming in, by having more licenses, are probably those heavily, heavily capitalized, publicly traded actors who are going to be coming in and competing with the local businesses. So I would urge you to keep the number of uh, establishments up there right now, but also allow for ownership change. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, my name is Carolyn Bartkowski. I'm the Director of Finance and Administration at Kind Peoples. I've been employed here a little over three years. I previously worked in finance in Silicon Valley, and I'm a resident of unincorporated Santa Cruz County. I've been here for 17 years. Kind Peoples offers benefits and programs to our employees, including subsidized medical insurance, dental, vision, pet insurance. We offer paid time off to all employees who meet a 10-year threshold. We have a matching 401k program for all employees. Our training programs emphasize internal promotion, mentorship, succession planning, and coaching. We are able to create opportunities at the middle management level. Almost all of our middle level managers are internally promoted. Having this visible pathway is an attractive recruiting and retention tool for our employees who are looking for a career, not just a temporary job. We've created a group of over a dozen exempt employees who receive salary, enhanced benefits, and holiday pay. We are fortunate to have a bank in our community that allows us a legal and transparent method of banking. We are able to pay our employees, 
vendors, federal, state, local taxes via bank transfers or checks so no one is exposed to unnecessary risk. In turn, our bank intensely audits our sales and payments and provides a further degree of oversight to all our already heavily regulated industry. All of these benefits, programs, and controls come at a cost. 2020 has also brought us new challenges, such as COVID, and we are continuing to work through them in the spirit of employees and community. As the head of HR, I'm looking forward to continued opportunities to grow and reinvest in our people. I support option one to keep the city dispensaries in line with our other local jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, I think you should be unmuted. Hey, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to get out there louder. Um, good afternoon. This is James Julian Whitman. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I hope that we spend uh, as much time as some other subjects. You know, I'm reminded of uh, the great ideas that uh, people who use cannabis stop. Please stop. Pardon me. Um, just, just hold on. So, so you know, I'm just kind of reminded of all the great ideas that stoners have. It's just usually they're too stoned to do anything about it. I don't know if it's if that's from Soil and Green, 1984, Animal Farm, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or American Bee. So I'm looking forward to speaking later. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, caller, you're on the line. Hi, uh, this is Jacob Lagner. I'm the uh, owner, operator of um, Reefside Dispensary on Ocean Street. And, uh, you know, at this point, I think that council has heard uh, quite a bit, and I'm here to echo um, what Khalil so elegantly uh, put together in a statement. Um, we are local operators. Um, we're just asking to be treated um, <clears throat> to be treated fairly um, we've poured our sweat money heart and soul into this business into this community um, and it, we have very little access to capital it's extremely difficult um, you know I've heard planning say they want profits uh, remaining in the in the city limits um, so far you know it's also been losses remaining in the city limits, and we do need your help. Um, this has been an issue that has been discussed for uh, two and a half years plus, um, and, you know, echoing the last caller, he has a good point. Uh, we have been discussing this issue over and over, and instead of resolving something that could be very simple for council to vote on, we have made it far more complex by discussing um, adding new licenses, and um, new uh, new points for uh, new licenses to to meet. Um, I absolutely support option one in this case, uh, but council should really ask themselves what they're looking for from from us as business operators. And I think that um, putting an emphasis on on community support uh, is exactly the right direction and uh, that any other future license holder should be doing the same. Um, at the same time, I also want to, you know, remind council that we have had uh, ownership transfers um, in other industries, uh, jump bike, uh, new lease recently to a large conglomerate in Korea. Um, you know, we're, we have restrictions on us that are, that are quite onerous. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. I believe uh, that's me. Uh, this is Valerie Corral. And I wanted to, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to meet prior to this meeting and also to listen to the woes of the this new industry, the cannabis uh, industry, the, the high taxation that we're met with and the really profoundly um, rigorous uh, 
regulations for compliance are uh, in themselves, set, they in themselves set us apart as a business. No other business is really taxed in our community in the same manner as we are. And on the heels of COVID-19, I think we can all look at and observe in all of the businesses as I drive around town and see many shuttered doors that this could very well be the fate of cannabis businesses in our community. Much of the uh, of our sales have, are down, um, and WAM is really and continues to be a a community service organization. It's actually where we thrive. But that does not mean that we thrive within the context of great revenue. And I believe that our comrades in this movement of, of entrepreneurship within the cannabis structure are experiencing the same thing. So to put a cap is sensible. Do we do it with other businesses? No, not necessarily, but we also don't tax them to death or tax them out of business. The constraints that have been applied have been applied from the sensibility, and to abandon that presently seems um, seems arbitrary. I just want to make an appeal to try to hold some of what Santa, what Santa Cruz was. Nothing stays static. Santa Cruz won't remain the same, but hopefully we can contribute by supporting small businesses. Thank you so much. Option one, much compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, this is Scott Graham. Um, I just wanted to say that I think what we need to go towards is something along the lines of what's going on in Amsterdam and has been going on there for decades now where the model is that most of the dispensaries are actually cafes where people are allowed to smoke it on the premises. And we could do something here along that same lines, but make it so that it's not a business where you would go and buy you know, your weekly stash. You would only just buy enough for that day or whatever, and you could sit there and smoke it with your friends because uh, marijuana is something that is very sociable kind of thing, just like people that drink alcohol tend to want to be with other people that drink alcohol. It's the same thing with people that smoke marijuana, want to be around other people smoking marijuana and, and enjoy the camaraderie of that kind of experience. So um, it wouldn't necessarily be expanding the general licenses, but it would be a new kind of license where it would be an on-premise um, consumption type license much like a bar where you're not selling somebody a six pack at a bar you're selling them one drink at a time and it'd be the same kind of thing that I'm talking about here would be a, this new kind of uh, thing for Santa Cruz it's not new for someplace like Amsterdam um, as far as uh, you know the complaints that the um, People that already have licenses have about being overly taxed, overly regulated. I tend to agree with them that um, you're trying to milk this cow for every last drop of revenue possible, and you want all these different things to happen that doesn't happen to other businesses. So uh, I think a, a whole new rethinking of this has to happen. Thank you. Again, if you haven't uh, had an opportunity to speak and you'd like to speak on the cannabis item, please press star nine on your phone. I think it might have accidentally lowered someone's hand, but um, I think we'll just keep going. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Colin Disharoon. I'm the CEO of Santa Cruz Naturals, which is a cannabis dispensary in South County. Um, I've been operating Santa Cruz Naturals uh, since 2011. Um, and as we've heard before, Santa Cruz has one of the highest densities of cannabis businesses in the nation. Um, from my experience, it's incredibly difficult for any business to operate in Santa Cruz 
nonetheless a cannabis business who's regulated almost like uranium is regulated. Um, and it's taxed on every level by almost every agency that we're involved with. And we can't even take ordinary business deductions like any other business could under IRS Code 280E. To allow other dispensaries to come into Santa Cruz area before uh, there's a change in federal regulation at this point, it not only deflates the business's capacity and value, but it significantly damages that existing business's potential to mitigate unresolved tax issues that stem from 280E. Most of the dispensaries, Santa Cruz County, and I would, I would guess Santa Cruz City have been audited by the IRS and have significant 280E liabilities. Um, and I also wanna say that um, allowing new dispensaries to enter the market right now only serves to oversaturate an already saturated market and it dilutes the existing uh, investments that are made by local and long-term operators. And they would only serve to siphon off their revenue for no apparent reason other than to bring in what I would assume is a negligible amount of revenue that would come in the form of fees and development permits. So I would really recommend that you, that the city of Santa Cruz pump the brakes on this, take your time and evaluate this further. But right now I would advocate for allowing new dispensaries to come into the area. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Jim Coffus. I'm calling from Ben Loman. And um, I'm a 73-year-old, long-time cannabis consumer. I, I am, uh, I have no interest in any cannabis business, uh, but I have uh, associations with a lot of cannabis businesses, uh, from retailers to uh, producers. I've spent the last uh, four, five years uh, immersed in uh, policy, both at the uh, federal, state, and local level. And uh, if my frustration is coming through, it is because I feel like I should apologize every time I talk to policymakers that we're wasting your time on something, uh, once again, on something that uh, we shouldn't be. More than two years ago, we uh, spoke to the uh, council and staff about making a fix to the uh, current ordinance regarding the ability of uh, the retailers to change their ownership structure. It was, uh, you know, it was the only jurisdiction in the state that had kind of had that in their ordinance. It wasn't, uh, you know, it was, as council member Matthew said, this has all been new. And so uh, we expected this certain mistakes would be made, and that was one. And everyone agreed and, and said, well, let's fix it. Now here we are uh, talking about uh, wholesale changes to the, to the ordinance, while still on the agenda are things like uh, on-site consumption, special events, taxation. Uh, those items we thought were going to be addressed over time by the council, and now uh, here we are. I'm very disappointed. Okay. If anyone else would like to speak to us on this item, um, now is the time to call in. This is an item related to cannabis and business license transfers. And if you're on the line and you would like, like to speak on this item and you have not already, uh, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and we will acknowledge you for two minutes. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Am I on? Yep. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I, um, I go back to 1992 in the Santa Cruz uh, pot scene. Um, I helped collect signatures for the original uh, Measure A. Santa Cruz was the second city in the country to uh, have medical marijuana become a reality. Uh, I had a, a, a pot club card, the, uh, the original pot club on Cedar and, uh, and uh, Mabel, um, and I kept it until uh, it became obvious that you needed medical uh, approval to uh, buy pot, and I surrendered my card. 
Uh, I never thought I would live to see pot legal, by the way. I bought pot before Santa Cruz became legal in Oregon and then Colorado, and you could do it with a credit card. Uh, pot costs at least 50% more than you could get um, off the street, okay? Uh, I have found, uh, for me, Santa Cruz to be a very pleasant buying experience. But I want to say that these people are under great pressure to uh, uh, unfold uh, a brand new uh, enterprise uh, that we ought to be very proud of. And the fact that Santa Cruz has become a hot spot to buy pot. You know, one of the signs there used to be uh, when you come over the hill from uh, um, San Jose, from Silicon Valley, was about one of the pot clubs here in Santa Cruz. So I think you're 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 going to tread some very difficult water, but try to realize, I think, a couple of things I would throw out there, and forgive me, the local pot entrepreneurs, but, you know, is it right to stop 7-Eleven from moving in? And these are, of course, going to be the vast multinationals and publicly traded companies with all kinds of uh, uh, price uh, loss leaders. Okay, very difficult thing to, to, uh, to uh, I'll consider, and I wish you the best on it. Um, I think we ought to be proud that Santa Cruz is a leader um, in an industry that should have been established 80 years ago. And I think we all know that. Thank you very much and all the best. Yeah. Okay, again, if you'd like to speak to the council on the item before us related to cannabis license transfers, now is the time to call in, and once you've entered the meeting, please press star nine on your phone, and you'll be able to speak for two minutes. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, I'm uh, both a business owner and resident of the city of Santa Cruz, and um, I was disturbed by uh, a couple of things that I heard in the earlier comments and discussion amongst the council members and staff. Um, the assumption that a limit on the number of licenses uh, by the law of supply and demand uh, makes it more valuable is just on its face not true, unfortunately. The fact of the matter is that if there's not enough revenue to have a profitable business based on the various expenses associated with that business, as well as the zoning rules associated with where the business is located, it does not matter if it's got a viable license legally if no one's going to come. Right, so there is uh, that assumption is is kind of uh, it's not a good reason to say let's remove the cap on the number of licenses. Uh, the community benefit and the quality of life in Santa Cruz and the quality of life that we offer to the tourist industry, which is what drives a significant portion of our local employment and the local ability to uh, stay alive is something for you guys to consider uh, as you're thinking about this. And uh, clearly, if we have the highest number of dispensaries per capita, uh, and those dispensaries themselves are saying that they're struggling, then the economics are out of whack to remove the license. It just doesn't, the license cap, it just doesn't make sense. Um, the, over the long term, Council and staff should consider the zoning rules and the specifics around the locations because that's really where the advantage comes from. Uh, if they're looking for examples as to where they can understand geographic restrictions and how they affect values, you can look to the check cashing industry as one example, and you can also look to the casino industry. Um, I would say uh, ownership changes really should be allowed, particularly in a uh, industry that has so many challenges around raising and managing capital under the current federal rules. Uh, so those are uh, really my perspective, and uh, I uh, hope that the uh, council can uh, go with option one uh, and be careful about trying to impose too many direct and prescribed rules. Uh, you get what you measure in this life. Um, you know, you, you guys can follow your nose and know what's a good license to give or not, but if you try and lay it all out in law, you might run into trouble. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, which is Canvas Business License Transfers? If so, please press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes to speak. All right, 
hearing none, um, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. And before we have our discussion, I just want to um, speak to a lot of what was just mentioned by the public and kind of what uh, I've been hearing from the industry, and I think many of us have been hearing from the industry, which is that a lot of the local businesses in our community, some of which have been around since um, medicinal cannabis became legal, legal in California, are really struggling under the new state laws uh, making cannabis legal recreationally. And I think it's important that, you know, these businesses have all, you know, jumped through all the hoops that we put in front of them. They've all met the requirements that we've laid out before them, and many of them are complaining that they're struggling to actually survive in our community. And so if some of these historic businesses are una unable to make it, um, what we're going to be seeing is these larger corporations coming in. And so I think it's really imperative and um, important that we are trying to do everything that we can to support the local businesses who have met the criteria that we put out before them and that we make sure that they're stable before we um, start allowing for other businesses to enter the community. And um, as many of the people said, uh, I think that we are saturated right now with the number of dispensaries we have in our community. And as someone who supports cannabis, I personally don't um, want to see more businesses open up until the current ones are able to stabilize. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Council for Action and Deliberation, and I see Councilmember Watkins has her hand raised. So I guess I, I have a few comments and that I think, I, I mean, I'm happy to, to put a motion on the floor to move the conversation. Um, one, I just, uh, in terms of, and, and in light of everything that's going on right now, I just want to kind of, uh, for the comment that was raised by a, a community member, that, you know, the war on drugs did have residual effects, and I think we have to acknowledge that in terms of the disproportionate um, impact it's had on minority populations. So I just I want to state that. Um, the other thing that I uh, also want to share is that, you know, I appreciate hearing from the industry. I know majority of our speakers were from the industry, and I know that they've been struggling with us and struggling with everything that's been confusing, and it's all been sort of this iterative process. So I appreciate their patience as well. I just um, personally go back to community benefit, and I know it was brought up that, yes, certain businesses often sometimes do sell out to larger um larger businesses, but, you know, that hasn't been the value of Santa Cruz, as, as I re recollect, and um, I know folks who don't actually patron those businesses anymore because of that. So I think that, again, just sort of going back to our values and community benefit, that's sort of been how the conversation has gone. Um, you know, I understand the concern around the increase. I guess where I struggle is the fact that we just sort of came up with the five, and now it's just been sort of stopped at five without really doing um, any further analysis around oversaturation. I've, I've heard that, but I don't know for sure, um, as well as the potential un, unintended consequences associated with just having this uh, coveted five and potentially monopoly on that on the industry. Um, most businesses actually don't have that privilege, right? There is market competition. They don't have just sort of this coveted uh, one of five licenses. Um, so I guess coupled with all of that, I feel like we can move forward in a way to um, to modify our ordinance as uh, our subcommittee originally designed with those values in place and with the community benefit leading our discussion. Um, but so the motion I would propose was to is to move forward with option two, but to um, maybe uh, also include what I think Lee brought up as option three, which is essentially allowing that 20 percent. Um, that, that uh, the 20% the, the business ownership transfer as opposed to um, having ever, to, to start that triggering process. Uh, so that would be my motion, but I would also like to further direct staff to um, help us understand more about uh, what is, how the market could be informed by uh, saturation, not saturation, or other options in terms of how we could use or look at our licensing in terms of uh, expanding businesses and or land use as a way to kind of make sure that we're not, you know, inundating our communities and neighborhoods. So that would be my motion. I'm wondering if uh, maybe you might want to state that. Bonnie, were you able to capture that motion? Um, I was able to capture it, but not in the language of a motion. 
Okay, so I move to introduce your publication and ordinance revising chapter 6.91 the cannabis retailer licenses of the city of Santa Cruz municipal code to allow for the transfer of a cannabis retailer license as identified in option two. And um, I would like to also provide connection to staff to return with uh, more information for the council to better understand how, if or how we might increase licenses based on um, compatibility with the community. As well as as well as as our subcommittee discussed in terms of the um, enforcement uh, potential for making sure that we're not having illegal uh, businesses operating. So var variation from the staff recommendation would be to have the 20% trigger for uh, the new license transfer. I'm saying that right, Lee. Okay. We have a motion made by Councilmember Watkins. I see Councilmember Brown's hand and Vice Mayor Myers. So, Councilmember Brown, are you, is your hand up for a question, comment, or a second? Uh, I, no, I was not going to second this. I just had some comments. I'll wait. Thank okay. you. Yes, somebody else. Myers. Yes, Mayor Myers. Yes, Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Myers. For the sake of um, for the sake of further conversation, because. Uh, I, I'm going to second the motion because um, I, I'm just a little bit, I'm, um, yeah, the subcommittee, I, I believe my read of the staff report has changed its recommendation. So I, I'm just trying to track with this. Um, it, it, the staff report really expressed a fairly strong um, opinion or recommendation that the, um, it says the sub on page, I can't remember what page it's on, but it says very clearly subcommittee and staff recommend license transfer process option two. Um, so I'm just, I'm gonna second the motion and just so we can continue the conversation. Um, thank you. Uh, so we have a motion made by council member Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. And I think if I can summarize it, the conditions of the motion are to accept option number two, with a modification for the um, new license transfer process to kick in at 20%, but there's, yeah, to kick in at 20%, um, to conduct an analysis to determine whether there should be an increase in the number of uh, licenses in the community, um, have the subcommittee consider law enforcement as it relates to the industry and I think that's it. Am I correct? Okay. And then that was seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, Councilmember Brown. I thank you. Um, so I want to, well, actually, before I make my comments, I see that Catherine has had her hand up off and down, Catherine Donovan, and I just, you know, I'd like for her to be able to speak, but I don't want to lose my place in the stack, but it seems like she has had something to say for a while. Okay. So. Catherine, if you want to make your comment. Actually, I have not been raising my hand. The computer has been raising it for me, and I don't have anything to say right now. Okay. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot there. I just saw it a bunch of times, okay. I get it. Um, so um, yeah, I just wanna make a couple of comments uh, before we um, finish our deliberations. So first of all, I wanna thank staff. Uh, you have spent a lot of time on this and it is complicated. I know there's a lot of frustration about the time it's taken and the level of complexity. Um, but I, you know, I do just want to acknowledge that you've been involved in this in a way that has really tried to um, address the concerns that um, we've heard about and that, you know, kind of within the context of, you know, protection of particular industries and markets um, that, you know, the challenges that we could have down the road. So I just, I really do appreciate uh, all the work you've put in. I also want to thank the industry uh, folks who have been uh, consistently showing up and weighing in, um, but also mo more so because, um, you know, I think it's a real testament to um, the, the folks who have 
uh, step forward and um, are you know engaged in this uh, in the retail side of the business in Santa Cruz have not um, you know have not said anything about this high, these high bar standards that we are setting uh, in terms of living wage jobs you know uh, union neutrality and other uh, you know other factors so I think that's a real testament I mean those are the kinds of things that many many businesses would not be willing to support. And so I just want to put that out there. Um, I, as a, a researcher of agricultural supply chains uh, and uh, m markets and policy, I am, have been fascinated by the whole process. I've learned so much about how um, you know, all the, the industry operates and how the supply chains work. And having learned all of this, I, I really am convinced now that um, it is not in the community's interest to uh, increase the number of licenses at this time. Um, I, I do believe that given the kind of saturation that has been expressed and all of the other factors um, that, that make it more difficult to run these businesses, the high taxation rate and other, other restrictions that um, the state has and then that we're placing, I don't think that um, the uh, kind of theoretical concern uh, about the kind of heightened value, you know, the, the inflated value of the licenses is going to play out in reality here. And, you know, if that happens, we can change our rules, you know, but, but I'm pretty convinced that right now that's not gonna, that's not the problem. So I just wanted to say all of that. Um, my, my preference would be that we um, kind of stick with the, the cap uh, the current cap, and um, with respect to the question of 20 percent uh, versus, uh, you know, 50 percent plus one, uh, which I think is the the change that I'm hearing from Councilmember Watkins. Um, you know, I, my preference would be that you know we go back to the 50 percent plus one, um, but I definitely uh, can't support uh, zero percent. It's it really made sense in the subcommittee as we were talking about it because of some of the challenges, but I think in retrospect, um, you know, some kind of, I mean, at least what the state is, um, the state requirement is, is a reasonable thing. So I'll leave it there for now and um, see where we go. Thank you. Council member Matthews, because I think that the hands were earlier from when the motion was made in the second by Vice Mayor Myers. So, I'll turn over to Council Member Matthews. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where you, we go with this. I've sent a couple of you just a summary of the issues as I understand them. Uh, regarding the motion that's on the floor, I see three components. One is to allow for transfers as spelled out in option D, but the threshold changing 20% instead of 50%. Is that correct? Yes. The second item is directing staff to conduct analysis on issues related to additional licenses. I'll just say, personally, I don't support that at all. <laughs> I don't see the need for additional licenses right now. And look what we've got our staff working on so many hours a day on COVID recovery and housing and homelessness. So, you know, I would just as soon not have that part of the motion. And uh, looking into uh, enforcement issues to pick up what I perceive to be illegal operators. Is that what I'm talking about? I'd, I'd like more explanation of that. So those are some questions. Um, and then the other thing, I'm just trying to get clear on what we require under this new, if, let's just say we went with option two. New, new ownership change at 20% as proposed would require a new license in a non-competitive process. And it would there have, therefore have to meet a certain number of a certain other number of new requirements for new licenses. And it's not clear to me as, as the discussion's gone on what those are. And also, as I see in the text, the quality of the business would be a, an additional factor. And the new requirements for new licenses based on the threshold of ownership change there would be some mandatory requirements, living wage, allow unionization, transparent relationship with a financial institution, and thorough background check. And 
I guess another question is an annual audit. Does that apply only to the new ones or to all? And then there'd have to be some, uh, a certain number, a selection of other conditions, which would be some are related to the percentage of ownership and some are related to non-ownership issues like providing med medical cannabis, green business certification, and uh, providing other community benefits to be determined. That's how I understood all of this. I was not on the committee. <laughs> it's really confusing to me. So I would just like to know, in the motion, have I understood it and how many of those things are required of all licensed cannabis licensees? How many of these requirements would be for new licenses that are applied for because of change of ownership? And how many are um, a selection of the above? Do you want to address those questions? And Mayor, if I may, in terms of the motion, and then yes, please, Lee, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'm happy, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, advocate that we over uh, overload our staff to, um, to do more work, but I will say that I don't feel like I've ever had the right information to understand, you know, one, just sort of the, having the background of the process to get to five, which was like maybe three, maybe seven, okay, let's do five. Um, absent more information, I, I've never felt mo very comfortable with just leaving it at five. So at some point, I'd like more information to better understand what that could look like. And or maybe it is the right number, but I just don't have the data to really back that up at this point. So I just don't feel super comfortable with that. Um, in terms of the criteria, it's, it's not a requirement, it's the criteria of factors that are weighed essentially. So um, I think we can really speak to that. But uh, I'm happy to modify the motion to have it that at some point we have more information for staff to come back to us with uh, more information about uh, the, light, the number of licenses that are appropriate for our city. That doesn't have to be in the immediate by next meeting though, given everything that's going on. And if, if I could continue, Lee, I sent you that thing too. Uh, can you just make sense of it to me? What's required for all licensees? What's required of uh, new licenses required because they're hitting some threshold? Of those things that are required, which are mandatory and which are optional? Lee, you're muted. Sorry, um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna um, share my screen here and let me make sure I've got the right one open here. Okay, um, I'll share my screen and I think that'll be the easiest way to walk through that with you. Um, this, okay, um, so 6.91.090, um, calls out the new review factors, and it may be easier to actually do the, the clean version, but I'll, uh, I think we can work with this. Um, so under number one, these items would actually be required. So they would have to pay living wage um, as specified by the council, and then they cannot prohibit uh, or discourage unionization or related collective bargaining. Under number two, they would have to. Lee, Go ahead, I just have a question to you. So, would those requirements apply to all license holders, even those that currently have licenses and are not coming in for anything new, or would this only apply to new new ones? This would only apply to new ones. So this, this is for obtaining a cannabis retailer license. So if you passed over a threshold that said you need to, uh, yeah, so now what, like the motion at hand is if you change ownership of more than 20% of your business, which that's, that's what's allowed to change your hands right now, incidentally, under our current ordinance. Um, so for a new ordinance, for, sorry, for a new license, they would have to meet these two um, and then they would have to meet six of the following nine factors. So we've got 
a majority of local resident, a majority of the business is owned by local resident. Um, the business is not, uh, the individuals do not own more than six other um, uh, cannabis establishments. A majority is minority or woman owned. Um, they provide employee benefits. This is above and beyond um, what the, the standard base living wage is. So if they wanted to pay the full living wage, not discounted for benefits, that would be another factor. Providing medical cannabis, the green business certification, um, a um, minimum of 15% total shelf space um, of products produced or grown within Santa Cruz County is another factor. A majority of the business being employee owned. And then the other community benefits that we discussed earlier. And then the one thing I wanted to point out, uh, Councilmember Matthews, I, I think you had a good grasp of most of the things. The one thing um, that's different with this, um, the quality of the operations plan, this would only happen through a competitive process. So we're just setting this up for the future so that if additional licenses came forward um, or if one of the licenses that is currently out there was, um, you know, say they, they went out of business and didn't sell and a license becomes available, we would have a competitive process. And then we would have, we would consider all these factors and yet we would take into consideration, for example, if one of the uh, businesses has a 60% employee ownership and another one has a 90% employee ownership, then that would be better meeting this factor. Um, and then all cannabis retail businesses would need to provide an annual affidavit that they meet the requirements included in their initial license. So that is the existing businesses that are out there. They need to just give us a letter once a year, which isn't a big requirement, once a year, hey, we're still thinking about the living wage that um, we said we were going to provide when we uh, submitted our application. And so we do not currently have a, uh, an audit process. And what we're asking for is self-certification here for the existing businesses and for new ones. So that um, would be, that's the whole set of requirements there. Does that help? You yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. Okay. I just lowered somebody saying I'm not sure who that was. Is that Councilmember Golder? Yeah. Go ahead. I I have a couple questions. The first one I was just wondering, what is I mean, you care about the heavily taxation. What is the tax rate um, for these businesses in the county versus the city? Catherine, you want to chime in for that? I believe at this time it's the same. You know, they, the we originally what? set it the same, and then the county changed theirs, and then we changed ours, and it was going to go up annually. But I don't remember exactly when the county's is going up as opposed to when ours is going up. I think we're either the same or we are 1% lower. And what is the percent? Uh, I think it's now 5%, but it may have gone up to 6 or it may be going up to 6 And are they subject to sales tax in addition to that? They're subject to sales tax, and there's also um, some pretty high state taxes. Okay. Well, I mean, like the TOT tax is 11 and we were thinking about raising it to, what, 13 so it's not like exorbitant amount of taxes, I would say. But I think that the question I have is, like, is the – Council's motivation here to protect like the local businesses, these people who were kind of industry leaders in getting um, these businesses going and really collaborating with the city and and, and starting out uh, this industry when we didn't really know how it was going to be, or is it to protect the community from being like overrun with, you know, multiple different um, um, out of the area, big pot business. Sorry, I don't really know how to talk about it. I'm not a stoner. Um, but I just would think like it would be in the city's best interest to increase the tax 
space by adding more of these businesses. But on the other hand, we already have so many, so I don't know if we need them. But that being said, one of the callers brought something up that I thought I, and I hadn't ever considered uh, was that in the changing industry, is there any consideration of the new business being like the on-site consumption places, like similar to a bar or a tasting room or something like that? And so in that aspect, you'd be adding licenses, thus uh, increasing the tax base or, you know, source, but not driving the local proprietors out of business when they've just gotten started in the three So I... I don't know, this will be the same kind of licenses, I guess is my kind of... Um, it, it's not an identical license, and we had actually um, gone to the council last September with a number of different items to get direction on them, and one of them was this on-site consumption that has only recently been allowed by the state. Um, and there are a lot of... The state regulations are pretty intense, and it would not be anything like what is in Amsterdam. Um, and we were actually going to be coming back to uh, discuss it further with the council, but um, with the restrictions of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, it didn't seem like a timely thing to bring up. Um, sure. and, and the subcommittee agreed. So it is in our back pocket and we are intending to come forward with it at some time. But right now, it's it's not. Um, we don't feel it's urgent. So to that end, I would say, like for Martine's motion with one of the three components, um, I think it's something that the city could start to explore. I think like we've always kind of been a leader in this industry, and I think I, I also would like to see the enforcement of um, the illegal cultivators and distributors because I think driving things underground just creates like a, you know obviously a black market economy and problems potential problems so um, if you were going to explore um, additional licenses I think it would be interesting to see how they could be changed into like a bar type place I guess uh, just for the sake of um, kind of Bring, bring, Renee bringing you up to speed. That's one of the things we're discussing in the uh, Canvas subcommittee. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna, we're going to be working on that and Thank you. reaching out to the community. Uh, Councilmember Brown, or uh, actually, I saw that um, Martin Bernal had his hand up and wanted to give him an opportunity to comment. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify the the tax rate. So our tax rate is the retail tax rate, as I assume what you were asking about. Ours is seven percent. The county has a rate that graduates, uh, and I think right now it's at uh, six percent through the end of uh, through December of uh, 2021, and then it'll go to seven uh, percent in January of 2022. So they eventually will get to the same rate. Thank you. Welcome, uh, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Watkins. So thank you. I um, I just wanted to put back into the mix uh, um, as we kind of move forward on finalizing what this motion is that we'll be voting on. Um, although again, my preference is really for the the 50% threshold. Um, the additional factor. I don't know. Can we get agreement that um, putting including that additional factor about having a relationship with. Uh, transparent uh, relationship with a uh, financial institution be a factor as well. Um, I feel like that's that seems like a kind of a no-brainer, and I hadn't thought of it um, until it was raised to me. But it, I don't know how people. I'd like to hear how people feel about that. And then with respect to the change to majority owner, um, you know, we discussed that, and that totally made sense. Um, and you know, I really want to appreciate staff for that. Um, uh, but there was, uh, you know, we I, we got uh, some information about uh, from the industry about having uh, including language that it's operator or manager, um, you know, for the the businesses. And so I'd also like to just put that out there for discussion, see where people how people feel. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thanks. 
Okay. Council Member Watkins. Um, in terms of the first request for the additional factor, and, and I'm happy to accept that as if, if presented as a friendly amendment. I don't know if that's the intention of Councilman Brown. Okay, and I don't know if Vice Mayor Myers is willing as the seconder to do that at this point. Okay. Um, in regards to the uh, other bits, I just I think you know, I guess I'll just say a couple things that um, one I think. This has definitely just been an evolving discussion and topic, and I think it will only continue to be that. And as we continue as um, a council and a community and hear input from industry and interested uh, community members, that we'll keep kind of nuancing it to fit our, our community's values. I guess um, I, I am a, just a little bit you know, confused because as a subcommittee, we landed on one thing and then now uh, it's a whole different thing. And I feel the 20% now at this point, given that switch is a, co a good compromise to keep us moving. Um, and also just sort of recognizing where we are in terms of time. I don't know, Mayor, I know we have two more additional items and then an evening item that starts at 630. Um, I guess my preference would be just to move forward with the motion as amended to accommodate uh, Councilmember Brown's suggestion and additional criteria at this time, and then um, just recognizing that this is going to be an ongoing conversation moving forward. I have one question, well, I guess two kind of requests. Um, thank you for those comments. The one additional, well, one, I was wondering if we might be able to, given the amount of work that we've done, settle on possibly 30%. So if a third of the business switches, then that would kick in the um, license transfer process. So that was one you know, question for consideration or, or friendly amendment. Um, the other one was in letter G that was on the, in our red line version, it was pointed out that there's a lot of restriction at the county level around growers and there really isn't. Um, there aren't a lot of locally grown products in the county. And so I was wondering if we could increase that to, to say that uh, carries a minimum of 15% in total shelf space at any given time products produced or grown within 100 miles of Santa Cruz County, given that there's a lot of growers down in Monterey County that would fall under that, and so it's kind of as local as it can be, but it wouldn't um, really restrict us to Santa Cruz County since that industry doesn't currently exist. And then the other request was just on number four, that it's providing an annual affidavit. Um, kind of given that we've heard through the conversation that we're not really enforcing at the moment, I'm just wondering if we can switch that to be um, that all the retail businesses will be subject to random audits. That way, and I think a random audit will really be able to capture, you know, at a point in time to, to see, you know, how businesses are doing. It doesn't put all this work on the staff or on the businesses. And, um, and I think that with, you know, the transparent banking and having random audits, that it might actually help us to uh, kind of check in on, a, on you know, and, and sure, and, it, and I think it also will encourage businesses to continue to um, abide by those good practices since they don't know when the city is going to actually come in and check in on them. So, yeah, friendly amendments with, you know, 30% um, products grown or produced within 100 miles of Santa Cruz and then random audits. Um, number four. Uh, I just have a quick question, Lee. In regards to the 20%, was that from the state? Was that the state percentage? That's sort of where you threw out the 20% and sort of that was consistent. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. I, I mentioned that because that's what our current uh, ordinance allows. That's also consistent with what the state allows, um, you know, the state requires a new license. That's what I was hearing from Catherine earlier, is that uh, the 20% threshold is um, the state's trigger for a new license. Um, and our currently, you know, we originally had 10% of the license could be, or the ownership could change. We upped that to 20% um, last year at, at one point. And then um, that's what's currently in place now. Um, and, and Mayor, while I've got the floor, if I could uh, have a question regarding the motion, a uh, clarification. When, we're, uh, when the proposal was to add the factor regarding a transparent relationship with the final financial institution, I wanted to confirm um, 
two things. One, if um, that would go into the uh, mandatory section or the, uh, the list of uh, factors, so under 1, 6.91.0901, or under uh, 2. And if it goes under 2, it says the uh, demonstrate the business owner meets a minimum of six of the nine factors. Is the council desirous of making that seven of the ten factors? So I just wanted clarification on those two things. One, I think it could still stay at six, and we can increase it to ten. Um, so six of the ten, still. So it could, uh, and I'll let other council members actually the ones who make the recommendation weigh in. But, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's open for discussion. That would be a mandatory factor, or if that would be a uh, factor for consideration. So I'll maybe uh, ask Council Member Brown to weigh in on that since she made the recommendation. Well, I don't have a strong opinion about that, but I do think um, that pro for now, including it as one, a factor seems like a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so, but I don't have a strong opinion about that either way. I'd like to hear from others, but it seems like that makes the most sense right now. With the maker of the motion and second of the motion, want to kind of weigh in on their thoughts that this was uh, accepted. Um, the one thing I guess I would just say is that I feel like as a subcommittee, we went through all the different factors, and that was sort of the whole uh, beauty of having that space to be able to do that. So, I mean, I, I, and, I, and just having those discussions about why those factors fit there, I don't know if we want to do that now. Um, I, I but. I guess I'd like a little bit more clarity. I'm trying to pull out the right, the right. Um, I'd like more clarity on the the amendments that you're proposing at this time. Um, so if, if it could go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, so I guess I'm just thinking about the um, kind of the consequences of uh, you know not considering that as part of uh, our you know a, as a factor that we would consider to make a, a business more kind of socially responsible in our community so you know uh, I think that the businesses that we have in the mix right now do that and I, I would just hate to see us not capture that in the future if, if we are going to have future, but if we do decide to increase the cap or other businesses come in in whatever fashion, it just seems like it should be, uh, you know, considered. I, I don't know. I, it, I mean, that's, that's my thinking. It just, you know, people are doing it. It, it that costs money. There, you know, there is a cost to that. There's a benefit to the community and to the business in doing that. So, you know, for security reasons, for, you know, all kinds of reasons to not um, be preferring uh, operators who are, you know, operating in a cash economy without, you know, uh, real accountability. Will you, will you restate the factors so I'm just really clear about what you're proposing? Yeah, I am um, the exact language. I think I need to take a look real quick. Um, I, I just put move, change my screen. So it was just um, the, you know, that it's 6.91.090 um, that the license requirements and review factors um, would, in addition, would be uh, maintains active and transparent an active and transparent banking relationship with a financial institution. Oh yeah, sorry, I thought I already accepted that one. I thought so too. Sorry, I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. question. Yes. I, sorry. <laughs> The question I have when you say it's 6.91.090, um, there are there are multiple subheadings. Some are requirements and some are factors. And so, you know, I just want to make sure: are you are, are you saying that's a requirement? Or are you saying that's one of the factor? The six of nine factors, or now would it be six of ten factors or seven of ten factors? Well, I don't have a strong opinion about that either. I think I heard Mayor Cummings say it could be six of 10. That's fine with me. Um, or we could add it and say seven of 10. Either way. So if anybody else has a strong opinion, then please weigh in. I would just say six of 10. I mean, we were, are putting a lot of requirements on these businesses already. I mean, given the conversation we've had, 
we could even reduce the requirements, but I think that since we've kind of fell on six as a number, we can add that additional requirement, uh, or sorry, factor for consideration um, into the mix. So, um, and then I guess it would be good to get a response on the three friendly amendments that I offered up as well. Um, if you all, if the maker of the motion, the second of the motion could weigh in on those. Uh, I'm comfortable with the six of 10 factor for accepting that um, friendly amendment. Um, for the 30%, I don't, I, I mean, if they, I guess I had a question to follow up with Lee on this. If, if we, if they are required to do a new license application at 20% with the state, um, would, would the 20% just be consistent or, I mean, how, how does that, how do they inter, interplay, I guess, or are they completely separate? They are separate. Um, they would they would have to do both if they you know if they changed over 21 percent, they would need a new state license and then they would need a transfer license through the city as well. If they were at 19 percent, then they wouldn't need either. And what about if they were at 30? Well, uh, if they were at 30 under under the uh, proposed regulations, if you changed it, if you said all right, let's up that from 20 percent to 30 locally and they came in at 25%, they wouldn't be required to get a new license transfer with the city, but they would still be required to get one through the state, a new license through the state. Okay. Um, I, I guess, I'm, I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I'm more comfortable with 20 since they have to get one over with the state anyways, but um, if the majority of the council wants to move in the direction of 30, I, I, I'm fine with that at this point. Um, and, and then I don't, Recall the other two additional. Uh, yeah, the other one was G, which is um, where the products are produced. And I stated that since Santa Cruz County really has a lot of restrictions on growing, um, to change that to um, to products produced or grown within 100 miles of Santa Cruz County. So that would um, expand it to to allow for products to be grown in Monterey, which there is a, a decent amount of grows down there, um, but would, and would still kind of be within the spirit of that, um, keeping those products produced locally. Because if we're gonna have it as a, as a uh, factor for consideration, but then the industry doesn't exist, then it doesn't make sense to have it as a factor for consideration. So to make it actually relevant, I was putting in that 100 miles of Santa Cruz County. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on what what ordinance I'm looking at, which is G being a minimum of 15% of total shelf space at any given time produced or grown within Santa Cruz County? Yeah, that, products, yeah products produced or grown within Santa Cruz County. I, I don't feel comfortable making that change without more information. I've not, I, This is the first I've heard that's an issue personally. So I'd like to learn more because 15% seems pretty low anyway. So I I'd I like think, more at this point before I accept that. So not, not at this time. I think what I'm, I'm just going to put it out there though, that for consideration, 15% of the shelf space of a store is a fairly decent amount of products that they have to, to have in their store. And there's no, there are no producers currently, or there are very few actual growers within the county. So if we're having a factor for consideration that 15% of their store space at any given time uh, has to be products grown within in Santa Cruz County and we don't have um, any kind of like producer, then it doesn't make sense to have as a factor for consideration. So that's why I was just saying, you know, there are more producers in Monterey County, for example, so that would make, have this requirement make sense. But if, if we, you know, are having it as a factor of consideration and that industry doesn't exist, then it really doesn't make sense. It's kind of like have, how we remove organic cannabis when there's not really any kind of organic standard for cannabis. So I'll just put that out there. I, again, I don't feel like I've heard that as an issue. I just don't know enough information about that to make that change. The first. I don't necessarily feel comfortable given that. Okay. Then the other one was the um, audits, but it looks like uh, Lee Butler had his hand raised. I was just gonna say, if it pleases the council, I can, I've got a map up here from Google Earth that shows um, the distances, you know, I can show you what 100 miles is from Santa Cruz County, if it pleases the council. Sure. I'm happy to do that. 
I, I guess I'll just defer to, to you, Mayor, if you want how long you want this to go or if you want that to be revisited at a future time given sort of where we are in timing of, of today's meeting. Yeah. So this, this is just, so Fresno is uh, here. Let me show you this. That's 99 miles. So Fresno is 100 miles from Santa Cruz County. Um, if you zoom in here, this would be Paso Robles is 100 miles. On the other end, um, you know, if you're going 50 miles from the north end, you are up near San Rafael. If you're going 100 miles, you're up past Santa Rosa and even into Sacramento. So just, just for context, I don't yeah. want to belabor the point. Yeah. Well, um, I think at this point, the uh, I'll just state, you know, uh, I think that the audits would be better. Uh, I think that, you know, given that Santa Cruz County doesn't have producers, that it would make more sense either to remove that or to extend the distance so that we're actually, so it's actually relevant. And um, my preference would be 30%, but if we're gonna go in the direction 20. So I'm just gonna state my kind of feelings for the record. And if, you know, it's not gonna be considered, then we can just continue moving on. Because we have a couple other items, uh, we have oral communications, and it looks like there's further comments. So I'll rest my case at this time, so to speak, and I'll just um, see if Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this really is sausage. I'm, I'm really not satisfied with this at all. Um, and, um, you know, I could go to 30%. The thing, you know, 20% may be the state uh, threshold for a new license. But at 20% of the state level, you don't have to satisfy a whole new package of requirements. So they're not apples and apples. Uh, I, you know, I would frankly be happy with number one. If it's going to be number two, take it up to 30. Um, um, I heard from people in the industry that there is not adequate product coming out of San Francisco County to fill that 15%. Maybe not anybody heard that. It's not true, really, who knows? Um, but I could see some leniency there. Um, the uh, audit, uh, I think, Mayor, you were suggesting random audit. That's work. <laughs> in our finance department, we do those random audits. We've done those in the past, the COT and so forth. So, um, and it seems to me that. Um, uh, a more simple affidavit. These are the requirements. I meet them. If there's a, if there's demonstration of a pro of problem, then we can do an audit. But I think um, given expectations on everybody's part, I think I think that the uh, proposal an annual affidavit, just a simple statement, the requirements I meet them would, would satisfy me. Um, oh gosh, I think that's. Those are the main things, you know. I, I think it's really uh, excessive amount of detailed ex uh, expectations. Um, so I'd like to raise the threshold a little bit. Um, go for the simple audit or the simple affidavit, and and more lenient um, source. Uh, I see that Bonnie Bush and Catherine Donovan both have their hands up, so I just kind of want to acknowledge them. So, Bonnie, did you have your hand up? I did, but just so you know that um, a reread of the motion is needed. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we weren't able to tell what were friendly amendments and what were opinions, so. Okay. Uh, Catherine, I think that might be your computer, or is your hand actually raised? No, it's actually up this time. I I had a question about the um, the audit and whether that was a financial audit or an audit of their um, keeping up with their factors. It was an audit of the factors. It wasn't a financial audit. It was just to see if they were still meeting the requirements that they um, that were considered for their license. So. Okay, maybe we should make sure that's specified in the 
in the motion? I don't think that that was, uh, yeah, it wasn't accepted, so. Okay. Um, Council Member Brown. Okay, so uh, for the, I'm gonna try to be quick. Um, so I, um, I really agree with Council Member Matthews about the, um, certainly about, and with uh, Mayor Cummings about the, the distance. I mean, I, I just think given the limitations for kind of production and manufacturing processing in Santa, within the county, um, kind of because of our, you know, land uses and our small size of the county and our land values, um, it seems to me that um, if it's going to ever be used, that 100 miles makes more sense. Um, that is a pretty common standard in by local kind of certifications uh, for agriculture in general for produce. Um, but if the, you know, if there's not, you know, to not belabor this, I guess I would say, um, we can just leave it and nobody will use it. And so, you know, they won't ever, that won't be a factor, I think, if it's not possible, as, as Mayor Cummings said. Um, with respect to the audit question, um, I, I would be supportive of going that route, but I do think since there's, there's a broader set of issues around enforcement that we are gonna, you know, wanna maybe take up, that we could consider it at that time. So an affidavit is, you know, for now, fine with me. And I also just want to weigh in and say it. Look, it seems to me, based on what I've been hearing, but I'd like to I'd like to know um, that there may be a majority of council members who were uh, would prefer the 50 percent plus one. So I'm just trying to, before we give that up. I mean, I know I've said it. I've heard a few other people, a couple of other people say it. Um, can we clarify that before the vote? I'm wondering too, maybe because I would just like to say that I'm actually more in favor with the option number one, fifty percent. And I know initially within the um, the um, subcommittee that that's what we landed on, and all the people from the industry have said that they were that's their preference as well. And I know that having worked on the revenue subcommittee, we really try to work with um, the business community to try to meet their needs. And also meet our community's needs. And so, if the you know cannabis industry, which has been saying over and over how much they're struggling, and we have this process that's pretty um, labor-intensive in terms of meeting certain requirements, they've all met the requirements. So I think that you know if we, I'd be comfortable too with the 50%. I'm not opposed to that at all. So to Councilmember Brown's point, I mean it's not a non-starter for me as well. I think I'd be comfortable moving in that direction too. So out of respect to the industry and, you know, um, the process that we've put before them. Mayor, uh, if yeah. I may, for clarity, I know Vice Mayor Myers has got her hand up and has had it up, but my, um, you know, I, although I said, you know, I was comfortable with keeping it at the 20, I was okay with moving it to the 30, and I think Vice Mayor Myers was also okay with that. I don't know if we actually took that um, as a friendly amendment, I thought that was accepted, but maybe I'm just confused after all the different bits that have been coming in. But I'm, I'm okay with the 30 at this point. I'm not comfortable with the 50 given the um, input that we received from staff as we had our process. Um, and I just, I frankly just, I, I realized that this has been like sausage making and it was not that, was not the intention, that was the intention of the subcommittee. So I'm just a little thrown off in terms of some of the other specifics without more information. So for me, it's just not at this time um, in the interest of trying to get a more informed process moving forward. So that's sort of where I landed on the, on the various bits. Um, but if there's interest in changing some of this stuff at this point in time, we can vote on the motion and revisit. I just also see as we're talking that 106 attendees are in our uh, participant thing. So I just, I don't really know how much we want to get into this at this moment personally, but that's your call, Mayor. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. I would, sim uh, I would support the 30%, um, and at this point, um, I'm not clear exactly how the audit, what the audit would be, so I think I would support just sticking with the affidavit, affidavit process that's currently in the, ordin in the, um, in the ordinance, um, and I am um, in support of it this time to, uh, you know, not, not to cap what we have right now to five, 
Um, I think the industry will be, um, we know this is something that we're all learning how to do together. Um, so I, I, I'm supportive of the 30% and at this point I think sticking with the affidavit process and having the subcommittee maybe come back with an audit proposal that's a little more, I'm just not clear exactly what that means. I thought it was a financial audit as well, which seemed, which seemed extreme. So um, those are my thoughts for now. Okay, Let's see if I can bring us together here. So, the current motion on the floor, which was made by Council Member Watkins and seconded by Vice Mayor Myers, is to adopt option number two um, with, a, with a change to 20% and then a friendly amendment to increase that to 30%. Uh, ownership is when a license transfer would kick in. Uh, there was also a friendly amendment to add an addition to um, add an additional factor, so that would increase the factors from, for consideration from nine to ten. With the new factor being maintains active and transparent banking relationship with the financial institution. Um, so those are the two friendly amendments that were made. The second part of the motion was to conduct a study to consider, or conduct a, a study to assess um, whether we should increase the number of licenses in the city of Santa Cruz. And the third part of the motion was to, um, to conduct a study or direct staff to better understand um, how many illegal operations are currently operating in the city of Santa Cruz. Does that capture? The one clarification I would have is that it's not necessarily to conduct a study, you know, but at, if we're gonna consider increasing licenses at some point, we wanna have more information in regards to what makes sense per capita and that fits for our community. So I don't, I don't want it to sound over kind of cumbersome, but we want an informed process. So I don't know if that requires a study, but just so really so is that is that more along the lines of directing staff to provide council members with information on? I, I'm just I need, I'm trying to get straight. So, for example, we hear like there's an oversaturation, but I've never seen any data to substantiate that claim. But so I, I just want more information before we consider whether or not it's appropriate to increase licenses. Okay. So. So when, the count, when, the, when staff comes back with any kind of recommendation in regards to increasing licenses, that they provide data as to whether it fits with our neighborhoods and our community, and if, it, if there is an oversaturation of existing, um, and or if there's an oversaturation of existing licenses or retail businesses. Um, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, again, let's talk about the language. Conduct the study. Sounds like to your direction of staff. I want you to come back with a study about increasing the number of licenses. And I just really am concerned with what's on our plate in the, let's say this year. <laughs> and uh, that to me, given all the discussion we've had now, doesn't seem like a burning issue. I think it's fair to say at some point in the future, we open <laughs> there you go. consideration of increase of licenses. With data, data. That's right. That there is you. really general. Um, then I would also like to just comment on condition G, which is the product zone in Santa Cruz County. We have heard that there's very little product. And to me, a, a condition that's not reachable is bogus. So uh, I would like to see some change. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and, why don't we go ahead and accept that then at this time? Okay, so the friendly amendment with item G is that uh, carries a minimum of 15% in total shelf space at any given time, products produced or grown in 100 miles of Santa Cruz. Okay, yeah. Well, I think it was just. Yeah, I made the friendly amendment earlier. Yeah. I accept it if I for my as well. Yeah, but accepted by. Vice Mayor Myers and Councilmember Watkins. So I think that's 
the motion before us. Um, Council Member Brown, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I mostly was, I was gonna say what Council Member Matthews said, um, and so thank you for that. I would just remind us that the county, and we heard this before, and I think it's why we originally talked about the 50%, you know, the county doesn't require a license transfer until you get to 100% transfer of ownership. So, you know, this is a pretty stringent standard that we're adopting here, and um, again, I've heard three people say 50% would plus one would work. And so I, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to see if others want to weigh in on that before we take the vote. And if not, then we'll just go ahead. I think if we, if, if my preference would be we could take the vote and if the, if the vote, if the motion goes down, then we could have a new motion at this point, personally. But if, if we want to spend more time discussing that too, the, the discretion of the mayor. Matthews. I'm just going to say this is the first reading, and I think even with some of these conditions, we're going to have a second reading. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we are ready to take a vote now um, because we still have another item for communications. There's been a request to return to the closed session on the item, and we have our evening item. So, with that, I will turn it over to the clerk to take the vote. Councilmember Byers is gone, I believe. Uh, Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, why don't we with take Councilmember Byers um, absent with Council? Uh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. With Councilmember Byers absent. Oh, sorry. That passed unanimously with Councilmember Byers absent. Yeah. Let's take about a five-minute break. Let's then go into oral communications, and then we can um, return to items numbers 20, and then our evening item. So this is our five-minute dinner break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, let's see if okay. So it looks like um, we're back and ready to go. I was just informed during our break that item number 20 um, is a very brief presentation. And so we're going to hear this item and then we'll go into oral communications. And given that uh, we anticipated oral communications to start at 6 and our meeting's going a little late. I'll uh, provide some additional time for oral communications, which is normally a half hour, but we'll extend it uh, for some additional time. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Claire Galgley, uh, Transportation Planner, Jim Bird, Transportation Engineer, and Steve Wolfman, Senior Civil Engineer, uh, for item number 20, which is Senate Bill 743, Implementation from Public Works. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Claire Gologly. I'm the Transportation Planner for the city. And as Mayor Cummings said, I promise to keep this brief. Um, before I go into Senate Bill 743, I'm going to frame this for you that this is an implementation of state law. This only relates to how we analyze transportation impacts as it relates to CEQA. Um, this must be in place by July 1st. I'm incredibly proud of how we partnered with the other jurisdictions in our county to implement this and get this going. And how we do it technically is complicated, but how we set the policy is fairly straightforward. So that's what I'm going to go through um, right now. So I'm going to turn my screen sharing on. And start the slideshow. So to be starting, so Senate Bill 743 implementation. Again, I'm going to briefly talk about what Senate Bill 743 is, talk about our change from how we analyze transportation from level of service, which is LOS, to vehicle miles traveled, which is VMT, talk about what we did and how we got there, and then talk about our recommended new thresholds of significance. The Senate Bill 743 changes how we analyze transportation impacts under CEQA. Previously, we considered the amount of delay that you face to intersections to be the environmental impact and we would mitigate that by widening roadways or intersections. 
Now we're looking at vehicle miles traveled, and what that says, and I'll go into it more, is that the distance that we're having people travel is the environmental impact. If we co-locate things close together, like housing and jobs and your daily needs, then your environmental impact will be less because you'll be traveling less distance. Goals of SB 743 are really in line with our general plan and climate action plan goals. It's to promote infill, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, support all modes of transportation, encourage mixed use, and really move away from thinking about automobile inconvenience as the primary metric. This um, is an important fact that this applies prospectively. So we don't look back on what we've done before. From July 1st, moving forward, we'll be using vehicle miles traveled as our metric of analysis. Um, and really what the Senate bill says is that CEQA documents can no longer use level of service as a determination as a significant impact under the California Environmental Quality Act. We need to look now at um, vehicle miles traveled and other methods of analysis. And what is vehicle miles traveled? So I mentioned this briefly before, but really it's looking at the distance that you travel. So the trips that you take during the day, you will probably go to your workplace and go shopping. And in this case, this example on the screen, you're dropping kids off at school. And so it looks at the per capita, per capita distance that you travel per day. In the example here with a family of three, um, cumulatively, they travel 50 miles per day, but you divide that by three in the per capita VMT for that household is 16.7 miles. SB 743 does allow us to continue using level of service in everything that's not related to CEQA. So anything that we do right now that requires a traffic study that's not related to our environmental analysis, we can continue doing. So our fee-based programs, um, we're, we're still allowed to continue on in that way. The example on the screen is Local governments require things that are outside CEQA all the time, such as landscaping plans and elevations for the project approval, but that's not for CEQA purposes. And so the key message here is this transportation analysis is only as it applies to CEQA. One of the things that we did previously with level of service was that the available mitigations were generally roadway widening or intersection widening to make it so that more cars could flow through that area of roadway quickly because we considered delay to be the environmental impact. Switching to VMT means that the available options we have to mitigate impacts of transportation under CEQA are things that we've been trying to do for a long time. So it's transit improvements, bike and pedestrian improvements, carpooling improvements, education encouragement programs, many things that our TDM program is already doing, but now it says that's how you can mitigate your transportation impact. How did we do it? We formed a countywide collaboration. So because every jurisdiction in the state needs to adopt new thresholds of significance under CEQA to comply with this, we looked around and we said, hey, if the other cities in the region and the county all have to do this as well. We can partner together, we can save a lot of money, we can save a lot of time, and we can share expertise and get it going. So um, all of the jurisdictions, the five of us, we got together, we shared costs, we shared resources, we got a consultant on board who had the technical expertise to be able to run the type of analysis that we needed. And we were able to come up with an SB 743 implementation plan and some thresholds of significance that align with um, SB 743's mandate. So for SB 743 implementation, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research established guidelines that they published, and their recommendations are on the screen. This next slide here is the staff recommended threshold. They are in line with those recommended by the Governor's Office of Planning and Research um, residential. The threshold of significance that we recommend is 15% below the countywide average. For office and service, it's 15% below the countywide average per employee. For retail, it's no net increase, and for all other land uses, it's no net increase as well. Um, what this means is that if you have a example project where the VMT for a residential project, for example, is 100, if your project comes in with a VMT of 85 or less, then you're below that threshold of significance, and it's assumed that you have a less than significant impact. If your VMT is 86 or above, then you have a menu of options that are transportation demand management strategies that you can use to reduce that VMT to an acceptable level, less than significant level. We also have screening uh, thresholds that are in place. The OPR guidance did say that there are things that you can do to screen out certain projects that would say they would have a less than significant impact. So 
some of those may be uh, map-based screening thresholds where we've mapped our community and we show where areas of low VMT are that are within that 15% below. And it's assumed that trips with, or developments that have a similar characteristic to what's already there would exhibit similar trip patterns, so you can screen out. Also, small projects that would be expected to generate less than 110 trips per day or local retail would screen out. And for local retail, the thing to consider here is if you have a grocery store that's across town and that same grocery store opens up closer to you, you're not going to replace that grocery store trip. You're still going to take it, but your trip will be shorter. So local retail can screen out there. Um, affordable housing and infill locations is assumed to be less than significant. Local essential services, many of these are daycare, public school, government offices, and other things that are um, essential functions of the community. And then anything that's within a half mile of a major transit stop. And we do have those maps. There's some red flags there of if it doesn't comply with our existing plan, if it replaces affordable housing, or if it's low density or has excessive parking. Uh, again, as I had said, the mitigation strategies that we have in place are travel demand management strategies. You can see these in one of the attachments, but generally they're transit, education encouragement, commute trip reduction programs, bike and pedestrian programs, neighborhood improvements such as traffic calming and uh, various parking strategies. Finally, the key message is that adopting these new thresholds of significance will comply with state law and they must be in place by July 1st, 2020. What we proposed is in line with the recommendations from the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. What we will have available for project sponsors and for our internal teams are the published report, which is included in your staff report, map-based screening tools, an Excel-based sketch planning tool, and a published menu of available TDM options. There's more information that's available at the links here on the screen. And with that questions, and I recognize I went through that very quickly, but what I would remind you is that Technically, how we do it is very complicated. Policy-wise, what we're asking you to do is to adopt the recommendations that are in line with the recommendations by the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. And with that, as fast as I've ever done it, I'm available for questions. All right, thank you for that presentation. Are there any uh, questions from council members? It looks like council member Golder and council member Brown. I don't have a question, but I'm prepared to make a motion as written in the agenda report. So we will uh, come back to that after we have a uh, comment. <laughs> but uh, I'll go to the council member Brown at this time. <clears throat> yes, hi, thank you for the brief presentation. Um, I have kind of tried to study up on this and I'm glad you put those links up. I've used some of those to help me understand what we're doing here. And I, you know, I just want to say, um, that this is a pretty significant decision that we're making. It, it, it could lead to some significant changes in how we evaluate projects. And, um, and I understand that we have, there's a state mandate to do that. And I, I've supported moving towards vehicle miles traveled for a whole lot of reasons. Um, in this case, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is what the kind of anticipated uh, difference will be in terms of how we approve projects and the mitigations we require. So, you know, the example you gave is really helpful, but I also am thinking about all the other examples of, you know, given what we know about the housing jobs mismatch in our community that, and our, our transit system kind of being, having some gaps in terms of how people are served. Um, I um, am, you know, I'm just trying to understand because it seems to me that we, could very well end up in situations where the projects that we approve um, will end up creating more vehicle miles traveled because the people who can afford to either rent or buy them will have to work elsewhere in order to make the kind of income that you need to live in this town and that many of the jobs that might come from those mixed use projects will mean that people who are working at them because they're low wage live outside. So to me, that just signals the possibility of a significantly n larger number of vehicle miles traveled. And um, so I'm just, you know, I, so I guess the two questions that I have is one, you know, can you give us um, some kind of idea of how the kind of current projects that we, we know are coming um, might be affected in terms of what's required? And if not that, at least um, some, like, could you walk us through an example that is kind of closer to 
what you know, I think we can all anticipate is going to be the reality. And then I also wanted to just check and see, I know, thank you for um, approaching this regionally. I think that was like, that made a lot of sense and I'm glad that happened. And I'm just wondering, so all jurisdictions now are committed to the 15% threshold? Is that um, so I'll take your second question first. Um, our, our recommendations match what the county is recommending. I believe Watsonville and Capitola are recommending the same. Scotts Valleys are slightly different because their community characteristics are different, and I have not yet heard from them what their recommended thresholds are. Um, but we had the, kind of the same recommendations. They, um, they flagged as an outlier with higher VMT than the rest of the region, and knowing Scotts Valley, there's a lot of land use reasons why that is. There's not a lot in Scotts Valley besides housing, so trip distances are naturally longer. Um, so this, this will be harder for them to implement. To your um, first question in terms of trip distances, so what the um, thresholds are based off of, and in the, um, I forget which attachment it is, but it's called Draft SB 743 Implementation Guidelines, and unless there's comments from today, that will become final guidelines. Um, there's actual numbers of what that threshold, those thresholds are. And where those come from is that we have a countywide transportation model that was updated to 2019 base year data. And so that has updated land use assumptions across the entirety of our county of what is in which transportation analysis zone. And then we have actual data on how far those trip distances are. One of the complicated parts of this project was that we had to control for, we had to do a, a, a level of post-processing using big data that accounted for trips that go into and out of the county. And so there's a an analysis in the report that talks through that more, but the trip distances that we're assuming right now and the, um, the VMT thresholds that we have been showing are based upon actual trip distances right now. So the same concerns that we've had for the last couple of years about housing affordability, probably the, you know, most of my life growing up in Santa Cruz about housing affordability and trip distance are already reflected in the analysis that we've done. We've also projected that forward to a 2040 out year assessment in the model in line with where the county is looking at their general plan out year, why we did that. Um, and so we've looked forward there and have some, some anticipated changes. What it shows us is that we do have a fairly low VMT per capita and VMT per employee within the city of Santa Cruz, which is not to say that there aren't people traveling over the hill and traveling further distances to be able to afford to live here, but that the, um, at each analysis zone, they're called transportation analysis zones that you do transportation models on, they're similar to census tracts and census block groups. Um, it shows what that 15% below threshold is. So maybe a long-winded way to get to answer your question is that the model doesn't play out that we have um, we have many areas in the city that we would screen out because the trip distances are already short in those areas. And with land uses going in that our general plan and our, our future planning call for, those types of land use developments are projected to continue to have low VMT per capita. Where we would see um, projects that would need to have higher levels of analysis would be on the edges of the city where you have to travel further. Um, for employment, it would be in areas that we don't already have employment, so there's not not people already going there and it's not near jobs. Um, but by and large, what our map looks like is very similar to our general plan or our zoning map. Okay. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? <laughs> okay, seeing none, um, we're gonna open it to public comment on this item. So this is for item number 20 on our agenda, which is uh, Senate Bill 743 implementation. If you'd like to comment on item number 20, now is the time to call in. And after you've entered, you're gonna want to put star nine on your phone to raise your hand so you can comment on this item. Uh, if your hand is currently raised and you are not intending to comment on item number 20, please, put it down and then by pressing star nine and then when we um, go into oral communications or other items, uh, you can raise your hand at that time. With that, I will open it up to uh, public comment.
Right, you're on the line. You know, I was trying to unmute my, this is James Ewing Whitman. I wasn't going to comment on this. I would like to apologize for my coworker not knowing that this was a live recording. So I guess I'm going to get off and I want to do public comments. So okay, I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you are on the line for item number 20. I was trying to lower my hand because I was for oral communication and did not know that you were going to this item. So the instructions about star nine to lower your hand after you hit star nine to raise it are inaccurate. Okay, thank you. I'll put you back on the top of the list for oral communications. Thank you. There's one other person. Um, I'm trying to figure out that Zoom is old, so I think I might have to promote them to a panelist and then uh, control the video on this end. Okay, so uh, the person who was just promoted to a panelist, um, you are on the line for oral communications for item number 20. All right, um, I guess that person's not gonna be commenting on this item. So, and we didn't have any other members of the community raising their hands on this item, so I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. And I think council member Golder. I'm mute. I am, I'm ready. Um, I was gonna make a resolution amending the 1990 city of Santa Cruz CEQA guidelines and rescind the resolution NS19309 adopting earlier guidelines and two resolution adopting a transportation threshold of significance of 15% below the regional average vehicle miles traveled for purposes of complying with Senate Bill 743. Okay, so the motion made by Council Member Colder. Council Member Watson, to see your hand is up. Go ahead and second the motion. Okay. So uh, we have a motion by Council Member Golder, second by Council Member Watkins to move the staff recommendation on item number 20. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you. I um, just wanted to make a comment here because you know I'm I'm not going to be supporting the motion, and I, I just want to explain why I'm doing that. I um, I appreciate that a whole lot of work has gone into this and a lot of people are thinking and have thought long and hard about it. And um, so it's not that it's so much that I'm opposed to making this change, but I still don't feel comfortable with, um, you know, I just don't feel like I have enough information about kind of the, the real world potential effects on what the difference will be between our current, uh, the, the way we currently do things with level of service and moving in this direction. So I just don't feel comfortable with the information I have and I've really tried to learn as much as I could um, about it today. So I'm gonna be voting no and I just don't wanna hold this up. I know we have a long agenda to get through. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember Goldberg, second by Councilmember Watkins. I guess we'll go ahead and Ask the clerk to call the vote. Councilmember Byers is absent. Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Holder? I don't think that came through. No. Uh, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes with um, Council Member Byers absent, uh, Council Member Brown voting against, and Council Members Matthews, Golder, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor. So, thank you. And I'll, I'll just like to say it'll, it'll be interesting to kind of see how all this plays out over time and whether or not we'll need to make adjustments. But thanks for your work on this. Thank you. Okay, that is gonna move us on to uh, oral communications. So uh, 
Um, before we begin, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not currently on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand after you've called in. You will have, uh, we're gonna switch up the timing, so I'll get the timing in a sec, but when it's your time to speak, You'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. Uh, we request that you clearly and slowly state your name before your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, stating your name is not required. Um, please remember as well, this is the time for council to hear from the public um, on items that are not on the agenda. And um, we will not be communicating and doing back and forth with people who are asking questions because this is an opportunity for us to hear from the public. Um, if you go over your time, I'll try to remind you to um, please um, wrap up your comments. And if it goes on too long, I'll have to mute your microphone. So if you would like to uh, make any comment on any item that was not on the agenda, now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And we'll get started. And we're going to start, given that uh, we're a little bit over time, but we want to provide additional time for people to speak. Uh, we're going to have oral communications be for one minute. We've got about 100 people who've called in. And so um, we're gonna start with one minute and we'll try to, um, we'll have it go for 45 minutes for now and see how many people are still on. And with that, um, we'll go to the first caller. You'll have one minute for, for oral communications. You're on the line. Wow, amazing. I'm first, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I have a minute. So I'd like to comment on two service groups that I found. One was a group of about 25 citizens who showed up March, excuse me, May 29th at the supervisors meeting. And we spoke on the COVID-19 subject. I also wanna direct the public to my public Facebook. Uh, there's a photograph on there that really describes electrical energy really well. My name is James Ewing Whitman. So, um, I opened my email today and I read correspondence from Mr. Andy Mills and I was very touched. I was also at the celebration on Sunday and I was absolutely touched by the love and respect that I saw everybody who was there. So that's enough for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, you're on the line. Uh, yeah, this is Lee Brokaw. Um, I wanted to call the council's attention to the fact that I turned in a petition to the mayor uh, Wednesday of this week. I thought it would be in time to be on the agenda. Uh, the essence of the petition is that it's time for the public to be back in front of the council. Uh, could be done at the Civic Auditorium. I turned in uh, 41 wet signatures. I thought it was important to do this in, per in person and not by internet. I have four former mayors signatory and one former council member signatory. Uh, we the people request and demand that the city council meet in front of the public and not by electronics. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, this is Scott Graham. I was calling about the Zoom meeting that the mayor and the chief of police had. At the, during that meeting, when questions were taken from the uh, public, the chief of police answered everyone's questions except mine. And I sent him an email, CC'd the mayor and other council members about this. The questions were demilitarizing the police, racial profiling, what's being done about it, use of force guidelines, who can fire a bad cop? Can the city manager fire a bad cop or is it only just the chief of police? Or can the city council go into special session and fire a bad cop. Um, more non-lethal options 
Like in Japan, they have these net guns that they can shoot a net over somebody that'll trip them up and uh, demobilize them. Um, what are we going to do about the endless harassment of the poorest members of our society? And then uh, we need to bring back a police review board and a police review board that has some teeth, not a toothless one like the one that was around before. Now, the other issue is these Zoom meetings. These Zoom meetings are terrible. Half of the uh, what is being said is unintelligible. Cynthia Matthews has the worst connection of anybody. I can barely understand anything she says on here. And I don't, you know, it's probably not her fault. It's some fault of whatever device she's using or her internet connection. I don't know. But we've got to, like Lee Brokaw just said, we got to bring this back. 20 some years ago, there was the Beach South of Laurel hearings held in the okay. Civic Center live on TV. So there's no reason we can't do that now. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to uh, bring it to the attention of the city clerk. We can't hear the uh, the alarm for the end of one minute, so just to let you know. Okay, I have the mic up to it, but I think you were muted. So. All right, Hi, uh, my name. Hi, my name is Abby Mustafa, and I submitted the paperwork for a special event permit for a mural that says "Black Lives Matter" on Front Street between Cooper and SoCal. And I respectfully request that the motion be made for a meeting be held to approve the permits necessary, if not this one, um, for the mural project to be approved as soon as possible. I know that because of COVID, it's difficult to approve special events permits, but this isn't necessarily for a gathering necessarily. It's more of a protest in support um, of Black Lives Matter by artists and with the approval and support of the government. And I think it shows where the Santa Cruz community stands um, as far as the movement goes, as well as really a call to action for racial equity practices be implemented in places in our community where they're not. That's it. Great. Thank you. All right, next caller, John Lyons. Hi there. My name is Jace Ritchie. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, over the last hour and a half about, um, I've gotten to hear a lot of the priorities of what this uh, community and the city council value. And it's been frustrating to know that the public commentary, which was set to begin an hour and a half ago, is pushed to now. But I am grateful for the opportunity to hear that, like myself and a number of my friends and colleagues, uh, the city council members care deeply about the people of this town. Um, I hope that they can consider that uh, when developing in more detail the budget uh, to commit to defunding the police department of Santa Cruz, uh, a police department that is known for uh, and has a history of violence against uh, black and brown people and a city that needs to reinvest public infrastructure. Um, in things like affordable housing. Yeah. That's it. All right, thank you. Okay, next call, you have one minute. Hi, my name is Chrissy Hansen, Mayor Cummings and City Council members. Most of you know me. Um, my husband is a Santa Cruz police officer, and I'm calling to implore you to please do not defund or reallocate any money that is allocated for the police department. It is of utmost importance for officer safety and community safety. As you all know, we just lost Sergeant Gutzweiler. My husband was there during that incident, and it brings it home that these officers, men and women, all over our county put their hearts and souls into their jobs. We all know there are bad apples in every single job out there, but the men and women of the Santa Cruz Police Department put their hearts and souls into their jobs, and they try to do the best they possibly can for our community. It really, truly boils down to officer safety and community safety. 
and I implore you to look into doing research in other cities and states and countries who have defunded or reallocated money and see what the consequences have been. We already have this patch and release in our did a lot of hats. Please do not defend the police department. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Okay, this is Garrett Phillip. The rioters, the arsonists, the looters, and the anarchists, and all of those who want to hijack George Floyd's family's legitimate demand for justice to further their own personal agendas of division, chaos, and violence should be condemned and stopped. He sure was a victim of a deadly civil rights abuse by a law enforcement officer of that city government. Notice I say deadly civil rights abuse and not systemic racism. The outrage should be the same regardless of race and concentrated on government civil rights abuses of all its citizens and restoring accountability for all government actions needs focus instead of the inflammatory leftist knee-jerk claim of systemic racism, which requires more than accusations and statistics. The Floyd response reminds me of the last credible protest of abuse at the hands of the powerful, namely Occupy Wall Street, where their message of criminal banking fraud got delegitimatized, forgotten, and then crushed by the dilution of the hordes of leftist special agenda grievance mongers inappropriately trying to hijack that financial abuse issue for their own agendas. The result was no reform. In the now, dare I say, we are seeing the BLM, the anarchists, the looters, the vandals, the domestic terrorists, Antifa, the national dirty political tactician press, and political parties taking focus away from the central issue of an unaccountable government abuse of power for their own purposes and are risking another failure, or probably worse, they might succeed in destroying society. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, uh, my name is Edith. I'm a Santa Cruz resident. I want to first acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of Amamutun. I acknowledge the voices in the community that are asking for abolishment of the police in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. According to the city budget proposal, SCPD is asking for over 400,000 more in the next fiscal year, which is a grand total increase of over 3 million since 2019. As the city must cut costs due to COVID-19, we must focus our budget on care and resources, not surveillance and state violence. According to policescorecard.org, SCPD uses more force, batons, tasers, and strangleholds per arrest than 23% of police departments in California. That is both the physical and mental cost of violence and terror on our community, as well as the monetary cost of those weapons. If we really want to save money and the worth of our community, stop sending local police to other communities such as Oakland. If we want to build a better Santa Cruz post-COVID, disarm SCPD. Instead of funding their pepper spray, rubber bullets, firearms, tasers, tear gas, and riot gear to use on protesters who have been peaceful so far, direct that money to our houseless community members, our families, and our students who need it a lot more than white homeowners need a sense of safety provided by the legacy of the slave patrol. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, next person, you're on the line. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I want to give props to, to you, Mayor Cummings, and to Chief Mills for the way you guys handled the protests. Um, really super commendable. And also my condolences to the uh, Sheriff's Office and the loss of uh, the Deputy Gutzweiler. I actually had tried to comment on item number 16, and for some reason my star nine didn't hit. So just real briefly, there's an issue there. I know it was already passed on second reading, but um, <clears throat> that's the uh, mandatory involuntary election contribution limits, and it's unclear whether that applies in recall candidate elections, as we just had, um, because there was an issue with this last recall, and I don't want to relive the past, it's over, but <clears throat> the, um, I think that you should make it clear whether the intent of that is to apply to uh, recall candidates as well, um, because there was a violation if it was. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're online. All right, uh, the next speaker. Sean yeah. McGinn. I am vice chair of the Santa Cruz Arts Commission. Uh, first, thank you for your time. 
I would like to bring to your attention uh, an application for a permit uh, presented by Abby Mustafa for a special event held on Front Street that is uh, a mural for Black Lives Matter. Um, I believe this requires immediate attention from the council and once again, thank you for everything. Hello? <clears throat> Hello? You're on the line. My name is Peter Benke. I live in Santa Cruz. I've been a resident here since 2014. I want to begin by saying that we are in the unceded territory of UP Indians represented by the Amamuts and Tribal Bands, that Black Lives Matter, and that although I will never understand the Black experience of racism, I stand with Black people and people of color. I would like to share my experience and thoughts on the conduct and priorities of the department. I've worked as a security guard in Santa Cruz since 2015, beginning at the Crow's Nest and the Blue Lagoon until 2018, and from 2018 to present at Brady's Yacht Club. In the time I have had to handle stabbings, drive-by shootings, assaults, intoxicated people, and survive with minimal harm to myself and no harm to others. On April 20th, 2018, I was attacked and assaulted for being gay. A stranger assaulted me out of nowhere inside the ASCII, referring to me as a faggot. I am a gay man. After leaving the ASCII, my assailant and some others attacked myself and a friend. I had to call the SCPB three times over two days to get someone to take a statement. I was told they were very busy and put under the impression immediately that this was not a priority. I understand that there are more important issues than the hate crime, but I feel that it should be a priority. After months, I finally had a follow-up. There was video evidence of the assault, but that was it, other than a letter saying you were the victim of a crime. I'm going to stop and thank you for providing us with that information. And uh, let us know if we can follow up with you on uh, addressing that. It sounds like a pretty serious concern. Thank you for calling in. All right, next week. Hi there. I just, wanted, I just wanted to reach out as a born and raised resident of Santa Cruz to just some, address the allocation of our tax dollars and policing in our community. Um, with COVID-19, city staffers have been recommending that we, like, cut upwards to $6 million in spending. And I think it's by, by far time that the city looks at how much spending is going into the police department and how much we're actually getting out of it as a community. I really want to urge the council to reevaluate the city's financial relationship with policing in ways that like, are making officers, uh, in ways like making officers um, liable for misconduct settlements and not taxpayers, from withholding pensions and we're not rehiring cops who are involved with excessive force and abuse uh, claims as well as suspending paid leave for cops who are under investigation. But I think it's really, really important that we just stop sending our police to terrorize other communities. I don't know why Santa Cruz is allowing their cops to go and trample on another community's right to free speech. Free speech. Like, that's just some, like, wrong side of history stuff. I really think we need to end these mutual aid agreements. Um, you know, our city doesn't mirror large urban areas that um, find themselves assaulted with militarized police forces. Santa Cruz has, in many ways, already been a leading example of what a community-led uh, police force could be, but I think it's far from good enough. And I hope that the council takes this to heart and will push for official time for the community to express in depth their concerns. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Yeah, hi, my name's Al, and I really appreciate everything you guys do. I know it's a hard job. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that the event that happened over the weekend with the murder of the deputy sheriff, Damon Gertzweil, has really shaken us all up here. Um, and it, it, it happens 250 days after one of my best friends, Tushar Atre, was also kidnapped and murdered from his home in Pleasure Point. And um, both were senseless acts of violence um, and... Uh, I, I've, I've been here in Santa Cruz for a few years, and it's been a shock to us that the level of violence here is so high. And we believe Andy Mills and his chief and, and, and Mayor Justin Cummins, thank you so much for your courageous and calming impact on during the BLM um, riding downtown. Uh, it, it showed a level of sort of discipline and, and, and leadership that I hadn't seen before. 
And of course, I was in the, the, the marches as well as the paddle outs for BLM. I support everything that they do, but I really urge you, do not cut the police. In fact, if you feel like you need to increase it, I'm a big supporter of that. Thank you for everything that you do. And uh, we hope we can get back to a community with respect, love, and, uh, and all the values that we really appreciate. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, um, my name is Josh Brahinsky. I live in Santa Cruz. I want to say I'm really saddened by the violence against the police this weekend, um, and I think that there's a way to create a community where the polarization between the police and the people um, is really different. The recent events in Minneapolis and COVID crisis create an opportunity to think differently, and I think a serious look at how we can rethink the kinds of power police have and use. We don't need a person with a gun to respond to the vast majority of mental health situations. We don't need a person with a gun to deal with a forged $20 bill. We don't need a person with a gun to give a speeding ticket. We don't need a person with a gun to support homeless people. And the list goes on. We need people trained to deal with difficult emotional situations, not trained to catch criminals, which means that we don't need the police in many, many, many situations. We need to defund the police. And there's a whole bunch of things we can do. I mean, look at what's happening in Minneapolis. So let's defund the Santa Cruz police, and while we're figuring out how to make that work, continuing the hiring freeze on police right now, our police out of Oakland, and just notice that if we're spending $30 million or the $100 million budget on the cops, that is way, way too much. All right, next speaker. Hi, my name is Caitlin Hanna. Um, I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for 14 years. In response to the Black Lives Matter movement and countrywide calls for defunding the police, I expect the council to create a special session or an agenda item at the very least on the next meeting with regards to the defunding of the SCPD and the underfunding of humanitarian and social services. Over the year, I have witnessed countless hours and dollars spent through the SCPD on asking our unhoused population to move, to move, to move, to not sit here, to not lay down here. I feel that, that the SCPD's labor efforts and funds are grossly misused and in need of major reallocation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next caller, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, how are you? My name is Andrew Carlson. I'm a local uh, maker, fabricator, prototyper, and business consultant, and I have a budget, a bunch of budgetary questions. I hope I have the right data here. Um, but my understanding is that you're asking to cut six million dollars out of the budget, and ironically, you're asking to increase uh, the police budget to 28.1 percent, which would be larger than the library, public works, economic development combined. Um, and also, there's been an insufficient response to COVID, especially in terms of PPE, my maker lab has actually been producing a ton of that, uh, and it's not been going well in terms of how the community has responded. So I would like to ask, why are we not suspending paid admin for cops who are under investigation for excessive violence, for example? And why do we have 23% uh, higher uh, excessive force when it comes to per arrest? So 23% higher rate per arrest for violence compared to any other PD in California. Uh, anyway, I would like to keep on the police. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next person, you're on the line. Hi, my name is... Hi, my name is... My name is Elena Raymer. I want to demand the city of Santa Cruz immediately begin a process of defunding the police and begin supporting the needs of our communities in ways that will eventually make police obsolete. That means housing for all, health care for all, including mental health care and addiction treatment, and other services for all who are in need. It means emergency responders who are not cops and who are trained in conflict mediation who are mental health care providers and social workers. The city needs to support and fund marginalized communities in Santa Cruz. They deserve care, not cops. Doing so will be a baby step towards repairing the damage that has been done by over-policing, police brutality, police complicity with ICE, gentrification, and the general whitewashing of Santa Cruz history and culture. We can't settle for reforms that have been tried and have failed in other cities. 
Fight for the future we want and deserve while you're at it. End cash bail and end juvenile detention now. Hey, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, um, Hi. my name is Katie Kessler, and I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm asking for the council to not approve an increase in budget for the police force and to instead allocate more funds to education, housing, and community-based programs in Santa Cruz. I was shocked to learn that policing took 12% of the city's budget in 2018, while only 1.8% went to housing. I feel strongly that the police force does not need more funding, especially since Santa Cruz Police Department uses more force per arrest than 23% of other police departments in California. I will also be following how each council member votes to determine who I would like to elect in the future as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hey, next speaker. Hello, my name is Jesse Malley. I'm a 33-year resident here in Santa Cruz, California. I'm seated on the Muslim territory. Um, I'm calling for the reallocation of police funds to humanitarian and social services. Um, uh, we should not be sending costs to do jobs that should be done by, by social workers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, um, my name is Sabina and I live in Santa Cruz. I was born here and I raised my kids here. I'm a boring middle-aged white mom that is asking you to defund the police. The police are dangerous. They're dangerous to our kids and to our community. They treat every situation as a hammer because that's the tool that they have. Why are we giving money to a violent force when the money could go into the community for good? The police budget is 28.1% of the budget. Look around at how many other areas of our community that could use those funds. We could house everyone. Instead, our tax dollars in Santa Cruz are going to SBPD, backing up police brutality in Oakland. We also need to remove the police from our schools. Why are we sending police with guns into our schools? I don't want my tax, do tax dollars going to that. Do you? Black Lives Matter. Yeah. All right, next speaker. Good evening. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County and a white resident that completely supports the Black Lives Matter movement and defunding the police in order to put back the power in the hands of the community and put an end to the police brutality experience in not only in California, but all across the United States. Policing our community takes up the largest chunk of our city's general operating budget. This means more funding is going toward policing than economic development, library funding, and community development combined. Thanks to the policescore.org and your online SC city budget proposal, I want to list out some important numbers. Our county is expecting a budget deficit of 10 to 20 million due to COVID-19 and the sheriff's office is asking for an $8 million increase in the next fiscal year, which is completely unacceptable. Before my time is up, I'd like to summarize some things that I think we should make a priority in the next meeting. Defund the police and allocate the money and resources to organizations that are specialized in various professions, such as social workers and medical. Suspend use of paid admin leave for cops under investigation. Withhold pensions from and don't rehire cops involved in excessive force. Require cops to be liable for misconduct settlements, not taxpayers. Withdraw participation of police militarization programs and military exercises. Disarm the SCPD. No more pepper for spray, rubber bullets, firearms, armored vehicles, tasers, tear gas, or riot gear. We are people and you are not at war with us. Thank you for listening. Yep. All right, next speaker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Martinez and I'm a Santa Cruz resident. I would first like to agree with Caitlin Hanno's request that the council hold a special session for defunding the SCPD. I find it extremely concerning that there is over $400,000 proposed for the SCPD in the upcoming budget. It is embarrassing to be living in a city that boasts progressiveness while sending combat-ready officers to a historically black community to stifle the voices of their residents. I am ashamed to live in a city that values a violent and oppressive police department over the health and safety of their citizens. Defund our police department, invest in our community, and let Santa Cruz be the progressive haven you all pretend it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, my name is Rachel Chavez. I'm an RN who's lived in Santa Cruz most of my life, and I'm, asked, I'm here today to ask you to defund the police. Services like housing, education, and health care have been drained of funds that were siphoned off to an increasingly militarized police force. In Santa Cruz, you only have to walk around downtown for a minute or so to see the devastating effects of lack of housing in our community. In 2018, funding for housing took up only 1.8% of the budget, community programs 2%, while policing took up 12%. Policing is an inherently racist system. In Santa Cruz in 2015, black people made up 4.3% of all arrests and only 0.9% of the total population. But Andy Mills will tell you that SCPD is too enlightened to act in a racist manner. This shows either a total misunderstanding or an absolute refusal to acknowledge how systemic racism is perpetuated in systems. We can look to Minneapolis to see that police reforms and implicit bias training unequivocally, unequivocally do not do enough. Police still wind up murdering black people with impunity. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm on. Hi, my name is Madison. I'm a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. Just wanted to offer my thoughts to our council members as we set priorities for our budget in the upcoming weeks. Uh, I would like to see the city of Santa Cruz adopt a socially responsible budget that prioritizes health and welfare spending over policing. Nearly a third of our city general funds are dedicated to policing. And it's my understanding that the police have requested a budget increase for the 2021 fiscal year. This request should be rejected and police funding should be reallocated toward health and welfare programs. Reallocating resources would protect the most vulnerable in our community as the city reckons with the consequences of decreasing resources to meet the essential needs of its residents. And I would just like to say, if you fail to prioritize people over police in your budget considerations, not only will I not vote for you when the time comes, but I will do everything in my power to help replace you with more progressive challengers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Hello. 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 Oh, hi. Um, so I'm a downtown resident. My name is McKenna. Um, and I'm calling to ask you to defund the police because um, they're um, funded too heavily and they're trying to pass ordinances like the quality of life ordinance that actually asks uh, that it be criminalized to have syringes on you without a prescription and other things like camping from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., which doesn't make any sense. Um, and... Yeah, I just think the attacking of homeless people in this community has gone on for far too long. I think it's a waste of our time. Santa Cruz PD uh, does more misdemeanor arrests than 98% of police departments of California, according to policescorecard.com. And yeah, I would just say just defund the police. Um, we don't need them to have weapons that they have or the power that they have. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, I'm a Santa Cruz County resident, student at Cabrillo College. Um, I want everyone listening to question yourself whether you think the Santa Cruz County Police Department is an institution worthy of your taxes. Instead of giving them more money to arm themselves with weapons to use against us and also the protesters of Oakland, which we demand seize immediately, we should be using that money to create a more robust system of care and support for homeless people and addicts and to create a, a team of crisis responders that resolve conflict without violence. I understand that our mayor is working closely with the police to practice reform. However, you cannot reform a system that is inherently violent. The criminal justice system is inextricably bound to oppression. We cannot solve homelessness or addiction by criminalizing it. Our community needs care, not cops. Minneapolis is already talking about defunding and expanding their police. I truly believe Santa Cruz would be the perfect place to adopt this model and become an example for the rest of California. We deserve the chance to dream of something better, and we can be better. Santa Cruz is amazing, and I have faith in us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Carolina Mejia. I'm a longtime resident here. I'm also a student at Cabrillo College. Um, I agree with the idea of a special meeting to talk about Black, Black Lives Matter and the whole movement. But I also agree that with the um, budget, there should be so much more money poured into minority um, education. 
Um, as a first-generation high school graduate, I attend Rio College. I'm a daughter of a single mother. I'm a minority and a woman. I was denied a long time ago in the public school system as an elementary school student to the right to have a proper education. I actually had to leave the system to be able to achieve the same goals that I'm achieving today. So I really would want you guys to consider putting, investing so much more money into the education for minority students so that we can together grow as a community and grow in equal education because it's a human right. Um, that parents should choose between food on their table and educating their children. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next speaker. Uh, hi, my name's Adam. Uh, I live in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, and I'm calling to ask you to agendize uh, reducing the funding for or even eliminating the Santa Cruz Ca uh, City Police Department. Um, we can give the important work that the police does to other city departments. Uh, we can maybe not give anyone the task of running around the city hassling the homeless. We could maybe spend the extra money we save not doing that on housing the homeless. Uh, and I just don't feel comfortable having the city employing people who are authorized to kill in my name. Thank you. Yep. All right, next speaker. Not sure if they just dropped off the line. Oh, there's a person, McKenna Manis. Okay. Sorry, I also called in on my phone and then you, I got to talk there, so thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, next speaker. The last one, yeah, you're on the line. Oh, hello, my name is Keith. I'm a longtime resident here in Santa Cruz. Um, I would like to call a meeting about uh, the redistribution of the, uh, of the budget in Santa Cruz. Um, I feel that uh, having the police department taking up as much of the budget as libraries, public works, and economic development um, combined, I think that that needs to be uh, looked closer at. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a memory that a lot of the students here Santa Cruz has um, during the COLA um, demonstrations with police showing up um, and breaking a, a young man's hand and smacking a young woman on the skull with a baton. So viral photos of police kneeling with us um, feels more like a stunt and we want to be involved in um, their process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to call to say that I think it's absolutely ridiculous that the Santa Cruz Police Department is receiving $30 million per year, um, which is 34% of the total budget. I really think that we should be investing in issues such as homelessness, housing, and for sure climate change. Um, and I know that the, the budget for climate change projects, which would be investing in our future, which is super t important to me as a young person to protect our future generations and the city of Santa Cruz, um, they get like $30,000 a year from the general fund. And I think that is an insane contrast compared to $30 million for the police department. So please, please, please defund them or at least bring it down a substantial amount. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Please turn on your device. Sorry about that. Um, I just want to say, my name is Devin Rainwater. Um, I'm a resident and student in Santa Cruz. Um, and I want to say to be a police officer is a personal and willful choice, and it is a job that can be easily left. Um, officer safety is not discussed in the Black Lives Matter movement because it is not at risk. 
the people who are at risk are BIPOC folks targeted by years of systemic racism. Um, officers are trained for a really small amount of time to be violent, and all cops participate in a fundamentally racist system. We must defund the SCPD and instead fund public education, housing support, and mental health services that will reduce um, crime in the city. Um, I hope to see my community safe, and this means I want to see an abolition of the police. Thank you. Yep. Anna, speaker. Hello, my name is Anna Adamski. I've worked in County Mental Health for the last few years, working with mostly the homeless population um, and substance abusers. So being inside of that system, I think that, and seeing what's been happening with the police recently, I think that it makes a lot of sense for Santa Cruz County to funnel some of their funds instead to preventative care and um, mental health care, uh, housing, and food justice. I think that we could take away some of the funding that's going towards tasers, batons, and outdated things that our police probably don't need. Um, I'd like to see stranglehold not be used by Santa Cruz police. And overall, I'd just like to see the finances be defunded and reinvested into the care of our communities rather than the policing of our communities. Oh, yeah, I'd also like to see mental health training for our police. My brother's a police officer, so I'm by no means, you know, hardcore anti-police. But I think I'd like to see the escalation anti-racial, anti-racist training for mental health training. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, you're on the line. Hi, my name is um, Remy, and I'm here to discuss the funding of the police. Um, a majority of the calls that the police receive are um, about the homeless population, which they are not trained to properly deal with. Funds need to be re reallocated to mental health and addiction services, education, and housing. The funding needs to be reallocated to support our most vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, I would like to bring to the council's attention the urgency of the proposal to create a mural on Front Street uh, to show where we stand on Black Lives Matter. And I would also like to support everyone else in defunding the Santa Cruz Police Department and relocating funds to education, climate change, uh, and housing for homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, can um, you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, I'm Lane Edwards. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County. I actually moved here a couple of years ago from New Orleans. And one thing that I was extremely struck by, uh, similarly to uh, many of my fellow community members, is that our police are extremely overfunded. Coming from New Orleans, um, a city that has ex much more violent crime, they actually have a lower percentage of their city's general fund that goes to the police. 88% of crime in Santa Cruz, according to the city website, is nonviolent property crime. Uh, I think we all know why this crime has to happen. People are not given the housing, they are not given the resources and the care they need to live. I believe that our city's funds would be much better and much more humanely used to house the homeless and to provide this care over funding the police. I strongly suggest, like my community members, that we hold a specific um, budget meeting about defunding the police and call that we do progressively, slash, um, beginning with 50%, defund the police um, with the goal of disbanding the police. Thank you so much. Again, if you're wanting to speak during oral communications, you must press star nine on your phone uh, in order to raise your hand. And I think the next person should be on one. Hi, is that me? Yep. Hi, so I have a few concerns. First off, last month, a 21-year-old black man named Tamario Smith was found alone, dead in his jail cell, and the cause of death has still not been released. 
When someone dies in the care of a public safety department, the cause of death needs to be public information to hold those departments accountable. Um, second, my friend's 15-year-old son was recently riding his bike home from Pleasure Point in his wetsuit with a boogie board when he was pulled over by a Santa Cruz Sheriff officer who tried to get him in trouble for being at the beach during the closure. As I hope you know, the water has remained open for surfing and boogie boarding during this closure, and my friend's son was not breaking any rules. In the middle of the stop, the SCSO officer had to actually Google the law that he was trying to enforce. And as you know, SCSO is enforcing the beach closures in South County beaches, and this racial profiling is an embarrassing reflection of the carelessness that police in Santa Cruz exhibit on way too many of their law enforcement contacts. So please define, consider defunding SCPD. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello? This is Ryan MSC. Oh, that was just me. I just spoke. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next speaker. I think this is Melanie Jones. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Me, I think. Hi, um, I'm a resident and homeowner here, um, and I wanted to address the request by the SCPD for an additional $467,000 for the next fiscal year. I think that we can all agree that over the course of the past few weeks, the world has really woken up to this issue of over-policing and how so many of society's most pressing problems, which have the potential to be addressed and rectified are instead being policed and criminalized. The police here in Santa Cruz already account for the lion's share of our budget. So rather than just approve another request for more funding, why not use this particular moment in time, this collective global wake-up moment to stop and reflect on how that 460 grand might be better spent. Other communities that have taken the approach of investing more heavily in social services and scaling back on police have ultimately decreased crime, saved taxpayer dollars, and elevated human potential. Given the police has, have already received more than $2.5 million in additional budget since 2019, right now just seems like the ideal moment to pause on approving yet another increase and instead step back and address how we can better invest in our community, making Santa Cruz an even better place to live for all. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we got... 13 people who have their hands up who want to speak, and so we'll just give people a minute each for these last 13, and then we're going to move on to our evening item. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, this is Elizabeth Clifton Doolin. I'm a Santa Cruz City resident, a longtime community member of 40 years. I support the Santa Cruz City Police Department under the direction of Andy Mills. I think it is that they need to continue funding. And they have done a beautiful job in de-escalating their staff and keeping us all protected. Thank you, Santa Cruz Police Department. Yes. All right, next speaker. Hi, my name is Jennifer Teschler, and I have lived on the west side of Santa Cruz for seven years. I also want a special session to discuss police funding in Santa Cruz, and like many people, I was upset to learn that 28% of the operating budget goes to the police in our city, and that they're asking for even more money, especially given the impending deficit brought on by COVID. I'd like to urge the council to vote against the proposed budget increases to the sheriff's office and SCPD, and instead reallocate current funding towards services that support our community, such as housing, education, and parks and rec. Other cities are adopting this model as they are confronted with the disproportionate violence inflicted by the police on black, indigenous, and people of color, and we should not be the last to follow. I am a white woman who is allowed to feel safe in Santa Cruz, but many of my BIPOC peers do not, to the point that several have fled the city. I will be tracking how the council members vote on this issue to inform how I spend my votes in the next election. I'd also like to add that perhaps councilperson scolders should refrain from making passive aggressive remarks like, I don't know how to talk about this, I'm not a stoner, and instead either educate themselves or not speak about things they don't know how to talk about. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next 
speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Cassandra Powell, um, and I just wanted to address the um, Santa Cruz Police Department social media. Um, as a social media manager by trade, five days ago, there was a post called a tale of two protests um, in which the Santa Cruz Police Department um, on their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on the city website said that the uh, violent protest um, was led by UCSC grad students, but that is not at all true. Um, and is a blatant act of defamation and um, really trying to divide uh, our community and is a clearly unfiled, unfounded and blatant attack on our own citizens. Um, so I'm just calling for the police to do better and to like find their sources and uh, really use their power on social media for the good of the community, especially um, because that viral photo of the chief of officer and you mayor coming um, has increased their follower count by a lot. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Melinda. I'm a seven-year resident of Santa Cruz County. And I just wanted to say that I support creating a special session to discuss the uh, police department funding and reallocation of funds to more community supportive associations and taking some of the responsibilities that are placed on police and creating alternative uh, departments to address the issues that could be raised without uh, force. And I also would like to say that I support the initiative to um, do a mural for the uh, Black Lives Matter movement on Front Street. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I wanna first take a moment for all the lives that have been lost recently. Um, from police brutality, from the protests, or from COVID. Um, and then I just want to support all the calls that have been made to refund and reallocate the resources that are going towards the police. Um, I think that Santa Cruz deserves to be a safe and fair place for everybody, not just those white wealthy residents. And in making the meeting to make these budgetary changes, that is concretely showing the residents of color that the Santa Cruz City Council cares and is committed to eradicating the racism that does exist here, and that affects the lives of everybody, especially those residents of color. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, you're on. Hi, thanks for taking my call. My name is Mel, I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I want to address the proposed increase to the police budget. It doesn't make any sense to me, as well as many other community members who have stated in this meeting, why we would increase the police department budget to a proposed 28% of our budget, which would be more than multiple sectors combined. The police, which historically started as slave patrol in the South, is entrenched in systematic racism. I know y'all know what that means. I know you know what that means. Black and brown people are racially profiled in Santa Cruz all the time. We also demand that you immediately stop sending the Santa Cruz Police Department to participate in egregious violence against, against protesters in Oakland. This is, this is just wrong, and I know y'all know that. And you have the power to do something. The answer is to defund the police and work towards abolishing the police so that we can truly invest in community-based solutions. We demand that you call a meeting to address reducing funding for the police. Do y'all want to be on the side of justice? Keep on the police. Do not doubt that we are all watching to see how you show up or fail to show up for justice. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. Santa Cruz is a paradise beach city kissed by the Pacific Ocean breeze and hugged 
by the Redwood Forest. The city also has a long history of racism that spawns from the oppression of the native peoples to the daily harassment, or worse, of its current non-whites. Listen to the voices of your people. They have overwhelmingly spoken. You fill the city with more police action. You fill the city with the image of a town out of control. And who wants to vacation or go to college or buy their house in a heavily policed municipality? People like Justin Bieber vacation in the area because of the giant dipper, not the giant police department. You have artists, educators, innovators, and passionate population to whom you can direct funding to come up with the solutions needed to make Santa Cruz the amazing place it's always meant to be. The choice is yours. You may not have long to make it because the people will speak out and act out against you. This is black. Next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hello, my name is Nicholas Church. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz County. I'm calling for a defunding and of the police department, taking up 28% of budget, more than library, public works, and economic development is ludicrous. I'm truly appalled that we would send our police department to Oakland to enforce systemic racism. We claim to be one of the most liberal places in California, let alone the country. We need to act like it. Become a cornerstone for the redefining how a community could be protected. The, if you do not act, if you do not work towards reallocating resources, we will see it. You are under a microscope now. Act on it. I yield my time. Yep. Next speaker. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Avatar Joshi, and I'd like to thank the council members for taking my call. Um, I've lived in Santa Cruz for the past five years, and I've been a homeowner for the past two years, and I'm calling about the uh, use of excessive force by the police department across the nation, and I know that in the city of Santa Cruz that a significant portion of the city's operating budget goes to the police department. The SEPD uses more force per arrest than 23% of other police departments in California, and the excessive use of force has even been used against peaceful protesters, uh, peaceful student protesters on the campus of UC Santa Cruz during the COLA movement, and this is absolutely unacceptable. I would like to urge the council to vote against the proposed budget increases to the sheriff's office and the SVPD, and instead reallocate their current funding towards services that support our community, such as housing and health department, education, parks and rec, and public works. Other cities are adopting this model as they're confronting the disproportionate violence inflicted by the police on uh, black, indigenous, and people of color, and we should not be the last to follow. Um, I'll be following how the council members vote, and um, I intend to use this issue to inform how I vote in the next election. Thank you very much for taking my call. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello. I am also calling to encourage you to put defunding the police on your next agenda or to call a special meeting. Um, I agree with everyone that the way we're treating homeless people in this county is atrocious, and we really should be using money that's currently going to mostly harass homeless people, it feels like, to support them and to address the housing affordability crisis. Thanks, y'all. Hey, next speaker. Hi, my name is Ashley. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 23 years. As the world grapples with tough and necessary decisions about systemic racism, policing, and funding communities, I believe it's far past time Santa Cruz does something in all part of this. Stop sending our police to terrorize other communities. Why is Santa Cruz allowing their cops to go and trample other communities right to the free of speech. We must end these mutual aid agreements. SCCD's budget is going to be more than the economic development, community development, and public works combined. With housing crisis, climate change at our front door, and a pandemic in our hands, we must think progressively and spending money for forward change. I hope that the council takes this to heart 
and will push for official time for a community to express in depth their concerns and their hopes for a future of the city and take a closer look at the proposed increase SBCD's budget and see that if the money would be spent better elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hi, my name is Veronica Varner. I'm frankly appalled by the proposal to allot 28.1% of the budget towards policing. These budget increases are clearly not investing back into our community. The $1 million budget to alleviate homelessness, one of the most pressing issues in Santa Cruz, especially during the time of COVID-19, pales in comparison, as does only eight, an $800,000 budget for Project Room Key in Santa Cruz. There are 1,204 individuals experiencing homelessness with a whopping 78% unsheltered in Santa Cruz with only 150 rooms allotted by Project Room Key. With the city spending $17 million of city resources towards, quote, reacting to the impact of homelessness, it is clear that more policing is not going to fix the issue. We must reallocate funds towards affordable housing, shelters, rehabilitation programs related to drugs or mental illness. The city is currently burning through money, an abusive cycle of arrest and release with its population experiencing homelessness. And the criminalization of this population, break the chain, reallocate this money and invest in bettering our community. Defund the police. Yep. All right, next speaker. Hi, my name is Emery Waddell. Uh, I live in Santa Cruz, California, and I'm also calling to defund the police. Um, you guys have been drilled with uh, all the statistics already. Um, we don't need police in, in schools, and uh, we need to reinvest in our community services. Thank you. Nobles and I have lived in Santa Cruz County for 20 years. I co-own a preschool in Live Oak serving families of children aged two to five years old. We actively practice, practice anti-bias and anti-racist education. We stand with and support Black Lives Matter. We do not shy away from difficult and uncomfortable conversations. We hold ourselves accountable when we mess it up. I would like to see the issues that directly relate to inequity experienced by black, indigenous, and people of color in our community be made a priority by our city government. Have the difficult and uncomfortable conversations. Hold each other accountable when you get it wrong. Hold yourselves accountable to the people who need you most. Thank you for your time and all your work that you're doing. Yep. All right, next speaker. Uh, I think you just Hi, this is, oh, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, this is Lisa Howe. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz. I'm a Santa Cruz resident now. And I would like you to defund the police. I think it would be in the community's best interest to reinvest in housing, mental health services, harm reduction, drug treatment, and and education. So thank you very much. All right, next speaker. Uh, yes, Charles Lee Wood. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I think uh, the, what the police department is doing is absolutely wonderful. I think it should be fully funded. I, I see from what I've seen is a police department that is well organized, knows how to control people, and has very well trained uh, um, officers. So please do not defund any part of the police department at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Um, hi, this is Piper Devella, and I basically just wanted to echo what so many others have said and really urge you guys to consider defunding the police. 
the money spent on the Santa Cruz Police Department could be used so much more effectively on services for housing and education and mental health. Thanks. Bye. Technical difficulty. All right. All right, next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Rachel. I am a Santa Cruz resident, born and raised here. Uh, and I would like to echo the calls to uh, defund the police and invest in. Uh, community programs. I would also like to add that a variety of sociological and criminal, criminological research on the causes of crime has shown that, at least in part, crime occurs in, um, because pockets of concentrated disadvantage deny people opportunities to participate in community, uh, in their greater community, and uh, invest, therefore, investing in community works and programs that center community advocates from within these neighborhoods is a way to lower crime rates, therefore, uh, preventing the need for highly militarized police forces, which in fact incite violence, as we have seen across the country this week. Thank you for taking my call. All right, next speaker. Hey, good uh, evening. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Santiago. As a longtime resident of Santa Cruz, I am calling for an immediate community meeting, or at least for you to add to your agenda the discussion of our current and projected budgets with the intention specifically of reallocating percentages of SCPD's budgets uh, into more community-based resources, including but not limited to families, education, community-based support, community engagement, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, my name is CJ Fagundis, and I was born and have spent most of my life living in Santa Cruz. I would like to join the voices of many who have spoken before me to call for both a special city council meeting agenda item regarding the police budget and particularly defunding the police. I would like to call for the defunding of the Santa Cruz Police Department and the reallocation of those funds to community-based programs that are in high demand, such as housing, mental health, education, harm reduction, addiction services, and many more. Policing these issues has proved, been proven to be ineffective and only hurts our community further. I would also ask that we step away from the practice of mutual aid, which uses taxpayer dollars to enact violence in cities like Oakland against citizens who are using their right to peacefully protest. I would like to also remind each of you that the members of this community will be watching and will hold each of you accountable for the actions you take in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two speakers left. Um, and then we'll likely take a really short break and then um, try to get to our evening item. Okay, so you're on the line. Hello, I'm Karen Leewood, and I do not want to defund the police department. Uh, I moved here in 1970. I've been here for 50 years, and I cannot believe I, I, that I would have to try and protect myself. We, I do not ha own a gun, and people have come in. They've stolen a truck, things like that. Uh, we need to have the police be available if I need them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, you're on the call. Hi, my name is Cameron Bacher. Um, I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I would like to echo the need to defund the police. The police department is built on violence and racism and cannot be reformed. Santa Cruz also has a history of white supremacy, racism, 
and colonialism, and it's time that we make decisions that value anti-racism and the people of this community rather than the police. Please defund SCPD and remove Santa Cruz officers from Oakland immediately. Thank you. Yeah. Right, this is going to be our last caller before our evening item. So you're on the line. You're on the mic, David Doolin. My name is David Doolin. I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I've written with the police a number of times. The way that they interact with the public is compassionate, caring, and yet at the same time protecting of our people. I feel like they should continue with the level of funding that they need to protect the citizens and at the same time act compassionately with, with all of the people that they interact with. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we are going to take a break and reconvene at, uh, let's see, at about 8.33, 8.35. We'll say 8.33, and I'm sure people will be on at 8.35. So we'll try to get our evening items started about 8.35 to give uh, council members another quick break, since we haven't really had many this entire day. So we'll be back at 8.35. Uh, an interim recovery planning and prioritization within the context of the coronavirus pandemic. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff for the council members who brought this item forward, followed by questions for the council from the council. Uh, we will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Laura Smith, Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Are you able to see my screen okay with the PowerPoint? Great. Yes. So um, we are here to discuss a shift on to an interim recovery plan. So the quick topics we'll cover are the convergence of COVID-19 and our existing strategic plan process, uh, a model for discussion and what possible next steps would be with the council. So as we started to merge from the um, beginning of the shelter in place in the middle of March toward the end of April going into May, we began to realize that we were on a little bit of a uh, mental and emotional teeter-totter where on the one hand, we were dealing with all of the reactionary needs we had to do to the shelter in place and the shifting public health orders and having to be responsive as much as possible, ma maintaining nimbleness and decisively acting in order to maintain key services and um, deliver what we needed to to the community. That was offset by this um, definite need to also start looking toward the future and to be very thoughtful and start to do a balanced evaluation of how we would go about recovery. So this is the situation that we found ourselves in and uh, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers and Council Member Watkins separately went to city manager Martine Bernal, uh, basically asking about the recovery part of the teeter totter. So based upon um, that, we had a brief uh, meeting to discuss the convergence of these two aspects of our lives at this point. So we had COVID-19 on one point, which is, as you all know, unpredictable. We have to figure out what works now in relationship to the course of the pandemic and what's going on at the state and county, national and world levels. And then it's always changing and we're constantly redefining our world in order to be able to adjust to the course of the pandemic. This was offset by an existing process that we had already launched in the winter time for strategic planning. But the strategic plan that we launched was broad based. It had a one to three year horizon and it essentially was going to represent the stable foundation on which 
we made um, decisions. So it was going to be the policy direction for, from the council for one to three years and help guide staff operational decisions and priorities and um, ultimately budget decisions as well. So with these two forces in mind, um, they collided and what we hopefully need to do now is balance the teeter-totter of COVID with strategic planning and focus on interim planning informed by the COVID-19 context. So how could we um, explain this in, in a model? So this is a legend to a model I'm going to put up next that helps context of the when, the who, the what, and the how. So the win are related to the phases that we're in related to the pandemic as well as with planning. The who is who works on uh, various aspects of the different phases and what output um, would the council work on in the context of this? And then underlying all of this, how does the council want to go about establishing guiding principles for us to be able to do the what, the who, and at what time? this is the model. When uh, we think about the convergence of COVID-19 and strategic planning and it becoming interim planning, up at the top we have the state and county orders and the other health disaster impacts that the pandemic represents. Those are constant. We're not sure um, how they will develop, what course they'll take, but we know that they're out there. We're not sure when they'll taper uh, we know that we're increasing uh, uh, availability. Um, we're moving from stage three, it looks like a little bit into uh, stage two, a little bit into stage three at this point with the opening of the movie theaters and that sort of thing. And the timeline that that will occur in is uncertain. So we just have that across the top as the, that disaster is going to impact us on an ongoing basis. So phase rise, the win. Uh, we're in the reactionary and responsive phase. We've been taking steps to help residents and businesses and developing support programs. And that's been ongoing since uh, the March timeframe of when we first started sheltering in place. And then we're also at this point now in parallel working in the recovery mode. And in the recovery mode, we are developing new normals. Um, it's normal now to walk into a building and see a uh, fellow community member in with a face covering on. It's normal for us to walk down a sidewalk and look ahead and want to anticipate how we're going to main that, maintain that six foot of social distance with the other person. So during this recovery phase, we've developed these new normals and the new normals will evolve and change as the disease changes course. And then ultimately, ultimately out in um, possibly you know, 15, 18 plus months out, we start to then to consider the bigger picture and the vision and the revisioning of Santa Cruz and how we're going to move forward given the economic, health, social, and other um, impacts that this disease has had on us. So those are the phases that we're in. Um, the model assumes that we're in this reactionary and responsive phase as well as the recovery at this point. So who works on items during these phases? So one of the things that the conversation with the council members and some staff members spoke about is there are existing countywide structures that are in place and your agenda report alludes to those. There are economic councils that are being started by the County of Santa Cruz and we want to leverage those countywide structures and participate in them for the, that bigger picture countywide work. So those have been primarily focused on this recovery and new normal phase. Um, we've obviously been working in reactionary and responsive with um, joining with emergency operations centers but these structures are focused on the recovery and then eventually the revisioning of our area. Also working in these phases, um, economic development and other departments like public works and planning and community development, but primarily economic development has been taking a very um, strategic uh, but, uh, but tactical as well role in developing these resident and business support programs. So they've been very nimble and they've had to be to be able to put together the business 
reopening kits to be able to put together with public works planning and comdev and everybody else the ability to open up different sections of Pacific Avenue. So economic development needs to remain nimble to be able to help lead the reactionary and responsiveness phase as it relates to the specialty business support in this space. Overlapping economic development are citywide teams. And here a possibility for a citywide team that currently is not in place would be an interim planning, an interim recovery plan team consisting of council members. So that could be the mayor and the vice mayor and a council member to be named. And they would um, develop into a interim recovery plan team. And we already have the budget uh, committee that the council formed at the April 14th meeting. And that consists of the mayor and the vice mayor and council member Brown. So the city team here focuses in this recovery mode, helping establish new normals, figuring out financially how we're going to respond to the pandemic, and then hopefully focusing on the interim recovery plan as well. So more specifically, how does council, um, what does council look like in this planning phase? So the possibilities that you could act upon this evening is you could do an immediate prioritization. And the bubbles are kind of proportional to the amount of work. So the, the immediate prioritization, you could look at the backlog of council initiated and assigned items um, that we re-looked at on April the 14th and took action on as far as a restart date and then um, a first return date to council. You could look at those, that immediate prioritization and you can look at the list and decide to take action on some of those um, tonight to be able to say, move this one up, take this one off, move this one lower, et cetera, and so on. So that could be something that you could do. And it really um, impacts this reactionary and responsive and recovery work. The other thing that is probably needed for those items that you aren't able to act on immediately tonight if you do um, item number A, with item number B, you might wish to um, develop a, a council rubric for tactical response because we need something as staff to be able to ping against that has, let's say, you know, X, Y, Z number of criteria that helps us remain nimble and helps us make decisions out there on a day-to-day -day basis. So some of this is recovery, but a lot of it still remains the reactionary and responsive work that we need to do to be able to um, work day to day and take quick action. That is still uh, very much a need for staff and our organization to be able to function that way. So B might be developing a council rubric for tactical response and you could articulate your priorities through criteria that we could then apply to the backlog of lists that is out there. And then um, finally, that council rubric could be part of a bigger effort that you do that is a council interim recovery plan. So that could be item C for you to take action on. So rather than focus on the broader one to three year stabilization strategic plan that we were previously going to do, we would focus on a council interim recovery plan with a horizon of 12 to 18 months. So that could be an example of what you would do for that area. And then ultimately out here, hopefully in the 12 to 15 month time frame, even as late as 18 months from now, as we emerge and we understand what the economy is doing, what the pandemic is doing, how the health is going, how, we're, how the, the situation is going with our community, you could um, shift your attention to a council strategic revisioning process. But this is something that I think is quite a few months out at this point. And what we really need at this point is this interim recovery plan that shifts from bigger picture, one to three year out to a 12 to 18 month horizon offset by the COVID-19 context. And then ultimately, the other thing that the, the group had wanted to put forth are guiding principles of how the council planning and the work group is guided along its path to planning. So responsiveness and nimbleness were critical, creative pursuit of all funding. Those are always continuing to emerge. We get new information at the federal and state levels on a pretty consistent basis. 
We need to be aware of risk and mitigate it where we need to. We need to have community engagement. And underlying all of this is our health and all policies and um, equity, sustainability, and public health. Obviously, equity um, after everything that's been going on with the George Floyd and everything else. Equity is a huge lens through which we need to influence the way that we go about our recovery and, a, and an interim recovery plan. So that's the model. Um, so the sweet spot for council, should you decide to act on this this evening, is possibly considering the list of items and there is a handout in your agenda packet of how you might wish to take any immediate prioritization on the list of items. And then through a council recovery plan committee, you may wish to um, direct staff and or that committee to develop a rubric for tactical response and then also form um, the committee in order to produce an interim recovery plan with an approximate 18 month time horizon. We talked about the underlying principles already and then uh, this just summarizes in your agenda report the possible actions. I know I went through that really quickly, but I also know that you guys are pretty tired at this point. So, um, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins, if there's anything you'd like to add and elaborate on, I would appreciate any feedback. Thank you for that presentation. No, I think it's, you know, just wanted to make sure the public is aware that um, we, Council Member Watkins, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, myself, and I'm sure the other council members as well, we were all really concerned with, you know, how the community is going to recover from COVID-19. And so uh, I think we were, you know, a few months ago really trying to be proactive um, with regards to understanding what can a recovery process look like. And rather than thinking about some of the one to three year out priorities, given that we're in such a time of uncertainty, that it was really important that we focus in on the impact of COVID-19 on our community and people's ability to gather and then kind of come up with a plan that would really help our community recover from this. So thanks for putting that together. And I'll turn to my colleagues to see if they have any uh, other comments or questions. So Vice Mayor Myers. <clears throat> I think you're muted, Donna. All right. Yeah, thank you um, to the staff and to um, uh, Mayor Cummings and uh, former Mayor Watkins. Um, yeah, I mean, we all came kind of came at this from slightly different perspectives, and I thank um, City Manager Martin Bernal to kind of pull us together. Um, and you know, I think. You know, my, my day to day experience um, and, 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 and Mayor Cummings has been much more intense than mine, but this is a, this is a very uh, evolving and changing situation almost on a daily basis. And I've watched our staff literally um, both do the legal analysis as well as, um, you know, respond to the governor's orders, orders from our health officer. Um, and then, you know, be able to communicate back out to our community in a way that's meaningful. And um, that's, that's just been a constant for them, really, for the last four and a half months. And um, then on the other side, you know, when I do see people or people contact me, you know, and there's just a lot of concern. There's a lot of families that are struggling because schools are closed. Um, there's a lot of teachers who have been put into situations where they're teaching kids online. Um, you know, the level of uh, instability and just sort of the, the place where people are at is, is um, extreme. And, um, of course, we have all of our business owners who are also trying to forecast their future and take risk in terms of, you know, what should they do with their businesses. So um, the magnitude of this is, is quite large. And um, uh, we, as we all discussed um, this, approach in a meeting in May, in early May, um, I really thought that the former mayor and current mayor uh, and myself made a good team in terms of really having that perspective of coming into this 
sort of from, um, uh, you know, last year where we worked on important policy um, as well as um, learn more and more about uh, certain issues such as homelessness and the approaches to that that we could take over time. Um, so um, I'm really happy that we were able to bring this together. I appreciate Laura's work. Um, she really was the one that put lots of ideas into an actual document that we could all respond to. So I really appreciate her work. And I also just appreciate her work in really thinking, having us think as a model for a model on how we would move through these stages. Um, I think this is an important pivot away from our traditional strategic plan effort. And um, I look forward to um, continuing to work um, with the mayor and, and hopefully with um, uh, you know, a, a council member and moving this important work uh, forward. And um, just happy to have the conversation with my colleagues tonight. So thanks. Hey, uh, council member Watkins. I don't know if I have much more to add um, than what was previously said, other than um, I just also thank Martine for bringing us all together and recognizing that we have a shared interest in how we could collaborate in that way. Um, definitely kudos to Laura for helping us with a big brain dump and putting that into a logical process for us to follow. Um, and then obviously the work that's been happening with the mayor and vice mayor and, and so many of our colleagues in the city as well in terms of just supporting our community at this really tough time. Um, the only thing I guess I could add, which has um, been highlighted, is just how uh, unique this opportunity is to really um, think about how we want to recover and how to see the convergence between uh, the policy direction we took last year with health and all policies or early this year with health and all policies as we embed these principles into, into our recovery efforts and align the um, the prior directions uh, to meet sort of and to, uh, to um, synergize with what I think we move forward as well. So um, with that, I uh, look forward to the conversation and, um, and, and a hopeful uh, we can recover in a really, a really um, powerful way for our community. Thank you. Council Member Golder. Unmute there now. Right now. Um, I just want to thank everybody that worked on this. Thank you very much. I'm sure it was a lot of thought and just kind of unprecedented decision making um, to bring this to you. And um, I think moving forward, I don't know if there's a plan, but obviously I trust the mayor and the vice mayor to choose a council person. But I think um, having Martine would be an asset seeing that she was the mayor. Um, in the previous year, and I just think the three of you worked really well on this, and so um, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? Okay, so hearing none, I'll turn it over to the public for public comment. So if you would like to comment on this item, uh, please call in now and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, you'll have up to two minutes uh, once you've been called upon to uh, comment on this item. So we'll start with the first caller. Hello. You're on the line. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Excellent. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I had written several times asking for four minutes to comment on this. Uh, is that going to be possible? I will. Uh, allow you four minutes to comment on this. We have a, we've been getting inundated with uh, emails over the past few days, and so it might have gotten buried in the hundreds of emails that we've received. So I'll go ahead and give you. Justin, thank you so much. Okay, so my name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm actually a prolific writer. I grew up running around the Stanford Hospital and engaging with dozens of PhD fellows. So a friend from Colorado that I drove there a couple weeks ago, she sent me this picture and I would really like to have it validated, but I wanna read this as a response to this and some other issues. In 2019, medical malpractice killed 400,000. Police killed 34 unarmed. You are 12,000 times more likely to be killed by a doctor than a police officer. Stop the anti-police bias. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk to Andy Mills personally about some other suggestions. Let me find what I'm going to read. Give me a moment, please. 
And I posted this this morning and I sent it to the city. And I did get one reply back and here it is. So let me put on my reading glasses. Published this this morning at what happened? I'm sorry. I totally it jumps in the video. Let's go back. Uh, pardon me for a second. There it is. Okay. I believe I said this before. The strategy here for myself as the same, the strategy here for myself is the same as all four 104 nuclear reactors in the United States melting down at the same time. Yes, this is my observation about contact tracing. Hold on. Okay. And the Santa Cruz County health officials provided about 10% of this information at a public hearing May 29th, 2020. I'm going to pause you real quick because this item is on recovery planning, and so I'm just going to ask as a reminder to the police um, if we can stay on topic because I'm not sure if you're talking about COVID-19, but the topic right now is our recovery planning. Well, okay. Um, the contact tracing is part of the COVID-19, and every other aspect of what I'm going to discuss is part of the COVID-19. Um, so I'm okay if you don't allow me to share what I want to share, and I'll just be done. Um, or I can continue reading what I sent to the city this morning. If it's related to the recovery plan, which is what is before us, um, that is, then you can continue. Um, you know, Justin, I speak about 17 languages that are scientific that most people have not talked about today at all during the six hours I was listening to this. So I'm not quite sure what to say. I don't really want to rock the boat more than I actually already do. And so I suppose at this point, I'll, I'll bring up my discussions directly with Mr. Mills because we've talked before and we've had great conversations and uh it is part of the recovery plan so i'll leave it at that justin okay thank you very much okay thank you yes next speaker you're on the line oh hello hi this is wendy melrose and i'm a lifelong resident of santa cruz as well as a small business owner and haven't haven't had a house that's been burglarized three times I'm in just such utter shock and belief that this is happening. Officer, Mill and his team, Officer Mills and his team have been nothing but genuinely concerned for all of our citizens. They have been present. Excuse me. I need to pause what? you for a this, The item that we're discussing is the recovery plan. Oh. So if Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I must have got in the wrong thing. I was just waiting for the last time. So you tell me what you want me to do. Yeah, unfortunately, um, oral communications ended, and now we're on to public comment oh. for number for the okay. last item. Okay. Well, Thanks. okay. We'll see. Bye. 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 All right. Next speaker. This is on our agenda, our evening item, which is on a recovery plan. You have two minutes. Thank you. This is Glenn Schaller. I work at the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. AFL-CIO, um, as you all know, we have over 80 unions. We have over 38,000 working families. Um, it's very exciting is that the city is going to be shifting on um, the planning process to a recovery plan. It's also very exciting that there's been discussion already to include a community workforce agreement in the recovery plan. Um, I look forward to the possibility that um, there could be more opportunities for local employment. Um, as you all know, you can create local jobs, but it's best when we create local employment for folks who already live here. Um, it will be great to have more um, opportunities to hire local apprentices. Um, and as you know, um, the Community Workforce Agreement or Project Labor Agreement um, in the past has often led to um, cost savings and early completion of projects. And of course, the Public Safety Center in Live Oak, the Watsonville um, Ordinance that's been in existence for a while, these have been great models, um, and I look forward to labor and the city working forward to make sure that the recovery plan includes not only the community workforce agreement, but other opportunities to help um, build our local economy and make sure that it's more equitable as we come out of this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Uh, yeah, hi, Justin and Honorable Mayor and Council members of uh, Santa Cruz City, 
Manny Pinero, CEO of Monterey, Santa Cruz County Building Construction Trades Plan. Good evening, letting me have the opportunity to speak. In your recovery plan, I'll just uh, reiterate what Glenn Schaller had said. This is important that we move forward and pass on the community workforce agreement. Let's start talking. Let's bring jobs back here, not only for those who live here in Santa Cruz County, but those who want to stay and continue to live here and earn a livable union wage with great benefits. It would be ideal for us to start talking and moving forward so we can create jobs for these young people to give them a hope and a future to stay in Santa Cruz County. And I thank you for your time and can't wait for a phone call soon. Have a nice evening. Yeah. Hey, next speaker, you're on the line. Okay, this is Gareth Phillip. Hey, you say, quote, can cause severe disease and death throughout age groups, unquote, which is, of course, highly misleading because death is relatively rare among the healthy young population, which is about two-thirds of the people. You say, quote, has literally changed our entire way of life for the foreseeable future, unquote, but that is due more to the government's kill switch, blinders on approach, that it had understandably taken at the beginning, but is no longer just Justifiable as the facts have become known than the COVID danger now. Too bad the government's actions have and will continue to cause so many bankruptcies, destroyed the social fabric, destroyed the monetary system, made a mockery out of debt, and will not save lives in the long run and can easily be much worse than even doing nothing. Isn't it ironic we are now told we need 18 months at least recovery from the government's COVID response actions as if it was just another agenda item, take notes, hold meetings, never mind individual rights, lives, delayed health care, declare some people essential, not others. Uh, what the public thinks doesn't matter. As if we even have that long as the social fabric around us dissolves into revolution. Those who take orders are equally to blame as those who give them. They must be held accountable. Okay, I don't really care. I have to say, all those clueless moron leftists who called in earlier and don't know who the bad guys are, who wanted to defund the police department better than and they had better be packing because that is the alternative. I had more, but bye. Yeah. If there's anyone else who'd like to comment on this item, now is the time. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand to comment on our evening agenda item, which is interim recovery planning and prioritization within the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who'd like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. Council Member Brown. Hi, thank you. Um, so I first wanted to say uh, that I really appreciate all of the thought and work that's gone into bringing us uh, this proposal, and I fully support uh, a council uh, member a committee uh, being established to um, to work on this with staff directly and deliberatively. So I, I really do appreciate all the work that's gone into it, and I, I recognize that this is a very fluid situation. And, um, and I just appreciate the efforts of everybody to try to respond accordingly and ensure that we, um, you know, do what we can to get our community um, kind of back up and running and the economy and, um, you know, uh, people who depend on uh, those jobs for their livelihoods. So uh, with that, I do want to say um, that I also support, and I supported back in, uh, when we discussed this in April, the um, kind of shifting of some of the priorities that had been established by the council, um, given that some of them are, um, they're not super time sensitive. They are issues that we want to get around to, I know. Um, so I'd like to actually um, just take this opportunity to make a motion that we um, kind of, I mean, I won't repeat it all, but that we, uh, I'd like to move the direction from uh, the council, council members and staff to 
um, move ahead as discussed in the stat in the agenda report. Um, and then with respect to item number four, um, so it would be you know all not one through three as stated in the um, the staff report or the sorry the agenda report. Um, with the exception uh, on number four in, of um, building back in a, sh a shorter turnaround time on the community workforce agreement item. I, I do not uh, suspect that anybody wants to get into uh, you know, a discussion about how we play, prioritize and place all of these items um, you know, tonight. And I think that the committee would be the best uh, to uh, best uh, equipped to deal with that and come back to us. But I do think that um, this is really important and it's an important uh, element to our, you know, our revitalization of our economy and our community. Uh, the, the, the work that we need to do, uh, these community workforce agreements have been demonstrated to have a really positive effect in the community. Um, and uh, I won't uh, reiterate what um, the MBCLC, the Building Trades and Monterey Bay Labor Council uh, representative said just now, but we also, I will just say, we also heard from Sheriff Hart that uh, the sheriff's station built with a, a community workforce agreement in place came in um, on time and under budget. And uh, we heard from uh, council member and former mayor Aurelio Gonzalez from Watsonville that it's been a really positive experience for the city of Watsonville. I think there is data to show that um, these, these, can, these agreements can be really important to um, you know, how we move forward with rebuilding. So, and we do have a lot of work that is coming our way in terms of new development projects, uh, residential, commercial, mixed use, you know, public and private. So I would like to um, move that, uh, that item back up. I think it was suggested that it would come back to us in October, and I would like that to come back at the second meeting in August, and I don't have that, that date in front of me. Um, so I would, make, I would move the, the agenda report uh, recommendations with that uh, addition. I'll second that. Um, and <clears throat> I'll just say that um, kind of coming into this year, I know towards the end of last year, this was something that came up and uh, there were a lot of items that were getting put on the agenda. We were having really long meetings, but this was something that um, has been a priority of mine um, ever since I sat down and talked with the Building Trades Council last year. I've talked with unions and other cities, people who I know who work in trades, who work with project labor agreements and community workforce agreements, and all of them overwhelmingly were saying how good they are. And I think it's important that as we're moving forward, um, we have a lot of projects that are coming. We have our library, we have our wharf, um, and so many other uh, critical infrastructure projects where these uh, types of agreements could be really important and useful for our community. A lot of what um, these are intended for is not to just increase jobs, but to increase local employment. So really putting a lot of the youth in our community, having a pipeline for youth into the trades uh, so that they can have high paying, good quality local jobs. And as Councilmember Brown mentioned, uh, a project labor agreement was used for the construction of uh, the sheriff's and coroner's county office. And in the letter uh, that, that Sheriff Hart wrote, one of the things that he said was, I would consider the PLA an asset to the project because it put to work local skilled, knowledgeable craftsmen and their apprentices. The use of apprentices on a project of this scale is important because it cultivates and trains tomorrow's workers, which is a forethought I appreciate. I would gladly consider using PLAs on future projects in the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office constructs and additionally recommend PLA to other awarding bodies with the Monterey Santa Cruz Building and Construction Trade Council. So here is one of our you know, local leaders who's also you know, highlighting how good this PLA was in the construction of our Santa Cruz County Sheriff's and uh, Coroner's Office. And I think that you know, we have an example of how this can be effective and useful in our community. And I think that we should make this a priority given that we want to um, have good employment coming out of this and, and also um, pipelines for um, young people to get into a high paying career path. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. 
Yeah, um, I didn't know if um, Council Member Brown was looking for a section a second to that motion. I don't know if we want to, if you want to, um, but I appreciate the motion. Um, and um, certainly I think that the reprioritization is an important step in this process. Um, to the extent that we can, I'd like to also um, see that the some of the ordinance work um, might potentially be on the same timeline as well. Um, and so I'd like to see that, um, possibly see that those two things could go concurrent with one another. Um, I agree that uh, employment strategies moving ahead is gonna be really important. Um, and I'm, I'm supportive of, of looking at the project labor agreement this summer. Um, I think there's also a lot of other sectors that we will want to communicate with um, as well. So while this is an important piece, uh, construction often uh, times with, uh, with the length of time to get approvals and all the other things, um, I think it's important to build a, a strategy on, around that that uh, fits with the current um, stream of projects that we're working on. I know the water department um, has, been, has been doing a lot of uh, very, uh, you know, expensive projects, well, uh, well researched and well designed projects. So there is opportunity there. I think some of our existing contracts, um, you know, support some of these principles as well. Um, so I, I'm happy to have that discussion. I think the more broadly, though, um, you know, we have a labor force that has been decimated by this um, by this COVID-19 because. Uh, much of our economy is based on tourists and, and they're not here anymore. And uh, so I think uh, looking at the committee's work in that context of, of broader, um, broader populations that we need to be rethinking uh, and really almost rethinking about who we are as a city and what are we doing to attract better paying jobs beyond the immediate construction related things that we may be supporting. So looking at healthcare, looking at wellness, looking at a lot of uh, innovative things that we as a community have an opportunity to explore through this process. So um, I'd like to see the ordinances um, scheduled together. Um, looks like one is scheduled for June, the other is for July. Maybe we can combine those into June. I'd like some feedback from the staff on that. Um, and I think moving ahead with the with the immediate needs around both job uh, job creation consideration uh, is also really important. So um, we'll see. Uh, I, I think those are my comments for now, and I'll look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Councilmember Matthews, you are muted. Um, sorry, Mayor Cummings. Were those friendly amendments or not? No, that was I second the motion. Just comment. Right, um, but I'm Council Member or Vice Mayor Myers was talking about bringing. They're just comments, bringing ordinances back at the same time, and that's not a friendly amendment. Those are comments for now. Um, I'm. I don't know that the the motion has been seconded. So sorry. Uh, I seconded the motion, but I will say oh, that. You did. Yeah, but um, Bonnie, I think that. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers had mentioned wanting to hear comments from staff on those timelines. So maybe after Council Member Matthews, we can hear from staff on the timing of these ordinances and kind of what's the potential for aligning them or maybe a little bit more background as to why we kind of staggered. I'm sorry, I didn't realize, I didn't realize Mayor, that you, would, that you had seconded. I would put my uh, ordinance um, request in it as a friendly amendment or I'm not sure the process on how we want to go through the list. So. I'll, I'll let my colleagues talk now. I had expected there would be a little more discussion before jumping right into a motion. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit disappointing. Um, I, one of the things I would like to see and uh, that I don't see listed here is, um, and maybe it's included in what you're talking about, mm -hmm. this is an economic recovery endeavor, but uh, a really consolidated um, focus on, on downtown recovery because that has so much wrapped into it in terms of getting our retail and the, the economic hub uh, revitalized downtown and all the big construction projects that are coming, the, the um, various housing projects and these projects. 
um, lining up there. Um, so it seems to me that that takes some special endeavor. There was some of that going into effect with the um, EBIT endeavor, which um, which really got um, just knocked out of the park by the um, the COVID um, shutdown. But I I would like to see um, opinion of others. Uh, how they see the, the focus on what has to happen downtown um, in comparison. It's not listed as a line item here, nor is the, is the Economic Recovery Committee listed as a line item. We have so much right now on the plate of our Economic Development Department. Um, I am concerned about capacity. Um, thoughts that occurred to me just looking over this list, um, I do see here the, the La Viega Golf Course. It's not clear to me that that's a work item still. Um, I know there were some questions raised in the past. It seemed to me that they were more or less answered. So I'd be curious to know what other people feel on that. I don't know if uh, I don't see uh, Tony on here. So maybe Martini can say. Um, to my mind, that appeared to be uh, on the way to um, uh, a, a good plan and, and being carried out. I am reluctant to see the project labor agreement um, um, land to us on August. In August, uh, mm -hmm. when we will be uh, quiet in the month of July. It seems, from what I know, which, you know, this is not my field, admittedly, but um, uh, talking to both our staff and others, it seems there are many variations of this. Some of them are a PLA for a specific project. Some are a PLA ordinance that um, are uh, mandatory for everything we do. So I think uh, in order to actually benefit our community, it's worth spending some time to investigate and see what are the variations, where can we have the, the uh, most productive effect. And so I would like to make sure that there's adequate time uh, with everything else going on to engage a variety of opinions and stakeholders. When it came to us before, uh, it was very sudden and I think suffered from the fact that there hadn't been a very full uh, exploration of it. So uh, I am not comfortable with um, uh, bumping that up to um, uh, the August date. I'd much prefer we take the time August through October to really um, do a good job on that and not rush it. Um, I would also personally like to see uh, the quality of life ordinances um, come forward. Uh, I'd like to see the uh, sidewalk bending. Um, uh, I know we have an executive order on that right now, but uh, at some point the uh, COVID restrictions will go away. The current executive order is tied to the COVID restrictions. And so I'd like to see us working on something um, that will uh, carry over once those those go away. So um, those are really some of some of the issues that are um, for me personally priority. So if, I, I don't know how to resolve this with the motion on the floor. My understanding is that um, there's and uh, also like my other colleagues in China, but my understanding is that. There are a number of items that, you know, we're going to try to form this economic recovery committee, and I think that it's kind of that committee's job to identify and maybe take in feedback from council members on kind of what are some of the different things that we should be considering as it relates to uh, economic recovery. So, um, you know, the downtown recovery, I could see that being a piece of it. Um, economic recovery in, in different sectors, so which sectors are getting it? Get harder than others, and is there a need to focus? Is there an opportunity for us to uh, think about whether there are new sectors we need to um, really start emphasizing on emphasizing and trying to either attract the community or just support locally? But my understanding as well is that the council has provided some direction on the list that is before, that is in front of us, and that um, in order to because we've pushed those off um, due to COVID-19, you know, understanding. It, which of these items, since there's already been direction, do we want to see either timelines get extended or we make sure that we're prioritizing? And that's why it seems like there's some that have adjusted uh, timelines and others. Mm -hmm. I also have to point out there are items on here that it seems like we've already, for example, today, 
uh, cannabis, the licensing, the licenses, that's pretty much taken care of. Um, events and on-site consumption, I mean, we could continue moving forward with that, but that could also get put off given that, for example, events, we're not anticipating having large gatherings anytime soon. On-site consumption, and although it's um, something that I'm interested in, and I think other folks have mentioned being interested in today, uh, the industry hasn't really been focusing on that. So, for example, that's another item where we could push that off to make some space for um, other items that might be related to planning and community development. Um, so, and then as and then it seems like there might be some items that we want to shift the timeline so that they overlap more accordingly. So, as, as Mayor Myers mentioned, the quality of life, surveillance, camping. Do we want to shift those timelines? So that they all are coming back at the same time. So uh, I don't think that there's, I don't think that the um, committee would be restricted from taking in input and putting other priority items uh, before the council and into that recovery plan. But I think it's a, a both uh, and situation where we need to get that committee so that there's uh, forms that they're kind of thinking and bringing forward what would really help with recovery and then resolve the items that were already acted on in the past. Uh, Council Member Brown. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, um, well, my comment was really a response to the concerns raised by um, Council Member Matthews, I uh, I totally hear what you're saying about the you know concern about displacing uh, you know revitalization efforts and all of the other work that needs to be done in other sectors sectors of our economy. And so my intention here was not to suggest that those would be uh, delayed in favor of this. I think, um, as Mayor Cummings suggested, it for me this is a both and. And I would just remind my colleagues that, you know, back in January when we um, moved to provide this direction that uh, we, we considered that this come back to us and we consider it, you know, there was a lot of discussion about, um, you know, how to, how to actually have that conversation uh, with the with stake, community stakeholders and um, perhaps kind of cut through some of the complexity and challenges that we kind of think we see before us on this. You know, I mean, the, there are, you know, model ordinances that we can look at. There is data about the experiences of our, um, you know, other local jurisdictions in, you know, our neighbors and, um, and then beyond as well. So uh, to me, it just seems like, you know, that we, ha you know, at least uh, beginning to reach out to those stakeholders and have the conversation could happen. It hasn't happened. The direction was in January prior to the, the COVID crisis. And I, I say that with no judgment about it not having happened yet. I'm just saying this was clearly a priority. And I don't, I, I, you know, I think that we, we ought to, um, you know, move forward with that. If it take, ends up taking longer, it ends up taking longer. But if we just wait until October, um, it's really going to take a lot longer. So um, that's, you know, what I would respond to the question about how to reconcile the this motion. I mean, I'm open to uh, also indicating support for prioritizing some of these other issues, but I, I'm not willing to, um, you know, take that out of my motion because that was essentially why I made the motion, right? So, thank you. Also, remember Watkins and then Golder. Um, thank you, everybody, and, and thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I guess I, you know, I, I guess I'll try to reserve some of my comments, but I, I do know um, that it'd be helpful to hear from some of the staff as to where their thoughts are on some of the feasibility of timelines. And then just sort of a disclaimer that, you know, at the kind of the onset of the items within the attachment, it says sort of, look, you know, we recognize that this is a fluid situation and we're going to need to be flexible. So we'll do the best we can to meet some of these um, expected and ideal timelines. But um, some of these things might take a shift in a different direction given sort of the current circumstances. So 
just I think that we kind of can hold space for that to build. Okay. And for Keen or somebody else wants to weigh in as the staff perspective or oh, sure. or oh, sure. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, a couple of uh, points to clarify. So, the uh, the list that you that you see, one of the things that, that staff did was look at it and make some adjustments based on just what has what has changed in, in the last uh, few months. And so that is the red that you see on on the chart there. Um, and so again, that reflects some changes that occurred since the last since council last looked at this and, and approved this. Um, and so those are the, the staff recommendations. Uh, and there have also been some other uh, uh, adjustments that I want to highlight uh, and, and feedback. So with respect to the golf course and the downturn recovery, I think I would say that those really belong in the, uh, particularly because of the golf course and how it's been impacted by the, the pandemic uh, and, the, and the budget uh, con uh, impacts, that those belong probably in uh, the Group B that uh, Laura highlighted. Uh, which is the, the, the COVID, um, the more midterm uh, responses. Um, and certainly the golf course is also tied into the budget discussions. Uh, so I think those were those would, would, would go. Um, and then the other one that uh, has become uh, uh, more urgent also relates to some, some, some aspects of the quality of life ordinances. And that is, uh, revolves around the uh, 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 Homelessness COVID response, and that uh, that has really become a major initiative. Uh, as there is a concern that we will have a uh, uh, spread of, of, the, of the virus in the homeless population, which we want to uh, not have in the void. And, and we do have some major uh, encampments uh, in in the city that uh, we need, will need to be uh, addressed in terms of uh, health and health and safety and, and uh, pandemic spread. Um, and so, uh, as a result of that, uh, obviously a big part of this has been the county uh, really uh, doing a lot more to provide shelter capacity uh, and also receiving uh, additional funding uh, for that purpose. And so they're, they're standing up a number of facilities to do that uh, and uh, plan to do more. And in, in, in that respect, we need tools to be able to manage the situation. Uh, and some of the quality of life ordinances would assist with that, along with the additional shelter capacity and the contingency planning around uh, providing you know, hotel space and all the work that's being done uh, to provide services for the homeless individuals. Um, and so uh, those are the, I think, the main ones that I would highlight uh, as far as uh, uh, some of the items that have shifted and some clarification. Council Member Kohler. Can you guys hear me with these headphones on? Yes. Okay, so I think I'm gonna echo kind of what uh, Martine Bernal and what Cynthia Matthews said, and that given um, the circumstances around COVID, I think it's really important to reach out and uh, collaborate with the county in our efforts to house the unsheltered population, especially those that are up in um, like, you know, along the Poganip area, I was up there hiking today and one of the parks workers ran into me that I'd seen before and he said the population is probably close to a thousand people between Golf Club Drive, Sycamore Grove and the railroad tracks. And so I think we really need to focus on our efforts on outreach and case management. And I think um, the impacts of homelessness are unfairly felt here in the city. And I think we need to really focus on getting some um, substantial housing in other areas of the county, especially looking forward um, towards the winter when the weather's gonna get worse and all likelihood that we're gonna have a second outbreak, it could be worse. And I think just um, with the unsheltered population, it could be disproportionately affected if we're not um, consciously looking forward and making plans for that. And so, um, I think just focusing on that would be huge for me. And the other thing is, as things are opening up, um, the, it seems kind of goofy and irrelevant, but the, the, um, the uh, sidewalk bending, and yes, I am the person that will buy a hot dog off the street, but like given the circumstances, I think it might be something we might need to focus on right now. So those are, you know, just because of the circumstances, things I think are really important. Thank you.
muted. Sorry, Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, it seems like the prioritization list might be a slightly different, um, not as different, but it's, it's, it's part of the process, but I'm wondering if, if, if we could entertain, um, if the motion maker could inter would entertain maybe separating, separating out items one, two, and three from the motion and we could take a vote on that. Um, I'm, I mean, that's really procedural in terms of accepting the report formalizing the shift to from the strategic plan and then establishing the committee. Um, I'm wondering if the motion maker would be willing to do that. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we could break that into a separate motion and um, if the motion maker would consider um, the nomination of uh, council member Watkins to be part of the committee under number three for that and maybe we can vote. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, sh sure. Uh, yeah, I kind of assume that uh, that would be the direction the mayor would go in and we usually have, you know, the mayor makes those appointments, but if you want to include it in the motion here, but yeah, sure. Okay. I, I mean, I, I would, I'm, supporting uh, council member Watkins participating in this as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so okay. if, just, for, just for clarification purposes, are we, Don, with the intention of that to separate items one, two, three, and four from one another, or to separate one, two, and three from four? Uh, the latter. One, let's go ahead and kind of do the procedural process of one to three, you know, one through three, one, two, and three, and sort of, and then I think, um, and then maybe we can revisit um, some some ideas on how to how to affect the prioritization piece. And But if we could get one through three done, I think that might be helpful. Okay. Um, Council Member Matthews and then Watkins. Well, I'd be happy to vote on one through three now. I think that's team and we could do that and then focus on the priorities and as we've talked there are things that I mean certainly uh, very high on the list is the coordination with the county on uh, homeless um, uh, services and programs both during the COVID and post-COVID period so I mean that's not even on the list here and that's, that's going to be huge so um, it does seem like we need some further discussion on this list. Um, uh, well, I think maybe that would be the first. I, I have some other comments on the priorities, but maybe we should just first dispatch number one through three. Okay. If there's, if there's, is there anyone opposed to us um, voting on items one, two, and three? If so, please uh, let me know right now. Or forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Bonnie, I guess we'll go ahead and take action on items one, two, and three. As a, as a, as a real. Councilmember Byers is absent. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Brown? You're muted. Who is? Andy. Andy, we couldn't hear you. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Aye. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I heard myself. <laughs> Golder? Aye. Uh, Watkins? <laughs> Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And just, uh, I guess, um, can we just make sure that the motion captures the nomination of, uh, of Council yeah. Member Watkins? Yes, got it. Aye. I yes. heard myself too. <laughs> and Mayor Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Mayor, if I may, I just wanted to say thank you for the support of the council to serve on this committee, and I really look forward to um, working with both you and the vice mayor and getting input from the community and our colleagues to really have an informed and thoughtful recovery plan. So thank you for that ad. Uh, Council Member Matthews, or um, City Manager Martin Bernal, do you have a... You oh, to... I'm sorry, I want to comment after you take the vote on one, two, three, sorry. Okay. I just want to find additional clarification, but after you're done. Okay. Oh, you can find out, I think we're done with the vote, so. Uh, oh, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, so just I just wanted to clarify with respect to the uh, question of the um, of the homelessness uh, uh, response. Um, 
again, just to clarify that the county is taking the lead on providing the sheltering. Um, they, they've got the, the uh, DOC set up for that, the infrastructure and the funding to do that, and, and there are plans in the works to do that. And obviously they work closely with us and our staff, uh, and they're looking at facilities uh, you know, throughout the county to be able to do that. However, uh, what we need uh, on our end, and uh, the chief is here also to answer questions if you need that, is we need to have tools available to us because the reality of the situation is that there will be individuals that cho will choose not to avail themselves of the shelter services. And what we want is to have tools to not let uh, allow uh, encampments to, to reform and redevelop. And so we want to have some tools to be able to manage uh, that situation. Again, to be able to, uh, uh, to minimize impacts, particularly health and safety impacts. And so uh, that is why uh, the, uh, some of the aspects of the quality of life ordinances uh, are important in order to really manage the, the homelessness response uh, during uh, this time, particularly as we're looking at, um, as Councilmember Colder mentioned, some fairly large encampments in the Poconip and other areas of the city that we're going to have to deal with because of fire danger or other issues, and we need to just have the tools to be able to, to manage that situation inappropriately and safely um, and reasonably. And so that's that's the rationale for that. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Matthews, and then I have a comment that I'd like to make. Thank you. Do you then envision? I see on the um, grid that we have been given, it shows the quality of life ordinances. Um, begun in July, I guess that's the staff work begins in July and comes up in September, but the camping ordinance, you have the uh, work beginning in June and coming to us in August, yet you've talked about those coming forward at the same time. What what timeline do you envision going what, forward? What, what we would recommend is that uh, you direct us to uh, look at the various aspects of the camping ordinance and the quality of life ordinances that will assist with addressing these uh, 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 potentially uh, difficult situations are going to be facing here in the next few months and bring those back uh, really as soon as possible so if we can bring them back uh, in uh, uh, I guess it would be it'd have to be August at the earliest uh, that, that would be helpful again we want we want to uh, try to get ahead of it before the, the fire season starts and also so we can work with the, with the county on making preparations and contingency plans for dealing with those situations. Okay. So that would move, could the um, quality of life. Oh. So that would start now and then uh, come back in August. August, yeah. Uh, Councilor Matthews, do you have any other comments? Well, I guess the other one. So um, I, I kind of agree with your comments earlier. I think we've kind of spent a lot of time on cannabis. Could we just like, Hunt on the uh, that other stuff till just some future time TBD. I mean, you know, we probably all agree on that one. And um, just looking down this list, uh, it was it didn't have a date attached to it, but the river coordinator. I mean, from what I've heard, talking with various staff, it's never been filled. It's kind of been hanging out there in space. No one really knows what to do with it. Um, do we need to keep that on the list? Is that a priority? Um, in my mind, probably not. Um, and I said I would like to see the sidewalk bending. Um, um, Tony, maybe I asked you. Um, it had it coming to us in June. <laughs> and I understand there's the executive order, but I would like to see something more long term. So. What, what can you do? Yeah, we, have, we have drafted an ordinance that's been circulated. And, uh, you know, just quite frankly, the, um, the COVID-19 crisis and, and the response there to has sort of uh, interrupted our, our staff level discussion of that. So there's a draft ordinance and, in fact, just a gender report and an ordinance that could be placed on any an agenda at any time. Um, but given the complexity of the issue, and by complexity, I mean the constraints that were under uh, under the new state law, SB 946, and the very 
um, legitimate concerns that that the impact of, of the law has on our brick and mortar sales tax paying uh, local businesses <clears throat> and and the legitimate legislative intent behind the adoption of SB 946 uh, has has complicated that and so um, so it's so it's a complicated discussion and and um, I, I don't think we completely exhausted the discussion at the staff level. So, so from my perspective, we could put an ordinance on your agenda for this for the 23rd, but I don't know that that would be the best um, route to go because um, the, the discussion that we intended to have before COVID-19, we really haven't, we really haven't had it. I, maybe I need to talk to you offline, but... Um... Uh, Councilmember Brown. Sorry, that was a that was a mistake. I didn't I mean somehow it happened. Sorry. Councilmember Golder. I was just gonna suggest that I think all of us have kind of laid forth what we think are priorities, and there's no more than about four of them that I think that we all are kind of on the same page with. And so I was wondering if I could make a suggestion that we leave it to the committee to decide when they would fall in priority. I mean, I think there's, I don't know, 12 or 13 here and there's four that are bubbling to the top. You guys can figure it out amongst yourselves the order in which those are presented. Councilmember Brown. Oh, sorry, actually Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilmember Brown. Uh yeah, I was just gonna. Um, I was just gonna. Um, yeah, I, I, I similarly was hearing um, uh, kind of some common, some common ones that are bubbling to the top, and I'm wondering if um, if I potentially could just make a motion to at least capture some of the conversation. But I, I, I'm happy to um, listen. Or happy to have Councilmember Brown. Uh, Make her comments if needed. If if a you know, if, but I'm happy to do a motion. I think I think we're getting close, and I think we could get it done and call it a night very soon. I'll just remind Councilmember, there's still a motion on the floor as it relates to um, item number okay. four because right. we flipped that last the previous motion. So so maybe I'll make make a motion. I'll go. Okay, should we vote on the first motion then? Yes, yeah, we can. And um, okay. Councilmember Brown, you had your hand up, and so does Councilmember Watkins. Well, yeah, I was just going to say there's a motion on the floor, and I'm not going to withdraw it. So I appreciate uh, Vice Mayor Myers your uh, your point, and I agree. Um, but I do want to, um, you know, vote on the motion that's on the floor. I agree to split it, and it's the number four is still there. Uh, Councilmember Watkins and then Matthews. Um, thank you, uh, Councilmember Brown. My understanding is that I think, if, and maybe you could restate the motion, but it's essentially to move forward with number four um, as uh, written, but when thinking about how to um, look at the timeline, that the PLAs would uh, kind of be ex accelerated with the original timeline, but also with sort of a, you know, understanding that there could be something that could hinder that progress, as with any of the other items. Is that accurate or no? Um, yeah, no, my, uh, well, I mean, I guess it is, but the motion is pretty clear. The motion is to uh, restore the original timeline agreed to in April for project labor agreements. I think with all of this, we, I mean, we, everybody understands that this is a fluid situation, another emergency may arise, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there's nothing that is, you know, locking us in to that timeline. It's simply a matter of saying, this is a priority. This was the, the timeline we agreed to in April, everybody agreed to, and I'd like to restore that. Um, so it's pretty simple, just number four in terms of direction of priorities, 
uh, as recommended in the table by staff with the exception of uh, returning the uh, or, and the dates and not accepting the adjusted dates for project labor agreements. It's, it's pretty simple. Just crossing out those red ADJ in that part of the table. Can I just ask a question about that? Because I, um, the way the, the issue came to my attention initially was in the form of a draft agreement called not a project labor agreement, but a community workforce agreement that would have been um, an agreement that was entered into between the city and the Monterey and Santa Cruz County Building and Construction Trades Council that would apply generally to public works contracts entered into between the city and a third party contractor. As distinguished from a project labor agreement that is an agreement that's entered into between the contractor, the city, and a labor council specific to one project. And so the way that's done in, in a lot of cities is that, that the city has an adopted set of criteria by which it requires a project labor agreement. And I think the San Diego County Water Authority, we've done some research on this, and the San Diego County Water Authority, for instance, requires a project labor agreement on any project that is in excess of $100 million. Um, <clears throat> obviously operating on a much grander scale than the city of San Francisco. But I just think it's a very complicated topic. And so when you suggest to bring it back at the second meeting in August, I'm just not quite clear on what the council wants to be brought back. Councilor Brown, if you'd like to comment. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I would like for uh, us to receive a report. Uh, I would like us to receive a recommendation. Uh, well, I, maybe not a rec. Sorry, I'm trying to just sort through the language. I would like for us to uh, receive a uh, staff report on uh, the use of project labor agreements using, I mean, you, you received the information from the building and construction trades. That is a model that was used with some variation in the city of Watsonville and other jurisdiction, neighboring jurisdictions. So uh, a proposal that involves the, the guidelines for the use of project labor agreements community workforce agreements, they're different names, but kind of the same intent um, to the council for uh, consideration. So if, does that help? But Tony, I'm sorry, I'm, it's, it's, I'm kind of, it's kind of late. I don't have the PLA um, document in front of me right now to kind of clarify exactly yeah. what it is. But kind of as we, as we recommended, I can look up um, the direction that was given. Okay. I, have to I, 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 I wasn't anticipating this as being a topic on tonight's agenda because I didn't, I didn't see it in the recommended, recommended action. So I apologize. I, I was prepared. Let's spend more time preparing to have this discussion. So I apologize for this. And if I could just give a follow-up, I mean, I think that the idea is that we gave direction, I think, back in <laughs> either January or February, and the intention is that we move forward with. And uh, I think that. The two terms of project labor agreement and community workforce agreement have just been thrown around, and now there's PLAs. When I think initially, the initial uh, report it was community workforce agreement. So, um, but I think the intent is that we that work be done because I know, having spoken with the building trades, um, that given that given COVID-19, they haven't been able to have follow-up discussions with. Um, with the, city, with the department heads, and I would uh, probably assume that some of the department heads haven't had uh, opportunities to speak with other contractors, and that those discussions need to happen in order for the city and for the laboring groups to understand what's going to work best for the city of Santa Cruz, because these agreements aren't going to completely say that you can't, you know, well, I should rephrase that. One of the things that these labor agreements do is they determine a threshold.
threshold beyond which you will then enter into these workforce agreements. And that threshold is what um, we're really, you know, hoping that the city can work with the labor unions and contractors to determine what's going to work best for ensuring local employment, um, the opportunity for apprenticeships, and good paying jobs for workers in the community. So I'll just leave it at that. And can I? Can, I'm sorry to just jump in, but I, I do want to try to actually better respond to Tony's question that was posed to me. Um, so the motion that we made was to direct staff to work with the Monterey Bay Santa Cruz County's Building and Construction Trade Council to draft a community workforce slash project labor agreement and bring uh, back a draft for consideration by the first meeting in April including broader community participation, any analysis the staff needs to do, and draft updates as needed should it need more time. So the, and so I, we said at that time, uh, community workforce project labor agreement, but I think it's the, um, the guidelines for uh, requiring those agreements in construction projects. Does that, hopefully that helps a little bit, maybe. Uh, Mayor Cummings, uh, sorry, if I could just clarify for item four, is it still for the second meeting of August? Okay, thank you. Council Member Watkins, then we have Matthews, Brown, and um, well, um, Martin, do you want to weigh in for now? Do you want to weigh in right now? Sorry, hand was up. I was just going to say, uh, with respect to the project labor agreements, Rosemary, I think she's on. I uh, worked on developing the, the work plan and, and the follow-up, so uh, she may be able to provide some information on that if she's on. Um, yeah, here she is. Just more specific about the the, uh, the timelines and what we came up with the revised town forms. Um, so just a, a quick uh, summary of the work that's been done up to now which is that we have we've done a lot of research on how this has been used. As Tony mentioned, we've collected examples everywhere. There's been some legal analysis of, you know, uh, how, they're, how they are appropriately used and what kind of criteria that uh, entities need to use in order to avoid the anti-competition elements of, um, of or accusations of anti-competition from these things. Um, there was a, we've done some work with the local chamber and Santa Cruz County Business uh, Council to organize a meeting to discuss the, you know, what these are and, and what concerns or questions the local business might have. And that meeting was originally scheduled for the 16th of March or the, you know, right in that week, I forget maybe that the shutdown occurred. So clearly that's all been put on hold since that time. So there was some work to organize that. Uh, we've also done um, quite a bit of analysis and, and sort of uh, trying to understand how, what our local workforce is with respect to construction trades and you know, what are really the opportunities for us to grow that workforce? Um, as you might be aware, we don't have a huge, our, our local construction workforce isn't big, and we don't have a huge um, element of the construction workforce here locally that is uh, unionized. So to some degree, project labor agreements that might require or give preference to unionized workers might actually result in having um, folks coming in into the area, uh, doing the jobs, getting the jobs, coming from labor halls, uh, you know, as far away as Benicia and elsewhere, who are then uh, hired to do the work here because they're, um, they're <laughs> using nice workers. So, so I think we have our arms a little bit around, the, um, around the, the sort of general background of what these are and how they work. Um, what we haven't done, as you know, is we haven't engaged in conversations with the uh, um, labor unions about uh, an existence of an agreement. So happy to take a question if you have one. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, Councilmember Watkins, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, no, thank you, Rosemary, and I um, I think, you know, we definitely want to get it right for our community, and I appreciate the update and input on where you are with it and where we are with it. Um, and then also just sort of recognize that this is uh, 
a component of just, I think, a conversation as the city and as a community we're going to have around workforce recovery in general. Um, so I, I know that there's a lot of work to be done. And, and moving forward as a committee, I think we're going to factor in all of these different things in the timeline. So as appropriate, I'm happy to see this move forward in the best way for our community at the best informed timeline. I don't know what that means for where you are and for how to move forward at this moment based on kind of the input we've received this time. In terms of the timeline, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we could bring a staff report back and give you an update of, and, you know, have had some conversations with the labor folks if that's what you would like us to do um, in the August time frame, whether it would be ready for, you know, you to take action on, say, make it so, I don't know for sure, but we could certainly move in that direction if that's what you want us to do. I think there still is quite a bit of analysis to be done, particularly about, uh, you know, what is really the mechanism by which we uh, leverage the opportunity, if you will, to really produce living wage jobs for people who live here. Yeah, no, important. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. I want to make it really clear. I'm quite happy to have this discussion. I did not support the motion as it was expressed way back when, because the motion at that time was to go straight to uh, a draft ordinance. I thought that was really rushing it. I'm so grateful that our staff has been doing the research. What are the varieties? How would they play out for us? Talk to some other people, uh, which is why I, I, I support moving on that path and to give us the time, I think we should um, uh, stick with the uh, schedule that they have proposed. I, I hope that others can go along with that. Uh, I think we will get to a better product in the end. And so uh, what the staff has told us, looking at everything else that, that is out there to be done, it was not expected in this first pass. Uh, or if they can bring us a staff report in August, I would expect that would be, here are the varieties, here are, here's our local situation, here's how it can play out, here's how we can move forward. Do that methodically, get the information, give it some careful discussion, and end up with a better product. I really would prefer to stick with the uh, staff suggested um, schedule there. Not, not to avoid it, but to do a good job on it. Mayor, if I, if I may, it sounds like it's a both and, that if it's, if it's ready, it could come back to and, or if it's not, then an update would be sufficient as well. I think, I don't know if that meets the needs of the council at this moment, but I, I think we're all on the same page in regards to, sure, we want to explore it, absolutely see it move forward, and if it's ready in an informed way, it could come back. If not, then update from Rosemary on sort of the status and the analysis would be helpful either way. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I, I understand. I appreciate what everyone's saying. I hear what everyone is saying, and um, I am not amending my motion. I'm not withdrawing my motion. Um, at, a, at some point, we're going to need to vote on it. So, I mean, we can continue to have this discussion, or we can have it um, in August, depending on what we get. But the direction I'm giving is to proceed along the timeline, the amended timeline that was given to us in April, which um, extend, you know, extends uh, by four months, I think, the initial direction. And recognizing that we, have, we are in an emergency situation, um, I do believe that uh, the possibilities can be discussed and um, kind of worked through um, if the building trades is contacted. Um, as was directed. So I'm just going to leave it there and, um, you know, I'd call the question, but I, I, it seems to me that people want to keep talking about it, but I'm just, I'm ready to, to vote. Council member Watkins. Sorry, I, I just, I think, I, I think we're all on the same page in that um, regard. I just, I don't know if we're in a different position. I do, from what I'm hearing is that, yes, we'll move forward with a, uh, the original timeline and, if it's not fully prepared, then we're going to update. And that's not, I mean, but with the idea of having them move forward in, in a way that's going to um, make it a priority. I mean, so I don't know if I don't, I guess I, I feel like I'm hearing this, I'm hearing the same thing maybe, or and maybe I'm, I'm off and it's just late at this point. I mean, I, if I can jump in, I think that, you know, just similar to, 
things that we've done um, in the past and motions that we've made on items that sometimes un unforeseeable events occur and things have to come back at another meeting or more urgent items come into play and we need to you know postpone to another meeting we almost did that tonight with one of our items because we've been going over so long so uh, I, I feel personally that like when we're discussing many of these topics and many items there's generally flexibility built in um, but i think that the intention is that we stay on track because we've kind of pushed this and delayed and pushed and delayed and if, if the, the work doesn't begin until august you know we don't know what can um what might happen then that could potentially delay it even further and i think that um, kind of having it as a priority if we can get the work continuing now i think we all understand i mean based on the county health advisors models you know we're predicted to have worst case model is predicted that we have a spike at the end of july and if that were to happen it would be completely understandable that this would have to get delayed again and so i think that in the world of covid we understand that there has to be flexibility built into everything that we're doing um, but i think that the intention is that we continue working on this we continue moving forward as was directed earlier this year and um, with the hopes that we can have something come back at the end of August and if there's something that you know comes up that will uh, adjust it if necessary but I think the intention is that we want to keep this on track so, uh, council member Matthews uh, so I just want to again ask what is the it that we're talking about is it a draft ordinance for for action or is it a report on the uh, general territory the many forms that these might take and what would best fit, fit to our local um, community city size projects and labor force here now, so. i'm happy to have that first and then take it there for the next discussion yes no i mean <laughs> Brown, do you want to win yeah, my motion is for uh, a draft ordinance so I'm happy to have the discussion too, and that's maybe where we're going to end up. But right now, I'd like to um, be very clear that this is a priority, um, and you know, those conversations could happen, you know, in the next month or so. I think um, to kind of sort some of that stuff out. So my motion is for draft ordinance, um, and. If somebody else wants to make a different motion, that's, I'll support that. But I, right now, I'd like to vote on uh, the ordinance motion. It's it's simply the direction we gave um, in January uh, to come back in April to us. So, I, and the, in April, we received a recommendation that included this being moved to, and this was at post COVID um, arriving. Uh, a motion or a, a suggestion that it be um, considered in June and brought to us in August and I would just like to keep to that timeline so I I don't know if is that clear is everybody clear about what okay yeah, let's hear from city manager Martin Bernal sorry I'm just gonna suggest that that helps we can put up the the list um, of items so that you have that as a reference. Can you do that, Laura? Yep. So this is um, this is my interpretation of where you guys are at this point. So you had said for cannabis events and on site consumption, you're deferring that, so taking the date away to it's a to be determined anything these two these three rows were untouched so they would go forward as they are on the list for the project labor agreements um i've highlighted june and august and i've written down do not adjust date and right now i think you're in the process of discussing draft ordinance as put forward by council member brown versus a staff report furthering discussion that would come back in august for De La Viega, the recommendation was it should be part of the Council Budget Commission work. And then um, the other recommendation was combine quality of life and camping ordinance. 
and that they would come back, um, start working in June and come back at August at the earliest together. And then uh, surveillance ordinance would go as forward and sidewalk bending, you didn't discuss, so I left that as is. And then river coordinator, there was a recommendation by council member Matthews to defer that item. And then beach flats was not discussed, so left as is. And then um, Lee and Planning and Community Development had a recommendation to discuss housing opportunities, um, and that was not discussed, so left as is. So I think um, that's my understanding of the discussion so far, and obviously this is the uh, major item that still needs this position is the community workforce agreement, project labor agreement, and what comes back in August. Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Watkins, and then I had a comment on this, um, the prioritization list. Um, I do, I have another question too. I actually could not understand what that final one meant. <laughs> Housing opportunities through parking updates and other cleanup and streamlining changes. I, I think I know. <laughs> That's me. Are you still on the call? Yeah. We'll try to get Lee. And, and I think okay. I know it. It is all these little ordinance things that if we did them, we could really create some more housing opportunities. And they, they just kind of got stuck with other things. It, it, it looks like we're getting yeah, so if we leave it, on it, it, it is that, Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I mean, it's that's, picking... yeah, so I would want to proceed with that, and it looks like you can bring that back to the cleanup stuff and actually make some progress. Is that, am I reading it right there? Yes, I was, sorry, I was on mute and didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, um, it, Things that um, include uh, single-family detached uh, covered parking requirements, um, changes to accessory dwelling units, uh, accessory uh, uh, building requirements. Um, so uh, a lot of this is clean up things that um, will take, uh, take our staff off of things where we're not adding value. Um, and free us up to focus on some of the uh, housing development applications that we can hopefully move through the process more quickly if we're not spending time on some of these other things. And some of the other things being? Uh, so some of them are like um, uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, plumbing hookups, um, small lots. Um, I see mats on here. Um, do you want to comment on some of the things that you've been working on with Samantha and Catherine at this point? You're muted, Matt. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think I think you mentioned a number of the the main code amendments that we'd be working on. Uh, those those are the main ones, and then some would just be like small text items that will help staff navigate the the code better. Uh, the counter and such. And then that would also be taking the place of the, the cannabis work that's getting deferred. And so uh, I guess I'll move on to Council Member Matthews. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I was muted. So it sounds like that's a, a high yield area for you. If you can be liberated from cannabis events, then you can put some direction into these code amendments that will actually lead to some housing creation. Is that is that what you're thinking here? That's a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Matt. Okay. Yeah, it it would certainly aid in in uh, supporting housing development. Yeah. Um, okay especially the, the parking changes and, and some of the, the ADU changes. Okay, um, and then just other things that I would, I, they're not a priority for me. There was a suggestion uh, earlier in the year, uh, it was really an idea for a beach flat parking district. Um, and um, that seemed to me 
really not thoroughly thought out, it's not at all a priority for me. So I would be just as happy to strike that from the list. And um, you now if others are agreeable to that. Having said all that, I would then like to make a substitute motion at this point um, that we approve this amended list uh, maintaining the uh, schedule for the project labor agreement and that the what we expect the form of that work to take is continued staff analysis coming back to us um, in August for um, discussion and direction uh, for further action. This is a substitute motion made by Council Member Matthews. I see Council Member Watkins, your hand is raised. Is that to second the motion or is that for comments? Well, that was originally for comments. Um, I guess I just, I think I just want to kind of maybe, I know we're in the, the nuances and the details. I think we're a little bit in, in the weeds. But, um, and, and I, I value the, the opinion, but I also just want to highlight the, um, really the number four bullet, which is really looking at how the establishment of this potential recovery committee can develop a rubric to help us best inform our strategies. I know Councilmember Matthews also brought up the downtown strategy, um, that workforce labor agreements are uh, part of this broader re workforce recovery effort. Like, there's just so many bigger concepts and umbrellas that I feel we can't lose sight of as we get to the nuances of it. Um, I, I, I mean, if, if there's an informed policy ready in terms of, um, you know, some of the some of the, the original work that was designed to move forward as part of Sandy's motion, uh, Councilmember Brown's motion, um, that's informed and ready to go, then I think that that's fine. And if it's not, then that's okay too. But I think we do want to have this sort of bigger kind of context in place. And I don't want to lose that as we get into the weeds at this hour, personally. So I, I guess, um, and I don't have all of the details of some of these proposals in front of me. You, I have the sort of the, the summary, but without kind of that in-depth look at it, it feels to me a little bit um, premature, personally. Those are my comments. Um, I just wanted to make one comment with regards to, uh, Laura, if you could scroll down to the um, Beach Flats parking. Personally, if that, if we, you know, set a later timeline on that so that public works could focus on project labor agreements, I think that I would be fine with that, given that by the time this actually, with that timeline, by the time that um, if anything were to come forward, it would be right before winter, which means that that, you know, area wouldn't actually benefit from, you know, the the potential increased revenue from parking within that area. So that, in my opinion, I think could get deferred as well because if, even if, if, if the council wants to revisit that, which I can see why it's important for that community, you know, we could start work on that in October or, you know, November. And if it comes back to council next April, it would be in time for it to be implemented before the summer, which is when that revenue is actually going to come in. So I personally, you know, I think it's important and members from that community came to us and asked for that. And so I can see why we may want, we should revisit it. Uh, but I think at this point in time, if that can make space for the community workforce agreement through public works, I think that would be a really good use of time on that item and could help it, you know, come forward much more quickly. Uh, the other thing too, is I know that we are off and we recess in July, but I do also remember from last year that a lot of the surveys and community work that was done on health and all policies was done in July. And so I do understand that, you know, people are going to be taking some time off, but if we start now, that gives us almost three months to kind of do the outreach and the communication and like work with the unions and the construction, um, the uh, construction businesses. And it sounds like a lot of work has already been done. So, what comes back to us in August might, I mean, it might, I think that there's a very good chance it'll give us enough time 
to have something that comes to us in August. And if we need more time because uh, there's a couple factors that you know we need to reconsider, then we can send it back out. But I, I think that if we alleviate some of the pressure off public works through pushing back on the beach lights parking, um, that that you know could help us be able to get to a good spot by August. Um, Councilmember Matthews and then Brown, and then Vice Mayor Myers. I would just request that the uh, PLA, if you even want to stick with that uh, proposed schedule, that uh, thorough analysis come to the council for discussion prior to a draft ordinance. I think we have to have things in that sequence. I'm, I'm okay with that. So even if that came in you know, the first meeting in August, I think that analysis were to be able to come by the first meeting in August, I think that's fine. Which is exactly what is proposed in red here. My understanding from what's proposed in red is that that's when the work would take place. That's my understanding of, of um, because it's the restart column is that the re they wouldn't start working on it again until August. And what we're proposing is that they start working on it now and then something returns in August. So, but I think that that's a, a good friendly amendment. I don't know what the maker of the motion Well, if that can be accepted as a friendly amendment, then I'm happy to stick with the schedule there. You get that? Sure, that's fine. That, that works for me. I, I just don't want us to be kind of never getting to an ordinance because we always have to delay or have more work to do. So I, I'm just trying to move this along. So that, that, that works. Vice Mayor Myers, or uh, Martine, do you want to weigh in? No. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I just, uh, just want to also remind council that uh, you know, one of the things that uh, also is going to be new uh, here is that uh, we're doing furloughs too. So just again to remind council that uh, with respect to staff capacity that uh, it's going to be further reduced and uh, obviously um, there's a lot of work now too. So again, I just want to just emphasize that. Thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers. You're muted. I guess I just wanted to, yeah, kind of add on that um, the recognition that we are going to go into furloughs and um, I just want to make sure that um, there, that there's a, a thorough staff support that can be provided with this. Um, I do have concerns, I'm just going to be honest, that um, with this tool that we're looking at, um, the some of the response that I got when we, when it was first brought to us, um, there was concern about losing, losing local jobs. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we have, we allow ourselves enough time to do it. Um, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, to do the vote tonight, but um, just want to echo that. I just want to make sure we get a, a really thorough staff report to accompany the ordinance. So thank you. And I would say, as my comment said, to precede consideration of an ordinance. I think, I think we've got to have analysis and discussion and then give direction to staff what kind of ordinance we want to be developed. So I just want to uh, try to clarify here um, that what uh, uh, Mayor Cummings said was uh, he, uh, he was suggesting that uh, that analysis and uh, staff report for consideration could come at the first meeting in August so that we can consider an ordinance on the 23rd, I, or excuse me, on the second meeting in August. I, I, that is a very short turnaround. I, I, it, it's hard to imagine that we could move that quickly. Um, so, but I, I'm just, you know, I'm really just trying to stick with this idea that I, I do not want to change the timeline to beginning to get around to hearing some, some more, some additional information in October. So. I'm okay with the change as it was suggested by Mayor Cummings. If that's what you're talking about, Councilmember Matthews, um, if 
that's not, then I, I just like to, I mean, I'll just leave the motion on the floor. If a substitute motion is, uh, um, has a majority vote, then so be it. Okay. So there's no further comments. Uh, we have a substitute motion that's on the floor. I don't know if the maker of that motion wants to uh, withdraw or if there's somebody who wants. I'll, I'll withdraw it if it's very clear that we first have a thorough staff analysis and report on the subject of PLA, Project Labor Agreement, Workforce Development, and so forth. And at that point, we give direction on what ordinance, what shape of ordinance we'd like to have developed. If we hear that in August, we don't have to hear the ordinance the second week in August, but we can hear it soon. We can make progress on this. Let's do a good job of it. So if that's our understanding, if that's acceptable to the, to the mayor, then I will withdraw mine. I accept you. Just trying to see what's being typed in. So I said the dates are not adjusted, so the yellow dates would stand, and the clarification is that August would represent a discussion and direction for further direction. A discussion and, that's not right, discussion for further direction prior to a draft ordinance. Oh, you know, we heard from Rosemary She's been working hard on this, but it is not possible to have the kind of analysis and conversation with stakeholders that I think needs to have happen in order for us to have a good foundation for moving forward with it. So she said I can do this in August. She's already working on it, but I mean, I, mean, I don't even know what these dates mean now, June, August, August, October. Um, she's working on it now, but to think that we would have something on board in, in August, given the fact we take July off, may not be realistic, but we can do it soon. If I may, I think that if I can kind of summarize what I'm hearing is that, you know, there's a desire for us. I think the goal is to have an ordinance and, you know, if that can come at the second meeting in, in August, that would be great. There is the other desire to have a conversation before that happens so we can make sure whatever the ordinance is, is that it's going to be something that's, you know, um, good for our community. And so, and that needs to come before. So I think that if we can have that discussion at the first meeting in August um, and with the, with the goal of having the ordinance at the second meeting in August, I think we can move forward and knowing that if we have a discussion at the first meeting in August and it's clear that we're going to need some more time, then we can, you know, we can reschedule. I mean, that meeting in August will give us an opportunity to kind of have a conversation. But I think that Councilmember Brown's desire, my desire, um, and, you know, from the folks that we've spoken with in the community is that they don't want to see this just get punted on forever, similar to how, you know, what we're hearing from folks in cannabis where, you know, They've been working for years to try to get something passed, and they just feel like that it just keeps getting delayed and delayed over and over again. So. Um, Mayor Cummings, just to make note, um, the reports for the second meeting of August would be due two days after the first meeting of August. Just something to consider, too. I mean, I'd be even willing to move it to the the ordinance to the first meeting in September, if that's the case, just to give us more time. Um, but I'll let, ask the maker of the motion what what they're considering. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I really, ha I have concerns about the potential to get an ordinance within two weeks of uh, that kind of discussion. So yeah, September is, is okay to substitute there. That's fine with me. Okay. So we'll have the discussion come back to the first meeting in August, and then the we'll, for now we'll put the the draft ordinance come before us at the first meeting in September. Okay. So are there any further questions or comments on this item? 
Okay, I think we're ready to take the roll call vote. So Bonnie, I'll turn that over to you. Look, actually, Bonnie, before we take that vote, can we, Laura, can we take a look at that, the, um, the changes that were made just so that it's clear? It might also be good for that to be up while we're taking the vote. So there's a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by the mayor, um, to move item number four with the changes that are before us, which would defer uh, events and on-site consumption work for cannabis. Uh, it would adjust the inclusionary housing work from July, from early mid-May and August to restart in July and September. Work on project labor agreements or community workforce agreements would, um, would start in June. There would be a meeting to discuss analyses at the first meeting in August with draft ordinance to come at the first meeting in September. If you can keep scrolling down. Uh, De La Viega would be part of the council budget commission discussion, commission work, yeah, sorry. Um, quality of life ordinances and camping ordinance. I don't know if we fully resolved this, but it seems like because there's two ordinances and there's three sets of dates. So. The bottom highlighted dates are the ones that are valid for the combined. So the combined quality of life and cabinet ordinance, the restart date would be June and return, first return to council would be August at earliest. Okay. Uh, the surveillance ordinance, and I just want to clarify and highlight that this, um, that the predictive policing and live facial recognition item is to come back to the next meeting. These are all the other remaining items that were related to surveillance. So just so the community is aware, because because the police chief and I have been talking about this and the predictive policing and live facial recognition is what went to public safety and was supposed to come back. So these are all the other items with the exception of those two. And so those would come back, uh, the work would commence on those in August and it would come back to council in October. Um, the river coordinator position would be deferred and the beach flats parking would be deferred. So that's the motion before us this evening. So I guess we'll take the vote. Bonnie, when you're ready. Councilmember Byers is absent. Uh, Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously uh, with, or sorry, unanimously with the exception of Councilman Byers, who is absent. Um, so that concludes all of our uh, items on our agenda, with the exception that Councilmember Golder asked that we return to uh, closed session to discuss an item uh, that we voted on earlier in the day. So um, we will adjourn our open session, a general business evening item, and we'll go back to closed session uh, to discuss uh, one of the items from closed session from earlier in the day.